Good morning, everyone. Welcome you all in third day of third Sunday of summer finishing a school organized by Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science in collaboration with the many institutions where we have the, our MOU. And I welcome you all in the third day along with my co-host Arti. As we have the gala expert panel for this summer finishing school and we have finished the two days, two Sundays with our eminent experts, those who have delivered the knowledge. And we are moving to the third day. So on the first day, on the first Sunday, 18 June, we have uh, from Kapil Kumar, Yogesh Kumar, Ajesh Kumar, Sudhir Sir, and Deepika Bandari. And on the second day, we had the speaker list, Mandeep Kaur, Dr. Nopri, Tejasvi Bhatia, Dr. Sahil, Dr. Kirti, and Dr. Shruti. And today, I welcome you all on the Third day, I request Aarti to kindly proceed further with the introduction of our third day summer finishing school. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, I take this privilege to introduce all our uh, speaker panel for today and welcome you all to this day three of Forensic Summer Finishing School, where we are uh, we are there to uh, with a motive of giving knowledge from the experts who are there in the field of forensic science, who are working on uh, real grounds and can impart better knowledge to our uh, participants. So with this, I welcome Dr. Anita Yadav from uh, Sage University Bhopal, followed by a talk from uh, uh, various other speakers uh, by Dr. Dilak, Dilak Chandrakar, Dr. Uh, Om Dubey sir, Dr. Prashant Agrawal sir, Dr. Amit Chauhan, uh, sir, and followed by Dr. Komal Yadav for the day three. And for today's session, we have uh, Dr. Anita Yadav, ma'am, starting with this day from uh, the topic of forensic toxicology, a sample collection, preservation, and their analytical approach. And I welcome you, ma'am, to this platform. And I would surely take this privilege to introduce you to our participants. So, Dr. Anita Yadav is currently working as an associate professor and forensic science coordinator at the School of Sciences at Sage University, Bhopal. She is an accomplished professional in the field of forensic medicine and toxicology. She worked as an, as an assistant professor at Galgotia's University as well. She worked as a tutor or demonstrator in the forensic medicine and toxicology department at Ames Bhopal. Later, she served as a senior resident in the same department, accumulating a total of two years, nine months, and 21 days of teaching experience. Beyond academia, she is actively engaged in professional organizations related to their field, a member of International Association of Forensic Toxicologists, the Indo-Pacific Association of Law, Medicine, and Science, the International Science Congress Association, and the Indian Society of Toxicology. In addition, she contributes to the advancement of forensic science as an editorial board member of the journal, uh, International Journal of Forensic Sciences, and the Indian Journal of Forensic Medicine and Toxicology. She has further enhanced her expertise through active participation in workshops, trainings, programs, and conferences on a national and international scale. I welcome you, ma'am. I think there is some technical issues we are facing. So I'm just allowing participant. Can any participant confirm our voice is coming to you all? In the chat yes, box, it's coming properly. Yes, sir. Yeah, so thank you all. Uh, Amarpreet, I think uh, you can check your audio connection. That's why you are not able to hear. So thank you, ma'am. Thank you for accepting our invitation and agree to deliver the talk on the very interesting topic, forensic toxicology, sample collection, preservation, and their analytical approach. I hand over session to you. Over to you. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, because of some technical glitch, uh, I think the PPT will be shared after five, uh, five minutes. But meanwhile, we can start the session. Uh, like uh, I'll start with toxicology. And before that, I want to thank you, sir. Dr. Ranjit Singh for inviting me and giving me the platform here. And uh, I think uh, this is a platform where you can explore more and more. And this is the one platform in the field of forensic science where the students can approach and have their queries solved. 
and they can also go further in their higher studies and research and other areas in the in their life so thank you so much sir for inviting me it will be very great honor for me to deliver the session here and uh, with the uh, now i'll start with the session it's about toxicology so toxicology when we uh, like uh, when we have a word toxicology it's not not just toxicology it had varied aspects like uh, starting from your uh, clinical toxicology that is one aspect then your uh, uh, postmortem toxicology it has other aspect so there are various domains where you can go and explore yourself clinical toxicology in the field of forensic toxicology there are two domains one is your clinical toxicology other is your post mortem toxicology clinical as the word suggested the patient who was admitted in a hospital the patient who was admitted in a hospital have some uh, issues related to some uh, poisoning that may be accidental ingestion or that may be intentional ingestion which we call as uh, ma'am your voice is not coming to us you want to share the ppt i will stop this uh, i think there is some uh, technical glitch will wait for ma'am to connect with the another system uh dear participant my humble request do not unmute else you will not able to attend the whole session uh sir i uh, thank you so much for your patience no no okay thank you so much. okay i'm just trying to connect uh through my laptop because i want to share the ppt but uh, so we will we'll wait for the connection thank you is my screen visible uh yes ma'am is coming up coming okay so uh so uh, it's about toxicology when we talk about toxicology various aspects are there one is clinical aspect which will be uh, dealt by the clinician the practicing doctor and who will help with the treatment of the patient but the analytical hand again goes with us what is the poisoning what is the uh, and it's about toxicity also there are two different terms one is toxicity uh, lethal toxicity other is fatal toxicity so lethal toxicity is uh, one thing jisko hum bolte hai ki jisse thoda bahut aapko you will feel the symptoms and all but fatal is one when where one died in both cases we need a uh, forensic toxicologist one who will be in the hospitals one who will be in the forensic science laboratories uh, ma'am we are not able to see the powerpoint it is uh, again showing that you have shared the screen but it is not coming to us uh, can you reshare again i'm just stop i'll i'll try i'll try please, again please try again thank you
Is it visible now, sir? Uh, yes, sir. It's visible, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. It is visible. You can make this as a full mode. Okay. Okay. So, uh, basically, as a forensic toxicologist, we deal with the forensic analytical toxicology people uh, generally got confused with that we are the clinical toxicologist no we are not the clinical toxicologist because we are not involved in the treatment of the patient directly but indirectly we are involved in the treatment of the patient then moving again The next slide is, uh, there are two terms. One is point of care testing. Other is laboratory the testing. The slide is not moving. Uh, we can see that slide in the side panel, but it's not coming on the main screen. Okay, sir. Do you have this slide so that if you can share, I will, uh, you know, run from my side? Uh, definitely, sir. I'll mail you. Actually, we had heavy rain here in the night. Yes, yes, ma'am. I can understand. Yeah. There is a many technical glitches coming. Or you can just try with the arrow button that uh, page down below the page down. There is an arrow button, and it sir, actually, in my laptop, uh, third slide is showing. Okay. Um, but. Uh, it's not moving there. No. I'll share with you. Just give me two minutes. I'll mail this uh, PPT with to you. Yes, so I'll run from here. Yes, sir. We can see now the seventh slide, slide number seven. So yes, sir, I'll I'll mail you. I think that will be a better option. Yes, yes. Arti, please check if you are receiving the email. You can yes. start sharing from your side. Uh, so that in the in the meantime, once we are receiving the PowerPoint from the ma'am, there is a many query I'm receiving from the participant about this summer school, like about the certificate, how you will get the certificate, and when you will get the certificate. So it's a very simple. Uh, we have this automated. Uh, certificate creation portal where I just want to show you one. Uh, so you, it's from the website where you have registered. So this is a portal. Here uh, you will just have to just have to go through the download certificate, right? And by download certificate, you just have to write your email. Okay, from which you have registered in this summer school. So once you have registered with this summer school whatever the event you have attended, like this is going to be on 9th July. So from 9th July, you can download your certificate from Summer Fencing School. But uh, uh, for old, you can see all your certificate, the event which you have attended from our side, you can all, you can find it out from here, right? So everything you will can download and just you have to click here on the uh, any of the certificate, like for an example, this 11 December certificate. So by just clicking this certificate, you can find it out, the certificate, and you can download. You will get this certificate number, right? So you can download this certificate. It will come to the uh, panel. Uh, if anyone, like we have noticed few students, they have created this certificate by just editing the name. So even uh, that certificate is verified by our uh, system. So here you can just have to paste your certificate number. And once you'll paste for validate, it will come as a certificate. So by this way, you can very easily download the certificate and you can uh, you know have the certificate. I'm so sorry, the network is a bit slow here. Yeah, no problem, we can understand. Uh, due to the rain, uh, even many uh, places, like uh, even in the morning, I had a meeting with Assam, so uh, with a few top level IPS officers. So we are not able to connect due to the rain over there. So it's okay, there is no problem, we can understand that. So you are sending email on which email ID, ma'am? Uh, 
uh, sir it's shifts india net i think uh, that is coming here uh, uh, will you be able to open that or you uh, uh arti uh, can you send another email id to ma'am on the whatsapp sure sir so uh, which is accessible now and you can download it okay sir uh, sir can we have the remote access if possible meanwhile i'll share the email id to anita ma'am uh no that that will be a uh, difficult because you know um, i'm also have to take the control so you just take that on the email share the new email id on the whatsapp in the meantime if participant do you have any questions related to this summer school you may ask and we love to uh, you know answer even those who are not from the forensic science background and they wants to pursue their uh, you know uh, certificate course or any other kind of course from the forensic science uh, we had uh, one course recently launched from delhi university and that is our fourth batch so that i like to introduce you all uh, in the meantime when we are getting the connected so this is the add on certificate course from delhi university and we are uh, the you know this is the sixth rank uh, college in the university for the nirf ranking and here uh, yesterday even uh, it registration was started that on the certificate course on the forensic science and criminal investigation and in this the last date of register is uh, 15th july 2023 eligibility at 12 pass for indian students the fee is 4432 rupees and that you have to deposit into the college account and the session will be 7 7 to 8:30 saturday and sunday and you will get the certification from delhi university so getting a certification from that uh, university uh, which is uh, central university is always beneficial so those who are interested you can enroll on this certificate course and this is the certificate course where you will find the detail what actually we are going to uh, cover in this certificate course like introduction to forensic science we are going to cover the fingerprint identifications right uh, the, yes this is safia uh, safai this is a online course uh, this is online from the zoom platform where you have all in poster also you have all the details so i am sharing this uh, you know uh, link so that uh, those who are interested or any of your connection is interested you can see it and in this we have a limited seat we have a 30 seats only so that is on the basis of first come first basis yesterday it was restarted and we received the seven admission in a 12 hours so those who are interested you can uh, you know join on time so that because delhi university is very strict about the seats and uh, their admission if it is 30 they will not accommodate uh, accommodating more students they require to have the several kind of uh, you know admissions and uh, several kind of approve uh, like uh, approval from the management authority so those who are interested you can definitely see so now we are ready ma'am we are ready uh, to yeah yeah sir, definitely uh, over to you um, yeah um, ma'am please next slide so arthi you can go for the second slide yeah okay. thank you ma'am yeah are uh, coming back again to forensic toxicology we have like uh, two uh, different fields one is clinical other is forensic in forensic uh, we have like uh, uh, that post mortem toxicology in uh, uh, post mortem toxicology and clinical toxicology this is the term that is used in india in uh, uh, other countries the term which we also uh, use is point of care testing point of care testing aisa lagta hai ya hamari pehle ki guidelines mein bhi hai कि हमें ऐसा लगता है कि ये पता नहीं क्या है बट इट इज वन टर्म विच इज लाइक जो हमारी बेड साइड टेस्टिंग होती है या फोरेंसिक की चाहे हम दूसरी फील्ड्स में भी इसको अप्लाई करें लाइक like एनडीपीएस पे जो हम ऑन द क्राइम सीन हम टेस्ट करते हैं ठीक है एंड इन द ब्लड जो हम बेंजिडीन और फिनोक्लिन टेस्ट करते हैं ऑल द टेस्ट विच कैन बी परफॉर्म ऑन द साइट और इन द हॉस्पिटल इट इज कॉल्ड एज बेड साइड टेस्टिंग ये सारे टेस्ट हमारे पॉइंट ऑफ केयर टेस्टिंग में आएंगे इट इज ऑल्सो कॉल्ड एज प्रीलिमरी टेस्टिंग विच वी कैन ऑल्सो परफॉर्म इन द लेबोरेटरी बट इट इज अ पार्ट ऑफ प्रिलिमिनरी टेस्टिंग ठीक है विच कैन बी डन एट एनी प्लेस ये इंडिया में हम लोग जो है प्रिलिमिनरी टेस्टिंग यूज करते हैं बट 
अगर हम अराउंड द वर्ल्ड इसको देखेंगे तो द टर्म इज पॉइंट ऑफ केयर टेस्टिंग विच कैन बी डन देन एंड देयर इट सेल्फ देन कमिंग टू लेबोरेटरी टेस्टिंग द अदर पार्ट ऑफ एनालिटिकल फॉरेंसिक एनालिटिकल टॉक्सिकोलॉजी इज लेबोरेटरी टेस्टिंग जिसमें हम लैब में आकर अपने सारे सैंपल्स को टेस्ट करते हैं द लेबोरेटरी टेस्टिंग मैम प्लीज नेक्स्ट स्लाइड या थैंक यू लेबोरेटरी टेस्टिंग इन इट इन्वॉल्व थ्री फेजेस प्री एनालिटिकल एनालिटिकल एंड पोस्ट एनालिटिकल हमारा काम सिर्फ जो है ना लैब में केमिकल uh, टेस्ट करने या इंस्ट्रूमेंटेशन इन्वॉल्व करने से uh, खत्म नहीं होता हमारा जो काम एज ए फोरेंसिक एक्सपर्ट या एज ए फोरेंसिक टॉक्सिकोलॉजिस्ट हमारा काम कहाँ से शुरू होता है फ्रॉम द स्पॉट इट सेल्फ जहाँ पे इंसिडेंस हुआ है फ्रॉम द सैम्पल कलेक्शन इट In the field of forensic toxicology, sample collection mostly hospital से होता है mortuary से होता है after post mortem examination. और अगर किसी hospital में आपके emergency department में poisoning care की facility है poison information centers है तो वहाँ से live patients जो admitted है उनके samples भी collect किए जाते हैं तो हमारा जो एक standard procedure है that starts from the sample collection itself अब sample collection में गलतियाँ भी होती हैं बहुत ज़्यादा होती हैं which uh, later on comes as a interference तो हमारा जो pre analytical phase है which deals with the sample collection and its preservation from the spot itself whether it is a post mortem sample or it is a clinical hospital hospital based sample kisi bhi tarike ka agar hamare live patients hain to live patients mein we mostly take uh, the samples which are non destructive in nature generally blood jata hai theek hai urine jata hai nails aapke aap cut karke le sakte hain hair sample you can take these are the type of samples which you can take from a live patient but in postmortem toxicology again there are various terms and preservation mein sabse badi baat preservation mein sabse badi baat hoti hai ki hamara jo sample hai jaise usko hum agar hum preserve karte hain to usme koi contra indications nahi ho उसमें कोई इंटरफेरेंस नहीं हो या एनालिसिस या टेस्टिंग में हमें कोई दिक्कत नहीं आए तो उसके लिए हमारे कुछ स्टैंडर्ड गाइडलाइंस हैं जो आपको बहुत सारे आप डीएफएस की मैनुअल्स भी देख सकते हैं और डीएफएस की मैनुअल का भी बहुत सारा जो मटेरियल है दैट इज टेकन फ्रॉम द टॉक्सिकॉल फोरेंसिक टॉक्सिकोलॉजी मैनुअल फ्रॉम वर्ल्ड हेल्थ ऑर्गेनाइजेशन उनका भी अपना एक मैनुअल है तो मोस्टली चीजें वहां से ली गई है तो द गाइडलाइंस विच वी आर फॉलोइंग पूरा जो वर्ल्ड है उस गाइडलाइन को फॉलो कर रहा है तो सैंपल प्रिजर्वेशन में बहुत सारे कॉन्ट्रा इंडिकेशन भी आते हैं कुछ जनरल भी होते हैं अब पोस्टमार्टम यहाँ पे फोरेंसिक के दो तीन एस्पेक्ट्स निकलते हैं जब कोई केस हॉस्पिटल में होता है तो एक आपका सैंपल जाता है डीएनए के लिए आइडेंटिफिकेशन पर्पज के लिए या सेक्शुअल असोल्ट के केसेस के लिए एक आपका जो सैंपल जाता है टॉक्सिकोलॉजी स्क्रीनिंग के लिए ठीक है लाइव पेशेंट है तो उसमें टाइप ऑफ पॉइजनिंग आप देखेंगे अगर कोई डेड पेशेंट है तो उसमें फेटल पॉइजनिंग आप देखेंगे ठीक क्वांटिटेटिव एस्टिमेशन अभी इंडिया में नया कंसेप्ट आया है पहले सिर्फ क्वालिटेटिव के बेसिस पर रिपोर्टिंग होती थी नाउ द प्री एनालिटिकल फेस इज अबाउट द सैंपल प्रिजर्वेशन एंड इट्स डिस्पैच फ्रॉम द प्लेस और उसके बाद भी हमारा सैंपल जो है फोरेंसिक साइंस लेबोरेटरीज में जाता है या टेस्टिंग लेबोरेटरीज में जाता है वहाँ कितने दिन रहता है तो हमारा प्रिजर्वेटिव इस तरीके का होना चाहिए कि विच कैन डील विद द टाइम ड्यूरेशन कि इतने टाइम तक वो उसको प्रिजर्व करके रख पाए ठीक है मैम आप दूसरी स्लाइड एक बार ऑन कर देंगे उसमें सैंपल प्रिजर्वेशन के बारे में शो दैट नेक्स्ट स्लाइड प्लीज मैम आरती वी आर नॉट एबल टू सी द स्लाइड सो मैम इज नेक्स्ट वन या या इज इट्स विजिबल नेक्स्ट स्लाइड प्लीज ओके 
द प्रेजेंटेशन जनरली डील्स विद कि किस किस तरीके के हमारे टॉक्सिकोलॉजी के सैंपल्स हैं एंटीमार्टम सैंपल्स मींस लाइव केसेस क्या है बिफोर डेथ या जो एडमिटेड है उसमें क्या है पोस्टमार्टम सैंपल्स क्या है कितनी क्वांटिटी रिक्वायर्ड है और दूसरे स्पेसिफिक विसरा जैसे हम लोग एक नॉर्मल रूटीन विसरा और सैंपल्स भेजते हैं उसके अलावा डिफरेंट तरीके की पॉइजनिंग है जिसके लिए हम सैंपल्स भेजते हैं फिर किस में क्या प्रिजर्वेटिव यूज होता है वॉट आर द कॉन्ट्रा इंडिकेशन पैकिंग सीलिंग सो वी विल गो थ्रू द स्लाइड क्विकली मैम प्लीज नेक्स्ट स्लाइड ओके इन लिविंग केसेस हम जो टॉक्सिकोलॉजी में एग्जामिनेशन करते हैं वो ड्रंक एंड ड्राइविंग के केसेस में करते हैं जो आपके पुलिस वाले आपको जो एक लिमिट है थर्टी एम जी पर लीटर अगर आपका ब्लड अल्कोहल ज्यादा जाता है तो आपको पुलिस वाले लेके आते हैं आपका ब्लड सैंपल विदड्रॉ कराते हैं एंड देट वॉज सबमिटेड टू ए फोरेंसिक लेबोरेटरी फॉर एल्कोहल एस्टिमेशन एल्कोहल इज वन थिंग जहां पे इंडिया में क्वांटिटेटिव एस्टिमेशन होता है बिकॉज द पनिशमेंट इज बेस्ड ऑन क्वांटिटेटिव एस्टिमेशन ऑफ एल्कोहल कितनी क्वांटिटी है ब्लड में देन दूसरे हम सस्पेक्टेड पॉइजनिंग किसी को अगर पॉइजनिंग हो गई है वेदर इट इज एनी रूट आपने इनहेल किया है या आपने इंजेस्ट किया है ठीक है या आपको किसी ने इंजेक्शन दे दिया है किसी भी रूट से अगर आपकी पॉइजनिंग है या डर्मल एक्सपोजर है जो आपको पेस्टिसाइड uh, स्प्रे करते वक्त हो गया है या ओकुलर एक्सपोजर है किसी भी तरीके का अगर आपका एक्सपोजर uh, हो गया है तो वो सारे आपके सस्पेक्टेड पॉइजनिंग के केसेस में आएंगे और वो सारे उसमें से कुछ ट्रीटेबल हैं कुछ नॉन ट्रीटेबल है कुछ ऐसे भी पॉइजन हैं जिसमें हंड्रेड परसेंट मोर्टेलिटी है देन द थर्ड कैटेगरी इन लिविंग केसेस इज ड्रग फैसिलिटेटेड सेक्शुअल असोल्ट आजकल हम बहुत ज्यादा सुनते हैं कि और मूवीज में भी दिखाते हैं कि जो है ना आपके जो आप लिकर ले रहे हो जो आप ड्रिंक ले रहे हो उसमें उन्होंने कोई ड्रग डाल दिया एंड द पर्सन डोंट नो एनी थिंग अबाउट दैट ड्रग उसको पता नहीं चलता उसकी मेमोरी से वो दिन डिलीट हो जाता है द टर्म विच वी यूज इज डेट रेप ड्रग डेट रेप ड्रग एंड इन सेक्शुअल असोल्ट केसेस काफी बार स्टूपीफाइंग एजेंट हमारे जैसे ओपीएम है इस तरीके के कुछ भी चीजें यूज करके और जो सेक्शुअल असोल्ट किए जाते हैं तो इन दीज केसेस जो आपका विक्टिम होता है या जो सर्वाइवर होता है सर्वाइवर के ब्लड से सर्वाइवर के सॉरी टू इंटरप्ट यू इन बिटवीन एक्चुअली वी है पार्टिसिपेंट फ्रॉम सेवेंटीन कंट्रीज ओके जी सो लैंग्वेज विक्टिम और द सर्वाइवर blood and urine samples will be collected in all the living cases blood and urine samples will be collected and the guideline is uh, two days because uh, the the drug in itself has its like uh, metabolism it will move out of your body after two days if you go for analysis so only two days are there uh the duration is only two days uh, two days where you can take the uh, samples and you can send it for analysis so in drug facil facilitated sexual assaults and in other toxicology cases also two or three days uh, are the period where you can take the sample and send it to the laboratory along with the preservative in dead cases the generally rta rta can be uh, railway track accidents or it it can be road traffic accidents uh, where a doubt was uh, create a doubt can be created like uh, the person has consumed alcohol or the person is already uh, given some poison or uh, already dead and then it was like uh, it was uh, thrown onto the railway tracks or on the traffic site there are various cases like it was burnt it was other so railway track accidents and the road traffic accident these type of uh, like uh, um, material also specifically alcohol and sometimes the alcohol is spiked with other type of drugs also or pesticides also which can like uh, which can act as a uh, fatal dose on uh, to that uh, to the victim or the died the person who is dead 
okay then other all other suspected poisoning deaths will be in the category who had consumed poison either through inhalation through ingestion through the injection or uh, ocular or dermal exposure ma'am uh, next slide please okay so these are the type of samples like uh, we already discussed uh, in post mortem toxicology what we can send we can uh, biology there are two or uh, three categories like in biological fluids one is biological fluids which contains the liquids other is biological tissues so the biological fluids we can send blood urine bile bile salts uh, bile liquid then vitreous humor and cerebrospinal fluid but in tissues category we can send liver stomach contents then bone or mus muscle tissue hair and nails maggots in case of uh, putrefied bodies where we uh, can also opt for entomology and in case of uh, injection or snake bite poisoning we can send the injection site the skin sample of that injection site and other samples which we can recover from the crime scene is like uh, the tablets which the person uh, used uh, used for uh, consumption and the powders for uh, that inhalation or consumption then syringes and the empty bottle of the containers all these samples will be sent for analysis ma'am next slide anti mortem samples we we can take blood urine hair nail samples and gastric lavas gastric lavas is one sample in uh, i'll explain uh, in case of living patients uh, that uh, few uh, water or uh, like salt of magnesium sulfate or uh, milk of magnesia we are saying that that was uh, like introduced uh, into the stomach of the patient with the help of a tube and all the stomach wash is taken out that stomach wash is uh, named as gastric lavas and it in living patients it is it, it is the best sample to analyze poison ma'am next then next slide okay the other samples which we, which can we can collect from uh, a dead body as like uh, blood urine vitreous get gastric stomach contents bile csf and tissues liver brain lung kidney muscle hair and nails maggot it again depends upon the type of poisoning which type of poisoning normally the routine viscera which we sent for analysis is blood which was preserved in sodium fluoride and uh, then the viscera viscera is a term which includes specific uh, tissue samples which include portion of liver portion of uh, uh, your uh, uh, stomach with its content portion of your uh, uh, half of each kidney and uh, some specific like like it is like uh, um, uh, spinal poison then a portion of spine uh, spinal cord will be there if it is uh, some uh, inje uh, like injectable poison then the site of the injection will be cut uh, with 1 cm into 1 cm and it will be preserved then all these are viscera biological fluid is not a part of viscera this is the major mistake which people are like uh, assuming that viscera is the same thing blood is included in the viscera no blood is a separate uh, sample viscera contains all the tissue samples your liver piece of heart if it is a cardiac poison piece of lungs if it is a uh, inhalant poison piece of your uh, brain if it is the uh, um, cns depressant or something brain related poison so all these samples will be preserved accordingly routinely half of each kidney or uh, stomach with its content 10 cm of the intestine along with the stomach contents and piece of liver and your spleen these are the normal routine viscera which was sent in any unknown poisoning case to the forensic science laboratory or any other laboratory which will be examining the samples in case of putrefied bodies the metabolism of the drug was over so maggots will also be taken and preserved and sent for analysis hair and nails in case of metallic poison specifically we will preserve hair and nails muscles in case of uh, like again the injectable uh, poisons or the poisons which uh, specifically attack on the muscles uh, if we have some history about it definitely we will preserve the muscles specifically the skeletal muscles 
मैम प्लीज नेक्स्ट स्लाइड ओके दिस इज द क्वांटिटी व्हिच इज रिक्वायर्ड फॉर एनालिसिस फॉर रूटीन एग्जामिनेशन ऑफ सैंपल्स इन ईच केस व्हिच वाज प्रिजर्व रूटीनली इन मेनी केसेस यूरिन इज नॉट फाउंड इन द बॉडी इट वाज रिमूव्ड और इट वाज मूव्ड आउट और इट वाज नॉट देयर इवन इन द ब्लैडर आल्सो सो नॉर्मली ब्लड लिवर स्टमक एंड इंटेस्टाइनल कंटेंट्स किडनी and a piece of intestine all these were sent for analysis ma'am next slide uh ma'am please next okay so these are other specific viscera samples which are specific to some uh, poisoning like csf we can send for alcohol cases there is a, a correlation between csf and the normal blood samples brain we can send for uh, alcohol uh, examination anesthetic barbiturates carbon uh, monoxide poisoning cyanide poisoning opiates and strychnine poisoning lung we can send for all the inhaled poison because the root of exposure was inhalation then spinal cord it will be sent in full length in case of strychnine poisoning and gelasmin poisoning then skin skin in in case of corrosive jaha uh, where acid attacks are there acid was thrown out or any other exposure with the acid in that case we can send uh, that uh, skin sample for analysis the affected portion and in case of injected poison as i said and in snake bite cases or scorpion stings or honey bee stings we can send the skin uh, uh, sample along with the routine viscera then uh, long bones in case of heavy metals because long bones have the capacity to retain heavy metals more then hair hair should not be cutted it should be plucked from the scalp and uh, uh, the quantity will be minimum 15 to 20 strands strands and hair uh, can be used in examination of heavy metals like arsenic poison can be there mercury poisoning can be there all these heavy metal poisonings we can use hair as a sample nails nails along with nail scrapings not the uh, like a small portion of nail no all the nails along with the nail scrapings can be sent for examination in case of heavy metals maggots maggots in cases of putrefied bodies then vitreous vitreous we can send for alcohol examination then gastric lavas gastric lavas wherever we are not getting uh like stomach contents because when gastric lavas or uh, that stomach wash already uh, took place in that case in that cases we will not get anything in the stomach in these cases we can use gastric lavas in place of stomach contents as a sample and definitely we will get uh, what we we are looking for in the gastric lavas samples next slide please ma'am okay the preservatives which we use normally and the best preservative which we can use uh, for the uh, the pre preservation of viscera for viscera rectified spirit is the best preservative but it is contraindicated in case of volatile poisons now we will see in other slide what are volatile poisons so rectified spirit is generally considered as the best source of uh, best preservative for viscera but contraindicated in cases of volatile poisoning like uh, alcohol poisoning or carbon monoxide or any other volatile poisoning so normally what we use we use saturated solution of common salt common salt is uh, sodium chloride and the quantity which made it saturated is 36 grams in 100 ml of water this is the concentration of saturated solution of common salt which we used for preservation of viscera viscera is again portion of liver portion of spleen portion of your brain a portion of your heart stomach and its content all these are so this is viscera viscera is preserved in saturated solution of common salt then blood blood will be preserved in sodium chloride along with potassium oxalate urine urine with sodium chloride then csf again sodium fluoride vitreous again sodium fluoride now there is a contraindication in csf and vitreous because they will degrade very fast so uh, as soon as we take out vitreous and csf it's very difficult to take out these samples but as soon as we take it we have to centrifuge it and we have to keep it uh, 
or, or analyze it within two days because otherwise it will degrade very fast. The shelf life or the life of vitreous and CSF is very limited. Then long worms, long worms will be sent without any preservative. Gastric lagoas again without any preservative. Ma'am, please next slide. Now there are some contraindications like alcohol poisoning or chloral hydrate poisoning, rectified spirit we can't use, chloroform poisoning we can't use rectified spirit as I explained uh, before. In all th these are all volatile poisons. So in all these poisoning, uh, we will not use rectified spirit as a preservative. In cases of acid poisoning, where the person ingests acid or like a household like heartbreak, toilet cleaner, phenol, anything. So in all the acids like hydrochloric acid or nitric acid, any or any base compounds like ammonia or anything, in these cases, except acid, acetic acid, we can use rectified spirit. And 1% of sodium hydroxide is used in cases of suspected cyanide poison. Next slide, ma'am, please. Okay, uh, regarding the uh, preservation, uh, we can use uh, definitely suitable containers, like uh, blood should be preserved in vials of sodium fluoride, viscera and other materials should be put in wide mouth plastic jars. We cannot use uh, glass bottles are obviously the best, but uh, the transportation of glass bottles will create a huge mess as it will break. And if the bottle breaks in between, all the samples will be destroyed. So we generally prefer and we generally suggest the plastic bottles with wide mouth container. If the mouth of the bottle is small, we will not be take, uh, able to take out the sample. Then. Always uh, we have to send a control sample of preservative like in cases of uh, uh, viscera preservation, we uh, must send a uh, control sample of the saturated solution, solution of common salt or rectified spirit, whatever we use along with the viscera. Then third is vitreous uh, humor or CSF can be preserved in NAF walls. Again, there are some contraindications attached with it. Hair and nails should be kept in small plastic bags without any preservative and the plastic bag should be in the paper envelopes. Other samples like needles, bones, clothes should be kept in glass jar but only after drying. Otherwise, it will, uh, it will uh, create uh, like fungus inside the uh, bottles and all the containers uh, should be leak proof and airtight. Ma'am, next slide. After packing and sealing, the, all the samples will be forwarded to the forensic science laboratory along with the seal of samples. And the seal, along with the seal of samples, lac is the material which will be used for sealing the samples. Ma'am, next slide. Every sample should contain this much information like name, age, the case number, the sample details, whether it is a piece of liver or spleen or the, the control sample details and the preservative used in it. Generally, a slip containing all these details will be attached on the bottle of the sample. And if any special precaution is required for handling that sample, that should be mentioned on the label itself and the signature of the sender. Generally, IO is the person who is like sending all these sample investigating officer. So the signature of the investigating officer should be there on the samples. Uh, next slide, ma'am, please. Now there are a few points related to it. If we are analyzing the samples within 24 hours, then no need of uh, putting preservative in it. Then tablets found in, sometimes what we got is when we open the stomach and we got the tablets, if the person has consumed 20 tablets or 10 tablets or many other tablets and the metabolism did not took place. In these cases, we will found uh, the tablet in the uh, stomach content and when uh, stomach wash will be uh, like done, uh, we'll get uh, the full tablets in that stomach wash. In these cases, the tablet should be taken out, dried and packed separately without any preservative. 
and in case of volatile poisoning like uh, um, generally where the root of exposure is inhalation like in covid cases in covid cases the root of exposure of that particular disease is inhalation in these cases lung should be preserved and in all the volatile uh, cases in uh, like volatile cases the lung should be cutted from uh, the uh, from the front area and it should be tied with a thread and then it should be kept in a uh, like a wide mouth jar and a layer of liquid paraffin should be poured above above it and it should be done in all the gaseous poison where the root of exposure was inhalation this is the special uh, precaution which we have to take in case of volatile poisoning the sample preservation specific uh, specifically in case of volatile poisoning again all the samples which were preserved and packed should be properly immersed in the preservative ma'am next slide okay this is about admissibility i think uh, all the chemical examiner report and uh, the report of the forensic uh, science laboratories uh, in the field of forensic toxicology and chemistry are, are admissible so this is a section which describes that any document purporting to be a report under the hands of a government scientific expert to whom this section applies upon any matter or thing duly submitted to him or examination or analysis and report in the course of any proceeding under this code may be used as evidence in any inquiry trial or proceeding under this code so any chemical examiner or assistant chemical examiner to the government or the director deputy director assistant director of the laboratories can uh, can submit their report under this section okay ma'am now we can proceed to the uh, next presentation okay now moving back again the pre analytical phase i think which we have covered is uh, the sample preservation and it's moving and forwarding and the next uh, is the analytical phase where we perform the analysis where uh, like uh, your preliminary screening and your confirmatory testing will be there and then the post analytical phase where uh, writing or of reports will be there the pre analytical phase Uh, that involves appropriate sample collection preservation safe transport receipt storage at appropriate place ma'am next slide now the analytical phase uh, it uh, starts from the classification of poison as soon as your sample reaches to the laboratory uh, the sample like on the basis of some history and the sample is divided into various categories not only one analysis is performed but the sample is divided into various categories and it will be analyzed accordingly so uh, the major categories for toxicology uh, screening will be like one of your uh, portion will be analyzed for pesticide other portion will be analyzed for metal other uh, th the third one will be for drugs then the uh, negative or positive ions and ions or cations and one will be uh, for volatile poisons or gases so the, these are the major categories where we can analyze the our samples then next slide now the analytical phase involves pre treatment of biological sample pre treatment means uh, the extraction procedures which we use uh, to extract the desired sample from the visceral material or the samples or the matrix like from blood what uh, what uh, extraction procedure we we can use for metals what extraction procedure we use like it depends again the type of analysis or the uh, type of uh, like uh, analyte which we are looking for if we are going for like metal estimation we will do digestion process we will uh, uh, like uh, will add that uh, acid to the visceral material or the blood and we will digest it it again can be done as open digestion or closed digestion and the sample uh, obtained will be filtered and uh, used for testing again uh, likewise 
for drugs and pesticide cases we use generally solvent solvent extraction where the uh, that matrix is like uh, again and again uh, put it into that uh, solvent system and the so two uh, solvent systems it was then extracted it was then isolated and then it was uh, like filtered isolated and that then it uh, can be analyzed for its uh, like preliminary testing and analysis so all these again depend on your type of sample uh, uh, if you if you have volatile poison then you have to go for distillation if you have like petroleum products then you can go for fractional distillation so it again depends on the type of analyte which you are going to analyze so all these hats which are uh, there in that uh, classification of poisons which we which a person or a toxicologist is going to examine it depends upon the type of analyte and it on the type of analyte the extraction procedure varies okay next slide uh, biological sample for metal analysis we will go for uh, digestion process for pesticide and drug analysis we will go for solvent solvent extraction for anions like acids and bases we will uh, filter and we can use for volatile poisons we can go for distillation process again gaseous for uh, we can use go for distillation process for miscellaneous poison miscellaneous poisons can be your diamond dust your iron nails and your uh, anything that can be uh, your chopped hair also which can also act as a mechanical poison so in all these cases uh, what we can do we can filter the sample and like in uh, animal there are some uh, uh, contraindications like in animal or insect poison uh, like in case of venom venom is a protein material so uh, in uh, with venom we can go for uh, that uh, biological procedure that is a part of toxicology that is a poisoning case but in that case we use we use that some techniques of biology for separation of proteins mam next slide okay uh, this is i already explained like uh, in case of metals dry ashing and wet digestion are there in case of uh, drugs and pesticide liquid liquid ex extraction and one other technique which is now it is uh, uh, emerging it's solid phase extraction is there in case of volatile poisons steam distillation fractional distillation vacuum distillation is there and other uh, things like differential centrifugation density gradient centrifugation sedimentation sedimentation with coagulation all these techniques are the pre treatment which we uh, can also or uh, like uh, use the term for this is extraction procedure so for the samples next slide ma'am so after extraction of the samples still some turbidity or some uh, like uh, particles will be left behind for this we use the clean up procedure this is the clean up procedure where we can pour the samples through different layer of your uh, like cotton or filter you can use any procedure uh, de again depending upon the type of analyte mam next slide okay now after this we can move for, uh, forward to detection De your detection will be like your preliminary screening now there is a uh, like a glitch in that sometimes the preliminary screening can be directly done on the site of uh, your uh, case and uh, we can also uh, use the term point of care testing here also and uh, sometimes it is done in the laboratory it is basically done to define in which category your poison will fall upon all the extracted samples which were divided into different categories will now be taken here and uh, we will proceed further for their preliminary analysis preliminary analysis why we are doing that because uh, by doing pre preliminary analysis we can stop our analysis further if we will not found any analyte in it so we will proceed only in that case for confirmatory examination where, where we will find something related to the analyte or the poison related to that case we will proceed for that technique only because the confirmatory techniques involve your instrumentation and again the instrumentation is very costly and very expensive again and the sample used 
will be uh, like the uh, instruments are very sensitive enough and again it involves so much cost and expenditure and the manpower in it so on the basis of preliminary screening we can identify which compound is there and we can proceed uh, further in which direction so preliminary screening generally involves your chemical test all the color tests like in metallic uh, we uh, compounds we can use the color test in drugs and pesticides we can use the color test and we can also use thin layer chromatography and uh, the other compounds in case of volatile poisons we can perform the uh, like uh, spot test for ethanol methanol and other things uh, and uh, for other poisons also there are so many a color test which we can do and which can be concluded in this preliminary screening on the basis of result of preliminary screening we can move proceed for confirmatory testing in next slide your confirmatory testing involves instrumentation and instrumentation is generally divided into three categories three uh, techniques which we can employ for examination of our samples for uh, recently we are uh, like uh, doing uh, quanti that the qualitative analysis only but in case of alcohol examination as i said my in my previous presentation that in case of alcohol examination in drunk and driving cases quantitative estimation will be there because the uh, punishment will be based on the quantity again in drugs cases the seized drug cases the uh, uh, punishment will be based on quantity in these cases quantitative estimation will be there otherwise in all other cases only qualitative estimation is done and the poison is confirmed so the three major categories of instrumentation which we involve for uh, our testing one is your chromatography which includes all your chromatography techniques then other is spectroscopy then voltammetry and polarography this is a third technique which nowadays is emerging and uh, people are using it generally two techniques are there which we uh, like read about it and we have like uh, chromatography in every lab we will find chromatography starting from tlc to gc and other hyphenated techniques sometimes we use combination of techniques uh, like in case of hyphenated te techniques we use gc and ms with it we use hplc and ms with it so we call it that lcms so ma'am next slide moving forward <coughs> moving forward chromatography the chromatography is a physical method of separation that distributes component to separate between two phases in chromatography in all the chromatographic techniques uh, whether it is your tlc high performance liquid chromatography or gas liquid chromatography or hptlc or ion chromatography anything we have two components one is your stationary phase and other is your mobile phase in both these components Uh, the analyte the sample which contains your solute and solvent and the movement depends upon the affinity if the solute compound having uh, is will be having aff more affinity towards the solute phase it will move slowly and if the uh, solute compound will have more affinity towards the mobile phase it will move faster and the result will be declared on the basis of retention time retention time the time taken by the so that uh, analyte to move into that particular portion whether it is your column whether it is your tlc plate or whether it is anything to start from that phase generally chromatography is a separation technique it separates the analytes on the basis of uh, their affinity with the mobile phase or the stationary phase stationary phase is not moving but the mobile phase is moving again it depends upon the categories so on the basis of their affinity and the time taken by the analyte to move from initial point to end point is the retention time which will be calculated and on the basis of every analyte have a different retention time and on the basis of retention time we can we can conclude we can analyze that this is the compound so all the tlc technique in tlc we use silica gel g and uh, ma'am next slide please okay in tlc the stationary phase is generally the silica gel g g stands for gypsum 
and uh, the mobile phase can be any uh, combination of any two solvents organic solvents or you know uh, and uh, it can be the single solvent where the uh, you can see in the image uh, like from the start line uh, with the help of capillary the analyte will be poured there and it will move and uh, later on you can uh, look at the spots these spots are the uh, desired or the moved analytes and rf which was uh, written over there is the retention factor uh, uh, is the that uh, spot we got for the, uh, the desired analyte and uh, finishes the line generally in tnc what how we can analyze is the distance traveled by the solute and distance divided by distance traveled by the solvent is the retention factor on the basis of re retention factor we can analyze two compounds your control one will be having the same retention factor with your suspected analyte sample. So it is the distance traveled. Your A is the distance traveled by the solute and your B is the distance traveled by the solvent. So this technique is generally uh, sometimes considered as the preliminary testing technique or sometimes it can be involved in the confirmatory testing also. Next slide, ma'am. Moving again to HPLC, HPLC, uh, this is the uh, diagrammatic representation of your HPLC instrument where we can uh, have the pump which can like uh, send the mobile phase uh, in form of liquid to uh, uh, move the sample. The mobile phase take the sample which will be injected by the injector and sent it to the column. From the column, now column is considered as the heart of chromatography, whether it is your uh, gas chromatography or your high performance liquid chromatography. Column is something uh, from the injector when the uh, when your uh, sample, suspected sample or your control sample enters in the column, the your retention time starts. It will start from zero. When it starts moving there, again on the basis of on the basis of affinity with the solute and solvent phase. Is my voice audible? It is now audible, ma'am. Okay. So, so uh, the analyte, it will again start moving uh, in the column itself and when it elute out from the column it means it moves out the term uh, we use here it is elution the compound of our desired choice when it elutes out of the sample at the same time it will be monitored and the time it took in the column will be its retention time from entering to the column and to the elution from the column this is the retention time and it will be detected by the detected by the detector and from the detector it will uh, go towards the to our system where we will get the results in the form of a graph next slide ma'am now these are the principal and uh, the applications of uh, your uh, HPLC, all the uh, in the category, all the non volatile, non volatile which cannot be converted into uh, volatile form, which cannot be heated, all the non volatile samples, organic samples will be analyzed using HPLC. There are some categories like the volatile samples will be analyzed using GC, but all the non volatile organic samples will be analyzed using HPLC. In the place of detector, we can also couple it to the mass spectrometry technique. Then it will be used as a hyphenated technique, LCMS. So we can analyze drugs, which are non-volatile, pesticides, which are non-volatile and organic pesticides, soil samples, then uh, uh, that nitrocellulose and uh, nitroglycerin compounds, organic compounds in explosives we can al analyze here. Several inks and dyes we can analyze on using HPLC. Ma'am, next slide. Then gas liquid chromatography or gas solid chromatography here. The mobile phase is gas. 
in uh, hplc the mobile phase was liquid in uh, gas liquid chromatography the mobile phase is gas and uh, the stationary phase can be liquid if the stationary phase is liquid then it will be gas liquid chromatography but if the stationary phase is solid then it will be the gsc or gc so in gas chromatography uh, the gas will be used as a mobile phase and from the injector port it will take the sample and the sample will enter into the column again column is the heart of the instrument and when the sample enters in the column the time retention time started from zero and when it eludes out of the sample when it eludes out of the sample the retention time will be noted the time taken by the uh, that compound or the analyte in the column will be the retention time will be used for will be used for analysis the detector again will be uh, like for volatiles it will be uh, flame ionized ionization detector for phosphorus compounds it will be fpd and, and if you want spectrometry then it will be gcms and if the sample is like uh, uh, we have to uh, do the steam distillation of the sample to inject in gas liquid chromatography then in the in this uh, we, it will be heated and it will be uh, put it into the column but if uh, uh, nowadays there are a technique gchs hs means head space where you can directly put put your sample no uh, need of distillation will be there it will directly uh, heat the sample it will take uh, the volatile form of the sample by itself and it will uh, directly inject the sample into the column so gchs will be there for this uh gc hs will reduce our burden of manual handling of uh, that uh, steam distillation process in cases of volatile poisoning next slide these are the principle and applications of gc we can analyze all the volatile poisons like alcohol drug drug and pesticides which can be converted into volatile form which will not degrade when heated then all the volatile gases that the carbon monoxide or phosphor uh, that phosphine phosgene all the gases and all the fire and arson residues all the petroleum products all will be analyzed on gc then next slide now the second technique is spectroscopy spectroscopy is uh, is generally uh, if we look at the broad term it deals with the spectrum in the spectrum there are various uh, electromagnetic radiations and on the basis of types of radiations and their uh, phenomena sometimes it will be absorbed sometimes it will be scattered sometimes it will be emitted in all these on the basis of all these phenomena these techniques are divided like uh, atomic spectrum uh, atomic spectroscopy we have two techniques here atomic absorption spectroscopy just uh, which we can also call as double as and atomic emission spectroscopy generally called as icp aes in atomic absorption absorption phenomena will be there in atomic emission emission phenomena will be there in mass spectrometry the analyte will be analyzed on the basis of uh, mass by charge ratio in uv visible the compounds which will be like uh, which will can be analyzed between the range of uh, uh, 200 to 400 nanometer and 400 to 700 nanometer then ftir then nmr and raman spectrometry we will move forward as we have little time left ma'am please next slide i think we i had already explained free atoms in the ground state can observe light of certain wavelength when the radiation is applied on it absorption of each element is specific no other element absorbs wavelength so uh, next slide ma'am this is the flow diagram of atomic absorption spectrophotometry uh, from the radiation source these are like uh, excited and uh, then the sample will be uh, converted into uh, ions form and then it will uh, the detector will detect it will absorb the radiation the detector will detect the absorbed radiation and it will be recorded by a instrument ma'am next slide then atomic emission spectrometry emission spectrometry is uh, that detects the phenomena of emission of wavelength next slide uh, 
This is the flow diagram of atomic emission spectrometry. The sample is converted into aerosol compounds and then it will be like uh, uh, from the aerosol compounds, they emit, they, they are excited, they emit uh, the energy and the, that emission of energy will be noted and will be uh, like uh, sent to us in the form of graph by the computer. Next slide. Uh, all the inorganic samples will be analyzed. Inorganic means all the metallic uh, samples uh, can be analyzed using atomic absorption spectrophotometry and atomic emission spectrometry. And these are the samples which can be like used, which can be taken to analyze that um, inorganic samples. Then mass spectrometry, mass spectrometry, it can also be coupled uh, with the GC, GC and uh, HPLC. And it can be also um, be uh, counted in the in category of hyphenated techniques like LCMS and GCMS. So spectroscope, uh, spectroscopy is generally the detection technique uh, which detects the molecules on the va various phenomena on the basis of absorption, scattering, reflection, refraction, all these are. So I think... Ma'am, next slide. Uh, this is the flow diagram. I'll share the slides with you. This is the flow diagram of uh, mass spectrometry. And uh, next slide, ma'am. Now, the, the third category is voltammetry. Voltammetry is generally which we like already studied in our 12th or uh, 11th or 12th classes where a electrochemical cell will be there. And uh, where current is uh, where two or three electrodes will be there. One will be the neutral electrode and the current is uh, that voltage is applied between two electrodes and current is measured uh, between the other two electrodes and the current is directly proportional to the concentration of analyte. So uh, voltammetry and polarography generally helps uh, in uh, analyzing all the inorganic samples of the compound. Ma'am, next slide. So now this is the voltammetric vessel. In that uh, vessel, you, we will be having the solution which, which uh, helps in generation of electricity. When we apply uh, voltage between two electrodes, uh, then uh, the uh, working electrode and the reference electrode, the current will be measured between the other two electrodes. Ma'am, next slide. Okay, so all these are about your uh, techniques. Uh, we can use three panels of techniques as uh, our, uh, anal in our, our analytical phase, chromatography, all the chromatography techniques will be there, then spectrometry techniques will be there, then uh, third uh, panel is your voltammetry or polarography. This technique will be there, this is uh, generally used for uh, your inorganic analysis. In chromatography, only one technique will be used for your inorganic or metallic analysis. That will be your ion chromatography. That will analyze your anions and cations. Now, these are some associated terms. I think, ma'am, if time left, I'll explain these. Otherwise, I'll... Yes, ma'am, you can continue. Okay. So, these are a few associated terms which we will encounter, uh, like in our analysis, one is your true positive. When we are expecting an analyte and the results comes in the same way, whatever we desired, that the sample contains this particular uh, poison and we got the poison there, then the sample will be a true positive. Now, the second category is false positives. You will find these term in your uh, toxicology or your poisoning reports. Then other is your false positive. False positive like if some compound is not pre present in uh, that uh, in the history and not in anywhere else but will come as a result in your analysis and shows its presence like sometimes uh, it was in earlier times it was done that in cases of phosphide poisoning uh, or in cases in putrefied samples all the cases reported were of phosphide poisoning no that uh, that is because of that uh, lead uh, that uh, other gas, H2S gas, the interference of H2S gas, which made the sample positive of that phosphine gas. So it will be a false positive result when we are not expecting anything in the result and it will come. Then the third is true negative. Uh, the test correctly confirms the absence of a drug. When nothing is there, when we are testing something and we will not get the result, 
clearly uh, like uh, in uh, if we have a case of metallic poison but if we are testing for drugs and we will not get the drug desired drug then it will be a true negative then false negative when the test fails to detect the presence of a drug when it is present when it is a case of suspected metallic poison but the test shows that it is not present then it will be a case of false negative then we are expecting the uh, metallic poison to be there but it is not there so this particular analysis shows the results as false positive so these are the terms i think with this i'll wind up the things and uh, if anything is there please uh, let me know uh, with your questions i'll be there to answer them thank you there are a few questions ma'am if we can take some uh... Yes. Mm. So, uh, uh, when it comes to suicide, chemi using chemical or murder during the chemicals, do we do we have to separate? Do we have separate methods or process to be used? Uh, is the question is uh, in uh, is chat box? In the chat box, yes. And uh, why is that that urine wasn't found in the bladder? Uh, in case of in case of poisoning cases, yeah, the the bladder generally the person takes times to uh, for death. I think uh, uh, two or three hours. In that, in these two or three hours, urine will pass by, and we will not anything uh, related to urine in the bladder. Okay. In case of blood poisoning caused by either chemical, uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to blood sampling, how would you go about? Can you explain? Mm, I didn't get the question. Uh, Ma'am, can you look it in the chat box or should I repeat it again? Mm, I'm just looking, ma'am. Okay. In case of blood poisoning caused by either chemical, when it comes to blood sampling, how would you go about? Uh, in case of... In all the cases, it will be preserved in sodium fluoride only. And we will take the blood, we will preserve in sodium fluoride, then we will proceed for uh, like uh, pre-treatment methods. And if it is a chemical poison poisoning, we can uh, uh, go for digestion process because we can uh, we will be uh, analyzing the anions and cations in case of chemical. Chemical means uh, here I'm referring inorganic, but uh, all the categories which we had discussed are chemical poison. Again, it depends upon the type of uh, poison which was mentioned or which was which we are analyzing if it is a drug the blood will be preserved in sodium fluoride only except alcohol okay uh, then any other question uh, ma'am okay. can you uh, okay so uh, you can look in can you please look into the chat box and uh, respond okay because... the other question is case of blood poisoning caused by natural natural source such as snakes when it comes to blood sampling uh how would you go about can you explain in detail okay uh yeah i i think uh, i forgot to mention that thing in case of uh, that uh, blood poisoning by snakes or something the blood will definitely be preserved in edta okay and uh, the that uh, skin sample the injectable skin sample in case of uh, that uh, snake bite or scorpion bite because we have to analyze proteins so in that case, in these cases, we will be using the electrophoresis technique for uh, separation of proteins because the snake uh, venom is a protein is a protein in itself. So in these cases, the skin sample will be preserved in natural saline, uh, normal saline, in instead of your saturated solution of common salt, because it is easy to break normal saline, the bond of normal saline with the sample. Uh, rather than uh, like saturated solution. Then the next question it. Can you please explain headspace chromatography in detail? Uh, yeah, definitely. If time allows me, I'll explain it. Which test will be used when drugs and pesticides in both HPLC and GLC? Uh, all the like uh, drugs and pesticides, organic ones will can be converted into volatile form, which can be like uh, heated and uh, after uh, heating, with, which will not degrade. All these samples, all the drugs and pesticides will be analyzed using gas chromatography. 
and all the samples which cannot be heated because they will degrade if we heat them the organic uh, non volatile organic samples the drugs and pesticides specifically will be analyzed using hplc then uh, next question is for false negative how would you classify because if the drug how do you classify them false negative is uh, generally when we want something uh, that uh, if we are expecting something that we are testing for something like we are testing for arsenic but if the test does not show uh, or does not give gives the result of arsenic whether it is because of any other factors uh, because of decomposition because of your sample get destroyed or because it was uh, the gastric lavage was done the sample was taken out uh, then and there itself before it reaches to your metabolism in these cases you will definitely get false false, false negative results where you are expecting something but you will not get the results okay can we get the slides okay i'll share how can we contact you for further clarifications in case of false positive since it shows even Though no drug is present, should we do the test again? Yeah, we can go do the test again. Generally, these terms we found on the toxicological reports, which is our post-analytical phase. Framing of reports in itself is a big area. How to interpret the chromatogram? How to interpret the spectrogram? So in itself, it is a big area. In these cases, uh, like uh, when there is false positive re uh, result. definitely we will have to repeat the test we have to go for its repetition and we have to change the um, like if we have some other method also for the test we have to change the method yes uh, uh, we are done with the questions now okay so, ma'am yes thank you so much uh, ma'am and it's really a eye opening session for uh, for the all beginners and also for the advanced uh, people those who are already have the uh, fair idea about the forensic toxicology and their collection yeah. preservation so on behalf of sherlock institute of forensic science i would like to present this e mementos for your wonderful talk thank you so much sir and also this e certificate for imparting your valuable insight and inspirational knowledge on the topic forensic toxicology sample collection preservation and their analytical approach to the all learners thank you so much sir thank you so much ma'am uh, for uh, you know, taking out the time and delivering this wonderful talk and uh, with your permission we are moving further for the next speaker and our next speaker is uh, dr tilak sir and sir is going to talk on the somehow a uh, similar kind of topics uh, uh, decoding a mysteries of the forensic uh, by chemistry and request my co-host arti to kindly introduce our speaker uh sir should i uh, leave the session uh, yes ma'am thank you so much ma'am thank you so much okay thank you so much sir thank okay you. thank you so much so uh, i welcome dr chand tilak ram chandrakar sir and would take this privilege to introduce him to our uh, audience So, Dr. Tilak sir is an assistant professor and head of department of forensic science at Medicaps University in Indore. He holds a doctor of philosophy in biotechnology with specialization in wildlife forensic from Rani Durgavati University in Jabalpur, Madhya Pradesh. He completed his master's in forensic science from Dr. Hari Singh Gaur Central University in Sagar, and his bachelor's uh, honors in forensic science from uh, Pandit Ravi Shankar Shukla University in Raipur. With over five years of research and teaching experience, he has developed expertise in various areas, including molecular forensic, wildlife forensic, forensic medicine, forensic biology, and serology. He has supervised uh, several B.Sc., M.Sc., and uh, M.B.Sc. students on projects related to wildlife forensic, molecular forensic, and basic forensic work. He has published research papers in reputable journals such as UP Journal uh, of Zoology, uh, Veterinary World, Biomedical and Pharmacology Journal, and ARCC Journal. He has also contributed to the to some uh, to book chapters and presented his work at international conferences. In addition to his research work, he is an active member of Forensic Science Education Society in Raipur. He was awarded with the Krishi Vigyan Gaurav. for best scientific paper presentation on animal chromosome identification and its uses for healthy animal pedigree and identification we welcome you sir for this platform and uh, thank you for accepting our invitation 
So thank you, sir. Thank you for accepting the invitation. And uh, do you uh, want to us to share the slides, sir? Uh, your voice is not coming, sir. Voice is not coming, sir. Can any other people can confirm either we are able to hear or not? Uh, no, sir. The voice is not coming. Um, so you can check the connection uh, of the speaker. Maybe you can change the source of your mic, sir. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. No, it's, uh, Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, should I present the presentation from my side? So should I share the presentation from my side? Uh, again, I think uh, voice is not coming, sir. Uh, I think you, you just check check the microphone connection. We are not able to hear, sir. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Now it's coming. It's okay, great. Coming. So, uh, can I share, sir, or you will? Uh, you are going to share. Uh, if you want, you can, sir. Yeah, I'll do, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation and uh, uh, you know agreeing to deliver the talk on the topic decoding mysteries uh, of forensics in biochemistry. I hand over session to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, your nice gesture and a nice introduction and inviting me in such a very uh, uh, emerging and a very great platform, SIPS, uh, Sherlock Institute of Forensics. And thank you, Ranjit, sir, and the whole team of uh, SIPS India. Uh, shall I start now? Yes, sir. You can start, sir. Okay, great. Uh, there, as we can see, the, my topic is uh, decoding the mystery of uh, crime by forensic chemistry. So um, uh, I don't think so that I have to deal here about the forensic chemistry as we, but little bit of introduction about uh, uh, forensic uh, science. We know very well forensic is a branch of science, uh, application of sciences, which uses the basic uh, sciences application for the criminal purposes or for the justice purposes. When we look towards the forensic chemistry, uh, when the chemical knowledge or the chemistry knowledge applied into the field of forensic science, it becomes the foreign part of a forensic chemistry. So what basically we deal in the forensic chemistry? Forensic chemistry basically deals with the identification and analysis of chemical evidences that found at the crime scene. Crime scene could be any kind of crime scene, like we know very well, the murder, the suicide, the accidental poisoning, the metallic poisoning, and any kind of accident uh, or accidental or the occupational health has, uh, health hazards, like pesticide and index, uh, insecticides uh, and several other compounds that basically uses for the identification of uh, the forensic through. Uh, please next, yeah. Uh, uh, when we talk about the forensic chemistry, it basically uh, uh, have some difference uh, when we uh, talk about the forensic chemistry, we just have to be known and uh, explore the field of forensic toxicology too. Like uh, in my before session, Anita ma'am has briefly described about the forensic toxicology, the collection preservation and all the identification methods. So uh, I'll just give us uh, some share, uh, some site of the forensic chem difference uh, between the chemistry and the toxicology. Uh, how we can summarize, how we can identify it, and how we can differentiate the forensic chemistry and toxicology. Like forensic chemistry, there you can see it basically identifies the chemical substances submitted into the result for the court of law. But when we comes towards the forensic toxicology, this basically apply the knowledge of chemistry and the chemical things found it found inside the biological fluid or the biological tissue or the broth or any other biological substances. This turns into the uh, forensic toxicology from the forensic chemistry. Next, please. Okay. Uh, sir, again, we have lost your voice.
ऑडिबल सेट हाँ ये सर ना ऑडिबल सेट ओके सॉरी इट वाज डिस्टर्बिंग जस्ट ड्यू टू हेडफोन सॉरी अबाउट द इंटररप्शन नो प्रॉब्लम सर कंटिन्यू ओके लेट्स मूव अवे टू द टुवर्ड्स द हिस्ट्री एंड स्कोप ऑफ फॉरेंसिक केमिस्ट्री when we talk about the history of forensic chemistry forensic chemistry basically started from the 18th century 18th century in the france location so what was happened that time the uh, police authority or the um, uh, investigation investigating authority called the forensic uh, called the chemist to solve the cases of poisoning so this was the steve this was the era when the forensic chemistry start to become appear inside the uh, and they start to uh, start to uh, solve the crime cases so before that era the uh, crime cases already been solved by the various uh, various techniques and various various tools but forensic chemistry started in the uh, century of 18 so uh, when we talk about the history history uh, turns towards the application of chemistry into the forensic chemistry so uh, forensic science so it become the forensic chemistry now let's talk about the some scope of the forensic chemistry what could be the further scope of forensic chemistry forensic chemistry basically useful in the dope testing laboratory uh and uh, it is useful uh please uh, can you back the slide uh and uh, discussing about the scope yeah yeah thank you uh basically uh, forensic chemistry can also be useful in the for uh, forensic science laboratory for the chemical substances analysis in pharmaceutical industry in fertilizer manufacturing industry and into the industry which is related with the forensic uh, applications so forensic chemistry can have uh, can have the huge scope in the field of uh the testing field identification field and the anal and, and the analysis field of several chemical substances next please okay uh, here i am taking the ncrb database why we are taking the ncrb database uh, while we discuss about the certain mystery uh, of forensic uh, uh, chemistry and forensic uh, uh, science which uh, solved by the forensic chemistry because uh, here in ncrb database what we can see here after the hanging hanging it, uh, in this is the database of year 2021 here we can see the hanging is the one of the most abundant sources by killing himself or other uh, to make uh, to commit the suicide or the homicide after the hanging the poison taking method was the second uh, second most method by where the people is being dying themselves so what is been happening the poison is the major sources to killing himself or the others here uh, if you can see the other uh, other section of the slide there we can see the drug uh, uh, uses of the drug uh, of drug and abuse alcohol addiction there you can see this is basically about the uh, ap, ap, uses and the consumption of illicit liquor or the alcoholic substance which is uh, which is taking the highest number after the natural death death cases so this case basically the alcohol and the poison cases basically indicate about the identification of those compound so how we can identify we can identify the compound by applying the chemistry or the toxicology applications uh, toxicology sciences so this basically merge into the singular uh, single place for the identification of the several kind of compounds found inside the body or found at the crime scene next please okay uh let's move to her towards the my basic theme which is about the crime mysteries decoded by the use of forensic chemistry here you will be surprised and you will be uh, really glad to know the cases were solved by using the application of the chemistry into the forensic science that become the forensic chemistry so what is been happening let's move to her the towards the one of the famous case study that was happened in in the era era of 2008 uh, that is the place uh, that is the place this is the karnataka tamil nadu uh, what was happened in this place uh, around 180 people reportedly died after consuming the methanol poisoning this methanol poisoning is considered to be a illicit liquor which is the unprocessed the unprocessed uh, ethanol uh, sorry unprocessed alcohol so 
uh, this was the uh, cases which opened the eye towards the how the how the large number of ethanol uh, eth methanol is been producing at the remote areas so this after consumption of this met uh, methanol or the uh, illicit liquor or the uh, unprocessed alcohol the people become diet so how we can identify the people is been diet by this poison this was the methanol poison which was happened in uh, into the karnataka tamil nadu which was the cause of uh, killing of 180 people why i am mentioning the term killing because this is the prohibited to produce the methanol and seal the uh, seal the methanol for people consumption this methanol turns into the ethanol after the uh, this is the processed way after the people can consume it but this methanol consumed by the people which becomes the very uh, deadly uh, deadly for their health and 180 people become died so this methanol uh, was identified by application of forensic chemistry this was the famous case study and which was uh, taken the view of a large uh, various uh, media towards the uh, cases and uh, they try to awake the government towards the for formation of this methanol at the remote places next please okay let's talk about the case number 2 which is that uh, tokyo subway attack that was happened into the 1995 as we all know very well about the some terrorist uh, attack which was happened into the uh, several uh, times before that era if you remember uh, in the world war 2 times which was happened the uh, nervous agent uh, gases was used like uh, taboon and the sarin that gases was used at the time of world war 2 but the similar things was repeated in the era era of 1995 uh, into the uh, uh, at the japan tokyo so what was happened that time the sarin gases was released by the terrorist certain uh, terrorists which causes the uh, death of the more than 13 people and more than 5500 people become injured by inhaling those type of gases so uh, this opens up the um, severity about the serine gases which insert into the body and try to uh, affect the nervous agent this was uh, committed by the AUM the uh, AUM the religious moment japan based religious moment which was later identified as the preparator of attack so the, this was the most burning cases which came into the light in the era era of 1995 there the serine the nervous agent gases was used to uh, harm the people uh, let's talk about the case number 3 okay wakayama japan arsenic murder case uh, this is the one of the major cases which is correlated with the case number 2 uh, uh, this cases was happened into the 1998 just after the 3 years uh in inside the japan itself so what was happened that time let me uh, brief you about the cases about the uh, wakayama arsenic murder cases arsenic as you know very well uh, this is the metallic poisoning so it can harm the people when come inside the body what was happened that time uh in the uh, wakayama the people was uh, that was the time of festival so uh, people is trying to uh, pe uh, people uh, trying to uh, get the food from the several places and uh, this where the food was prepared this was uh, some amount of arsenic was mixed inside the food substances so uh, these substances was later identified uh, by uh, investigating the crime scene when the people died uh, after consuming those substances uh, what was happened the people in the, the police investigate the crime scene and they found the large number uh, about the 35 gram of arsenic they found the arsenic in the uh, cooking uh, cooking pots so what was happened those who are preparing the food they mix the arsenic poisoning intentionally 
to kill the several people around the area who was consuming the food and uh, when the uh, when the police investigate the crime scene and found uh, the crime the various evidences at the crime scene they uh, collect the crime scene and sent it to the forensic science lab they found the high concentration of arsenic this con concentration is capable to kill the large number of people so how the arsenic is been identified the arsenic is been identified in the forensic science lab uh, by chemical examination of arsenic this chemical, this arsenic was also uh, found uh, into the, the hair of the uh, person who was preparing the food. So uh, when someone suspected that the person was cooking the food, the people in uh, trying, uh, the uh, police interrogate the uh, person and uh, search the crime scene. And after interrogation, where what he is found, they have found the same amount of arsenic at their hair, uh, hair, head, head hair. So they assume like the, this was the person who uh, contaminated the food by using the arsenic. So this case was investigated by police there and identified the arsenic was the reason which causes the death of the people. Next, please. Okay, the case of pink powder, uh, Australia. This is the famous case which was happening into the era of 19, uh, 1960. Uh, this was a case which opened up about the, the how the some amount of evidences can become a very wonderful clue to uh, identify, to uh, know about the crime, uh, crime and the crime places. So what was happened in 1996, in 19, that was the cases from the Sydney, Australia, where the people uh, won the prize into the lottery around uh, one lakh pounds. So when the news came into the news channel, the people won the, the one lakh pound into the lottery. So uh, what was the happened? The uh, criminal who was suspected to kidnap his son, the eight year son, he kidnapped the eight year son and uh, call the uh, call the call their parents for ransom money so they have called the people they have called their parents for uh, money so after what was happened after two days uh, the his son the parent's son was found uh, dead at the certain place and the, when the son was uh, recovered uh, in the discovered by uh, recovered by the uh, uh, local authorities uh, local people they informed to the police that dead body was found at the places and this dead body uh, when the police came in came to uh, took the dead body what they have found they have found the large number of pinkish powder on their dead bodies so this pinkish powder and the soils and the molds and the muds onto onto their clothing and their uh, shoes so uh, this tells about the uh, the uh, sun uh, the uh, the uh, i mean say uh, i want to say like uh, the uh, uh, his parents son yeah son son uh, or the the uh, i'm uh, the uh, student yeah you could say the eighth year eighth uh, standard student who was uh, died by the people uh, died by the person who kidnapped him so uh, he was found dead at the places and uh, people uh, the police person start to search out the cases and uh, he he found the several clue and evidences on their dead bodies so they call the various kind of forensic expert these experts included the uh the, like uh, he, uh, he, the botanist the uh, uh, who found the mold on their dead body who found the uh, fungus on their dead body they call the chemist they call the uh, other uh, forensic expert so who what they have done they just interact uh, investigate the dead bodies and found the several kind of ev evidences on their uh, bodies so a chemical examination uh, was happened uh, for the identification of the pinkish powder and what they have found this was the powder basically used for the painting of the houses so uh, this was the cases the painting of the houses and uh, they have found a kind of pink color of powder so uh, they were really uh, uh, unexplainable and understand where uh, what was the crime scene where the crime was committed they called uh, the people uh, the uh, 
police person who are inter interrogating the crime scene, they take the help of broadcasting media. So what was uh, here, you can see the application of broadcasting media. What was the famous uh, things happen? Uh, what was the important thing happens when the uh, police broadcasts, uh, broadcasts the case, the body was found at the area, found with the um, uh, pinkish powder and the mold uh, and the certain seeds of uh, uh, plant. So uh, they have broadcasted the uh, news uh, into the local media. After uh, hearing the news, the postmen, uh, uh, basically postmen who are roaming around the street and the city, uh, found certain type of uh, houses where which is been uh, painted by the pink uh, powder, and we are uh, we are nearby his house. The cypress tree was there. So they informed the police person and police, when the police came into the houses, they found the same uh, pinkish powder painted on their home and uh, which uh, is found into the dead body. So what was the breakthrough here? The pink powder becomes a breakthrough uh, and the cypress tree seed was the breakthrough which is found uh, at the uh, crime scene places uh, and the uh, police start the searching to the preparator who uh, commit the crime and uh, the, who kidnapped the person they found the uh, person who kidnapped the uh, uh, his eight year old son uh, they found like uh, he was uh, kidnapped him by, for the monetary gain uh, for the some amount of money but uh, accidentally he uh, accidentally the uh, son was died so uh, what basically we have uh, what basically was happened there the uh, police interrogated the uh, person who commit the crime and found he was the main culprit who uh, kidnapped his uh, child and after kidnapping the child was accidentally died and having the large number of uh, certain uh, che chemical and the powder and the powder like powder and the yeast and the fungus evidences they found the person was the preparator and he committed the crime that he was the person who uh, commit the crime so this case was basically uh, opened before the media the person uh, kidnapped the uh, kidnapped that uh, his uh, old 8 year old son and uh, after kidnapping he accidentally died and he ran away from the crime places but having the large number of physical evidences, the crime, yeah, the crime and the the crime behind the crime, uh, all the things was uh, decoded by the local police persons. Uh, please next. Okay, uh, let's talk about the uh, one of the famous case study that was happened into the uh, uh, India, Mumbai. So this is the Neeraj Grover murder case, which was happened into the 2008 year. You can see the soil become the secondary evidence to connect the crime scene. What was happened there? The Neeraj Grover was the film uh, film industry person, and uh, he uh, used to uh, make some film, make some television series, and he meet with the Maria Susai Raj. Maria Susai Raj was the, the lady who wanted to make her career into the film industry. What was happened, uh, the Neeraj Grover helped Maria Susairaj for establishing herself into the film industry. In the, uh, in the uh, and just he fell into uh, love with her, uh, Maria Susairaj. So he was trying, Neeraj was trying to uh, establish the Maria Susairaj into the film industry, but these things was uh, not accepted by the boyfriend of Maria Susairaj. So what was happened, the Maria Susairaj boyfriend uh, used to meet the uh, uh, Maria Susaraj at her places, and uh, certain uh, these things were happening in a few days. So Neeraj Grover came uh, into her house and found her boyfriend. Uh, the boyfriend, the boyfriend was uh, with the Maria Susaraj. So what was happened? Uh, he was uh, found kidnapped. Uh, because he didn't return his home uh, for uh, few days. The Neeraj Grover parents uh, complained into the police authority like the cases was uh, happened, my uh, son is missing. So what the police person did, police person in investigate uh, with the angle of kidnapping. 
but he found that close one was the Maria Suicidas, a lady who was who wanted to become a uh, Bollywood actor or the uh, film industry person. Uh, the police person interrogated the Maria Suicidat and what they have found, the Maria Suicidat do not accept to commit the crime was happened. He even he refuses that he uh, see no, uh, even she refuses that she know any information about the Neeraj Grover. So what was happened? The um, uh, police person again interrogate the Maria Suicidat, pressurely uh, interrogate her and she committed like his boyfriend killed the Neeraj Grover. So this was the case uh, behind the all the scene and she committed like uh, her boyfriend killed the Neeraj Grover. Uh, but uh, and they transport the body to the one place to the another places and uh, they just uh, burn their body uh, at the uh, lonely places or the, at the jungle places. Uh, just after Novi, uh, after her confession, the police, per the police person searches the crime scene but he uh, searches the crime scene and he found uh, and they, the police person found the burned body at the places so what they did just they collect the few uh, teeth evidences from there this teeth evidences uh, they just took the teeth evidences and the hold the body but burn after the uh, after the investigating of the burning body it become difficult to establish the identity they just use the teeth evidences to establish the identity. They uh, send the teeth evidences to the FSL. FSL uh, just FSL just uh, isolate the DNA from the dental pulp and match the dental pulp to their parents. So what was happened? He found the uh, as the Neeraj Grover who was killed and burned by the Maria Suicidas and her boyfriend. Uh, but it, in these cases, it was not so enough to establish the uh, crime between um, the crime places and the preparator. So uh, people search, uh, the police searches for the another evidences, another the breakthrough. Uh, so what they have found, they just collected the mud from the and the soil from the crime scene places, and they compare uh, they compare the soil uh, uh, sample with the uh, tire, tire, tire soil they have found into the Maria Suicidas boyfriend uh, vehicle tire. So this uh, soil become the secondary evidence to connect the uh, crime scene and to the preparator uh, with the uh, uh, crime incidents or the crime scene. Here, uh, what we can see, the soil plays an important role to connect the crime scene and the preparator. Uh, that they were uh, move the body and burn the body at the places and uh, they just ran away. Uh, uh, what was happened, the court called the police person, uh, official person uh, to reveal the identification and the analysis procedure. They, uh, they revealed the analysis procedure like they have um, uh, compared the evidences with the, their parents, uh, DNA evidences, and they compared the soil sample with the uh, crime scene and the needed uh, and the Maria Suicidas boyfriend uh, vehicle tire uh, soil sample, where, which is uh, related and uh, the, both are found to the similar. So those evidences are enough to establish the uh, link between both the preparator and the crime scene. And this case is become came into the court and uh, after their confession of both Maria and her boyfriend, they uh, found guilty and uh, punished by the honorable court. So here, uh, soil become the secondary evidence to make uh, to link between the crime and the uh, crime scene. Uh, next, please. Okay, uh, forensic identification of Sindhu stain on cloth as stress evidence analysis. This is the case number seven, which was happening to, with the thirty-two year old uh, lady. Uh, what was happened there? Uh, the old lady uh, was in relationship with uh, the old lady was uh, at her home and uh, found uh, hanged on a um, ceiling fans. So uh, they have found uh, their uh, their husband and their in laws were uh, at, uh, not available, not found at the not uh, available at, uh, when she commit the uh, or she commit the suicide. So the whole thesis was seeing like this was the case of suicide.
but after the investigation thoroughly in, uh, examination of that uh, dead body and thoroughly examination of the crime scene it was found that the uh, sindhu uh, sorry it was found that the, this was the not a case of uh, suicidal this was the case of homicidal so what was happened into the post mortem examination the post uh, in the post mortem examination what doctors found they have found the my body was first strangulated and hanged onto the ceiling uh, fans so uh, there uh, in that case what is been happened that generally uh, uh, charges are uh, the criminal person assume like their uh, their relative or their husband or their in laws but they were absent uh, at the home that time so um, Uh, and has and uh, her lady husband also revealed that this lady was in relationship with the another guys so uh, uh, people the, the police is, uh, start the uh, start their investigation in, with the angle of homicide not with the angle of the suicide what they have found they have found the uh, person who was uh, in uh, like uh, their husband who was claiming that the he was the she was in relationship with uh, another people so uh, they have the the, uh, the police found the another people uh, who was suspecting to uh, suspecting to kill that lady uh, they have found uh, the people uh, they have found the person and just start to their investigation what they have found they have found a little bit amount of the sindoor on their clothes so this sindoor was later conf- uh, later matched with the lady uh the lady who was uh, hanged into the mm, uh, roof uh, into the ceiling uh, on on a ceiling fan so uh, they have identified that they have compared the sindoor uh, found at the suspect and uh, collected from the uh, lady's body so they have uh, uh, analysis the sindoor using the atomic absorption and the and uh, ftir techniques so what they have found they have found the similar matches between both the sindoor uh, both the sindoor that they found with the suspected person and they found with the lady concerned lady who was uh, who she was died so later they have established the link between the lady and the suspect one uh, here the locart principle of exchange for plays a very crucial and the important role by which uh, we can say like the having the uh, when the two places come together come together they make impression on it so this was the happen uh, it was assumed like and uh, which was later confirmed they they uh, the lady and the suspect one was found have some uh, str- uh, struggle between both of them and the suspect one just strangled that lady and uh, hanged her lady on a ceiling fan so uh, this was the breakthrough which was solved by the locart principle of exchange by using the sindoor that was uh, the compared with the suspect one and the compared with the uh, lady who was died so uh, here you can see the forensic chemistry and the uh, chemical examination of that sindoor reveal the uh, uh, relation uh, re- reveal the relation between the suspect and the lady so the case was later uh, uh, disclosed into the media and identified uh, the uh, suspect as a, a murderer who uh, killed that lady uh, now move towards the another cases the chemist as a murderer uh, that was happened into the 2010 uh this was the famous cases of thallium uh, like you know very well about the uh, some comp- uh, some battery compound which is the lithium lithium ions and the thallium is also kind of radioactive substances this was used to kill that person uh, this is the case of a uh, computer engineer in uh, preston university who was uh, admitted into the preston university he was admitted into the hospital having the symptom of flu uh, flu like symptom so later he was admitted into the hospital and uh, was diagnosed by the uh, doctors there but what was happened there they just diagnosed the people but uh, uh, gradually their health is decreasing and uh, uh, their health uh, he's become unwell after have, after receiving the uh, treatment of doctors he's become the unwell uh, 
the doctor were very confused like uh, we are providing the uh, very we are providing the treatment uh, very good treatment to him but we are not able to cure that uh, computer engineer so what they have did uh, some of the doctor was uh, assumed like uh, i am suspecting about the certain kind of uh, chemical things but uh, uh, later on what was happened the uh, after receiving the certain kind of uh, chemical, uh, after receiving the certain therapies, the software engineer become died. And this was become the uh, questionable to the doctor, how after giving the certain uh, medical treatment, how he become died. So they just uh, send their uh, uh, visceral sample to the forensic science laboratory and they have solved like the people was uh, the uh, software engineer was consuming the helium in his body so the angle becomes converted uh, to the natural death uh, to the uh, uh, intentional death or the homicidal death so what was uh, the case came into the police and police start to search down the cases and interrogate the person who can be a uh, uh, preparator they have found the chemist which yeah, which uh, is her the uh, wife so her wife was working into the uh, camp into the uh, hospital and uh, another hospital and see uh, another chemical laboratory sorry and she was regularly deal with the uh, chemical known as the helium so this helium was uh, uh, this thallium was given by her wife to the uh, computer engineer or the software engineer. So the thallium becomes the reason to diet the, uh, this computer engineer. After that, uh, when uh, her wife has been interrogated, she committed like she uh, gave the thallium uh, to his uh, uh, husband. Uh, and the reason was uh, they wanted to divorce from him and they uh, wanted to uh, some amount of money uh, from his uh, husband so they uh, giving they start to giving the chronic uh, chronic poisoning to the, uh, the husband so this chronic poisoning was thallium so uh, chemical examination revealed that the uh, person was died after having the large amount of thallium which was given by her wife so this case was later confirmed and uh, later uh, uh, analyzed uh, the uh, death reason was the thallium which was given by her uh, wife uh, the, again the uh, chemist plays an important role for uh, identification of those cases now let's move to her the poison keys cases this is was the, this is one of the most uh, famous cases uh, uh, which is known as the poison keys cases as you know uh, what was happened there uh, at that time the young man uh, and her fiance uh, before her wedding uh, day they had they have they, uh, they have found they had seated on to a sofa at their home and they have uh, their body is being rigid and uh, the faces were flushed and men were stopped with, uh, with a slight oral hemorrhages. And external evidences often even said that, uh, set as the chemical analyst and they have found the, the person was died due to the cyanide poisoning, the potassium cyanide, because the external symptom indicating about the, the person was uh, suffered with the, and the person, uh, the, both the, uh, the fiance and uh, the both the married couple uh, did uh, their faces has been shown like they have uh, been uh, exposed by any kind of poison. So this poison was later uh, suspected like a potassium cyanide. The, what was happened there, the man mouth was found a piece of chewing gum which is uh, found, uh, which uh, the another pack of chewing gum was also discovered from his home. The chemical analysis revealed about the uh, incidents, like the chemical analysis found the gum and the stomach contained both the victim uh, revealed about the uh, person was died due to the cyanide poisoning. The As we all know very well about the cyanide is a lethal kind of poison which can be 
cause the, the death of a person even if you provide into the very uh, less amount. So the, the test was the letter uh, confirmed the uh, poisoning of cyanide and uh, the, the cases revealed like the uh, person uh, wanted to kill her, uh, kill his fiance because uh, he don't want to get married with her and, just, and uh, he uh, generally uh, uh, don't uh, don't know the severity and the lethal lethality of the cyanide poisoning that's why he chewing he chewing uh, uh, chewing gum and kiss uh, her the fiance so after the cyanide uh, uh, float into both the body and uh, the person who kissed the uh, lady the lady become dead and the person who also chewing the gum he also become died so later the case was confirmed that both were died by having the cyanide poisoning. Next, please. Okay, uh, let's move toward the another uh, case study. This was the you can say the kind of puzzle which was happened, uh, which was happened into the uh, chemist death, which is related with the chemist death. Uh, what was happened there? A famous chemist was found murdered in his laboratory. The police knew that the people were involved in his murder and here they were suspect named like John, Bob, Felis, Nicholas and Joshua. So uh, police were suspecting that uh, these five were involved into the killing of the chemist. And the police found a certain kind of note, which is written by the chemist in his note. Uh, there was written some numbers, like this number was 26, 3, 58, divided by 26 again, 27, 57, and the 16. After reading the numbers, the police immediately found the murderer. Who was the murderer and how did the police know? Uh, we have some clue in this number. Please next. Okay. What are the number indicating? The number indicating like how we can solve this puzzle. The victim is a famous chemist. So if you look at the note very carefully, you will notice that the number written corresponding to the atomic number of the periodic table of the element. The atomic number of iron is 26, lithium is 3, Serenium uh, is 58, Neon is uh, 28, Cobalt is 27, Lithium and 57, and S is about the, uh, Sulfur is about the 16. So what they have, how they have decoded the crime? They have decoded the crime like F is about the iron, Fe, which indicated the iron, Li indicated the lithium, C indicated the serenium, cerium, uh, which and Phil is again the eta and Ni decoded the nickel, cobalt decode, uh, CO decode, CO as a cobalt and L as a lithium and S as a sulfur. So they have, when they have uh, summarized the, uh, all the things they have found, the person was Phyllis and uh, Nicholas. Next, please. Okay, these are the references of cited cases, which I have quoted here and which I have described here about the, which was solved by using the application of uh, forensic chemistry and application of certain forensic, uh, application of forensic toxicology. And you know very well about how the chemical can and how the chemical substances can be analyzed by applying the various kind of instrumentation techniques. So uh, I'm closing my presentation, which is, uh, I think, too short. Uh, I'm trying to compile my presentation in a short period of time. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for delivering and uh, discussing the 10 cases, which decoding the mysteries by using the forensic science with the help of chemistry, where the chemistry involved and the chemical examination involved. Uh, and uh, uh, Yes, so I think there is one question. Yeah, please. Sir. Can you please explain what are the main symptoms that can say that this is a murder by poisoning? Uh, in which cases? 
uh, in in any of the case in general like uh, okay 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 in general if uh, uh, when the poison is been consumed by that uh, person the certain kind of symptom uh, comes into their faces like uh, here i have discussed about the uh, uh, methanol poisoning here i have discussed about the potassium cyanide poisoning the methanol uh, poisoning uh, having the symptom like the person become unable to view or uh, their vision become the blurred so he might be blind after ha having the uh, methanol kind of poisoning. When we talk about the any kind of metallic poisoning, the metallic poisoning uh, appear into their faces, the faces color become turned and uh, the, the, their biological substances, the biological fluid also become turns into their color. So after visualizing the uh, faces of the deceased one and after visualizing, after examining the body fluids or the, any kind of tissue or fluid sample, we can analyze the uh, what was the poison there. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for answering the questions. So with your permission, moving further on behalf of the Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science, I would like to present you this e-mementos for your wonderful talk. Thank you so much, sir. And also this e-certificate can be accepted for imparting your valuable insight and inspiration knowledge on decoding mysteries of forensic biochemistry. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation and delivering this talk in Forensic Summer Finishing School. With your permission, we are moving further with our next speaker. And our next speaker, we have uh, Om Dube, sir, uh, from Devbhumi Uttarakhand University. And Sir is going to talk on the topic classical and component techniques in forensic biology. I request my co-host Arti to kindly introduce our esteemed speaker, Om Dube, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, you're audible. Okay. Uh, so I take this privilege to introduce uh, Om Dube, sir, to our audience, who is currently working in the Department of Forensic Science at the Bhumi Uttarakhand University. He holds an MSc in Forensic Science from Sam Higginbottom University of Agriculture, Technology and Sciences and BSc Honours in Forensic Science from Amity University. He has a diverse work experience in the field of Forensic Science and has worked with the Indian uh, Forensic Association in New Delhi, where he gained valuable experience in examination of fingerprints and question documents. He has also worked at the Forensic Science Lab in Pondicherry, specializing in biological and serological examination of crime scene exhibits and also served as a faculty member at the Godavari Institute of Engineering and Technology. He has contributed to the field of forensic science through his research publications and has published papers in reputed journals and also authored chapters in a book on elementary forensic science. In addition to this, uh, he has, uh, um, along with his academic and research achievements, he has actively participated in seminars, conferences, and workshops related to the forensic science. Thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation, and uh, we hand over the session to you now. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, Om Dube, sir. Uh, yes. Okay. So thank you, Ranjit Singh, sir, uh, for inviting me into this platform. Uh, actually, I have an immense uh, pleasure. Like uh, for next uh, few minutes, I'll be discussing about uh, uh, my work experience also and some of the cases uh, which I have dealt in uh, forensic science lab and what I have gained as a, uh, knowledge while teaching my students. Uh, so for today's uh, presentation, uh, um, because my core competence is into biological uh, forensic biology, so I'll be dealing with some of the cases uh, which I have done into forensic science laboratory Pondicherry, and uh, there are some basic techniques uh, which uh, we are still practicing because of its uh, uh, reliable uh, results we are getting from those techniques and. Uh, in the modern contemporary world, uh, still like we have some uh, advanced instruments, uh, but, um, basically in uh, biology sections, we definitely have uh, uh, 
um, DNA fingerprinting unit for like uh, every biological sample and the best uh, technique is uh, DNA fingerprinting, but it's still in many of the forensic science laboratory and many of the institutes, we still practice the basic uh, chemical test, basic uh, color tests, uh, which gives a very beautiful uh, results. So I'll be discussing about those uh, experiments. So let us continue with my presentations. I will ask uh, uh, sir to kindly share the presentation. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, so can we move, like, uh, as already told, uh, I'm working as an assistant professor in the Ubumi Uttarakhand University uh, from more than one and a half years. Um, before that, I was working with the uh, Godavari Institute of Technology in Rajmantri. Before that, uh, prior to that, I was working with FSL Pondicherry for five years. Prior to that, I was in Delhi for three years. So uh, into forensic science domain, I have been uh, for more than 12 years, 12 to 13 years. Uh, so in coming uh, some of the slides, uh, what we will be observing is uh, the organizational structure of the forensic science laboratory. Uh, this particular structure will not be limited to your uh, nearby forensic science lab because every forensic science laboratory setup uh, may be like uh, different or uh, will be focused very much similar to what I'll be showing you in the next slides. So about the definitions of the forensic biology and uh, what type of biological evidences we are getting on the crime scenes. And then what is the standard operating procedure for the evidence collections? And because the biological evidences can be found in two different uh, uh, kind of forms. So uh, what are the basic methods which we should adopt while collecting the biological evidences? And then how to maintain the chain of custody and what is, this, what is the importance of the chain of custody. Uh, next to that, uh, there are some uh, techniques, basic techniques, which we follow into the forensic lab for identifying the origin and uh, to identify what is exactly is the biological stain found on the crime scene. Then uh, we'll be also discussing about uh, how the reports are being made into forensic science laboratory and all those things <clears throat> and how the remaining exhibits are being sent back to the court. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so basically, this is the uh, basic uh, structure of the forensic uh, lab. So uh, where I was being practicing in Pondicherry, in that particular lab, we had uh, a separate divisions uh, for biology, which included uh, biology as a separate division, uh, serology as a separate division, and DNA as a separate divisions. Um, but uh, as I already told, like uh, this biology divisions is not necessary that uh, it will be subdivided into three different uh, divisions. But there may be some labs which might only have two uh, two labs that is biology and serology club together and uh, DNA as a separate unit. Or uh, there may be a lab which might be having just one lab and they will be performing all the experiments into that same lab. And so it is uh, like the structure depends and varies from the state to state and from uh, different places. Uh, then comes your chemistry department, uh, that is your chemistry division. In this chemistry divisions, there are uh, different uh, subdivisions which are being separated into uh, chemistry, and then there is a narcotics and NDPS section. Then there is also an exercise department. Uh, the exercise department, uh, uh, which deals with the analysis of the alcohol and all those things. So it can be clubbed together with chemistry or it uh, may be a different uh, depending on to your nearest uh, forensic science lab. Apart from biology and chemistry department, we also have question documents, which deals with the false documents and currency notes and all those things. Uh, coming to the uh, question document sections, like uh, you might already have heard about the government examiner of question documents. So GQD is totally different. It is an uh, entity of the central government. Uh, and coming to the state government, uh, a question document is a totally different uh, unit. And uh, still, we have different uh, sections like uh, coins, 
and currency examination unit uh, ccew so this is one different kind of uh, uh, section which is being uh, made under under some some of the forensic science labs so next uh, to that is the cyber for uh, please go back please go back yeah thank you uh, then there is uh, cyber forensic lab then there is uh, also uh, physics divisions physics division completely uh, bifurcates into um, ballistics divisions and the physics divisions uh, next please next slide thank you uh, forensic biology as uh, we can like uh, define is that um, whatever the biological uh, experiments or whatever the biological uh, principles and uh, uh, laws which we have studied into uh, biology. If we are taking help of those particular things, biological principles and biological uh, facts and clubbing together with the law, so that will be a forensic biology. So basically the outcome is like uh, whatever um, biological facts and principles which help to get the justice in the court. So we can say that those particular things come into forensic biology sections. So this is what is the definition of the forensic biology. Uh, next slide, please. Then talking about uh, the different types of uh, evidences that we see uh, into different uh, sections coming to the biology sections, the different type of evidences that we deal with the uh, biology sections are uh, basically hair, blood is there, then the skin is there, sweat, teeth, skull, fiber is there, semen saliva is there, urine milk is there, bone is there, skeletal remains are there. Uh, some of the divisions have a different uh, unit for a skull, uh, skeletal analysis and uh, skull superimposition technique that is also a totally different technique which at times is into a biology sections or it is into physics division there are some of the fcls so uh, totally uh, depends on what type of fcl you are having into your nearby place uh, apart from that we have uh, human and animal origins to identify uh, the datums woods leaves flowers, uh, maggots and flies. So uh, talking about the these maggots and flies, uh, there are some of the vessels which are moving towards making a totally different uh, uh, sections which will deal with the maggots, flies and all other kind of insects and how decomposition uh, uh, and uh, degradation of uh, human body will take place. Uh, basically to estimate the uh, time of death. So there are officials which are making an effort uh, to build a totally different uh, uh, division for this. Then there comes uh, DNA divisions which uh, deals with the cases like uh, uh, disputed paternity or disputed maternity or uh, when there is a uh, like uh, a neonatal killing is there and then uh, identification of the DNA from some of the very minute and very fine samples where there is a very limited piece of, uh, where is, there is a very limited uh, evidence on the crime scene. Uh, Maybe like uh, blood, semen, saliva or any tissue, nail or hair is there. So when the uh, limitation is there, when there is uh, a very minute sample, then this technique is very relevant, very helpful to identify the perpetrator. Uh, next slide, please. Then there is a division under, uh, under physics division that is ballistics. Uh, so in this division, basically what we are analyzing is uh, the pellets and the empty shells from the crime scenes. Then the, uh, there may be a a uh, firearm which might be like a uh, country made or it can be a uh, factory made. So whether it is a kind of a standard uh, gun or uh, what we say they see cut or such kind of uh, improvised uh, devices. So those things are analyzed and uh, evaluated into ballistics divisions. Then there may be like a trace of uh, gunshot residues uh, lying or depositing on the 
hands and bodies of the perpetrator or the uh, clothing of the uh, person or the victim. So in that case also, the identification of the uh, these. <clears throat> so these things we can completely identify into ballistics divisions. Then there comes a physics division. Then physics division is basically dealing with the uh, shoe impressions or uh, attire impressions and comparison and the analysis of those kind of imprints. And apart from those things, there are uh, cases where there is a er erosion of uh, or improvised uh, numbers are made or imprinted on the uh, machines. So uh, whether it is uh, some costly instruments or whether it is vehicle or some other instruments which are having some unique uh, number for their identification, in that case to restore the original numbers what the instruments are having, uh, those kind of cases also, they are dealt into uh, physics divisions. Then apart from that, there are uh, some cases which are um, like, uh, <coughs> where there is a um, demand of uh, analyzing and comparison of the uh, tool, um, what kind of tool may be used uh, in some theft cases or some burglary cases. So it, uh, at times it becomes necessary to identify whether the tool, uh, whether the tool hammer was used or whether the plier was used. Uh, so such kind of questions are being answered into physics directions. <coughs> uh, next slide, please. Then comes the uh, chemistry divisions, which deals with the, many of the cases. Uh, some of the cases are mentioned here, like uh, there is an acid attack. So what kind of acids are being used? So that kind of analysis is there, then whether the petrol or diesel has been adulterated and what amount of adulteration has been made into that sample, that is also done. <laughs> talking about the explosive residue, like uh, uh, physics division, it is dealing with whether the uh, GSR is present into the item or not. So that is one thing. Then uh, identifying and then analysis. Then the analysis is being transferred into the chemistry division. So there also uh, we have the, um, we have the facility to um, identify. Uh, exactly what uh, the residue contains. So the chemical composition and uh, the quality and the quantity both are analyzed into the chemistry division. Then uh, there are some drugs and there are some medicines which are <coughs> at times abused. So those kind of uh, medicines, those kind of drugs, uh, the cases come to, uh, comes to the uh, chemistry divisions. Then we have uh, toxicology divisions. Uh, so in toxicology divisions, there are some, there are cases uh, which we are being analyzed uh, for cases like uh, suicide, suicidal poisoning is there, or some uh, forceful uh, abuse substances have been used. So in that case, uh, the viscera or the suspected medicine or the suspected uh, poison or the suspected um, toxicological element that comes to the forensic science lab and it is being utilized, uh, it is being analyzed in the toxicology division. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, then there is a question document, as I already told, like uh, uh, GQD is totally different and uh, question document in forensic science lab is a different uh, the unit, but uh, the analysis method is almost same for um, both the units. So in this uh, question document, uh, the identification of the documents, currency notes, uh, rubber stamps or seals or such kind of things are being analyzed. <clears throat> but as already told, like uh, 
there are some of the FSLs which have made a completely different unit for the identification of uh, uh, forged uh, coins and uh, fake Indian currency examinations. Uh, for that, uh, some of the FSLs have made a totally different unit. Then comes the fingerprint uh, bureau. This fingerprint bureau is uh, a totally like uh, independent uh, organization which is working directly under the police department. Uh, it does not come under the forensic science lab, but uh, although it is somewhat related to, um, it is completely related to forensic science. So the kind of um, uh, examinations, what we see here is you know, from the crime scenes, uh, different type of uh, uh, like latent impressions are there, visible impressions are there. So these kind of impressions, we try to uh, collect them and uh, make them record into the FS system. And under this uh, fingerprint bureau, we have automated fingerprint identification system. So mm, that particular system is totally computerized. And uh, uh, with the help of the FS, we are able to identify and match whether the fingerprints are coming from the uh, data bank source or not. Uh, next slide. So for the evidence collection, uh, when it is related to foreign, uh, when it is related to biological samples, uh, there is one very important thing to make into consideration. Like uh, <clears throat> if the uh, samples are wet or if it is moist, uh, so. A precaution should be taken that uh, it should be dried under the normal light because uh, uh, what will happen is if you pack those uh, moist or wet items because at times these ha uh, these things happen uh, I, and the investigation of any crime scene uh, starts from the crime scene itself uh, any justice starts from the crime scene itself so um, uh, it is very important to uh, observe the crime and process the crime, identify the evidence, uh, pack them properly and send to the court through proper channel. That is very important um, because once we uh, make a very good foundation for our case, and then only the outcome of the case will be productive. <clears throat> so, uh, types of biological uh, evidences. What we uh, generally encounter is the blood, semen, saliva, urine, etc. <clears throat> so processing those crime scene is more of an art than more uh, mere procedure because uh, uh, many of the crime scene units, they are uh, uh, the staff is the manpower is police person. The police personnel, first of all, uh, they are not uh, well educated. They don't take the work very um, seriously. So uh, what happens is uh, if you are uh, like totally uh, into the mood that you have to just uh, fulfill your duty and just uh, for namesake you are doing the job, then at times the error may occur. It is very important that uh, in coming days, the forensic science, uh, the crime scene, uh, in charge should be a person who is well trained enough, well acquainted with the forensic science concept. Then only uh, the evidence analysis, evidence packaging, those things will take place. <coughs> so major precaution uh, for biological strain <clears throat> is that uh, the contamination should not take place. So a proper protective gear should be worn and all the biological samples should be uh, properly dried, not into the uh, not into the oven and not in the direct sunlight. All the samples should be like uh, properly uh, air dried under the shade, and then once the articles are dried, it should be packed into a paper bag, not into the polythene. <clears throat> it should be into a paper bag so that the medium being carried is like uh, uh, the container will be porous so it will be helpful for the evidence of other analysis <clears throat> uh, 
next slide, please. Then there is a thing called chain of custody, which is very much important. Uh, why it is important that uh, <clears throat> once we go to the crime scene, then uh, once the forensic scientist or the scientific officers are called to the crime scene for their uh, for giving their opinion and for uh, doing the scientific investigation. So uh, when we reach to the crime scene, then on the crime scene, <clears throat> there is always uh, a rush, like if it is uh, open area because uh, there will be a people, there are onlookers also, there are relatives also, there are, if the area is uh, a roadside, the people in traffic will be moving here and there. So uh, if that is the situation, then we have very uh, less time to uh, do our observation. So, but uh, in that very limited span of time, uh, we must take very much care that uh, the analysis, the observation is properly done without any error, without any mistakes. <clears throat> so uh, the chain of custody, uh, what it helps is like when we process the crime scene and once we collect the uh, crime scene, <clears throat> once we collect the evidences from the crime scene, uh, in that case, we have to pack all the evidences. So all those evidences, uh, should be properly packed and handed over to the investigating officer. So uh, while we are handling over the evidences to the investigating officer, uh, we must make sure that uh, we are getting an acknowledgement of what we have submitted to the investigating officer. Uh, it is like, uh, suppose uh, we have collected 10 uh, evidences from the crime scene then those uh, 10 evidences, what it is, the details, all the, de uh, all the details of the 10 evidences should be properly mentioned into the letter. And we should get the, acknowledge, uh, get the acknowledgement from the IO because there is a chance that uh, we are submitting uh, 10 articles to the IO and further, there will be uh, either eight or nine evidences which are uh, being released in the court. So uh, if we have an acknowledgement of those many articles, then there will be a chance that uh, then there can be uh, cross-questioning from us that uh, uh, once we have submitted 10 articles, then why those, some of the articles are missing into the court. So uh, those chain of custody starts from the crime scene itself, then uh, the track keeps uh, from the crime scene to the uh, police station, from the police station to the court, then court to the forensic science lab, then for uh, again going back from the forensic lab to the um, court. <clears throat> so everything is mentioned in the chain of custody, it is a kind of form which is being like uh, updated. Now those, uh, now these things are being very much uh, being implemented through CCTNS. So this uh, CCTNS is also a very nice software, uh, a very nice platform, which uh, gives the opportunity for uh, tracking down the uh, progress of your case. So in that case, uh, in those, in that CCTNS, you can, uh, get your details about the case, uh, like what is the progress into the uh, case, whether the article, whether the evidence has been sent to the court or not, whether the article has been sent to the forensic science lab analysis has been, uh, has been done or not. So these things can be tracked down into the CCTN system. <coughs> uh, next slide, please. So in the forensic biology divisions, there are some uh, evidences which are being tested into the classical uh, from very uh, beginning and those uh, tests gives a very nice uh, results. So we'll be talking about those um, uh, tests in uh, the coming slides, like for blood, uh, 
what we are doing, like uh, there is a primary examination and then the confirmatory examinations. For uh, primary, basically, uh, some of the FSLs they are using uh, benzidine test, but uh, uh, although it is carcinogenic and uh, it has been discarded. So in that case, uh, the alternate is the Castlemere test. So uh, we use Castlemere or benzidine test. For making the confirmatory test, we use uh, the crystal techniques that are uh, Peachman and Takayama or uh, through spectroscopy also, uh, spectrophotometry also, we are uh, doing the confirmatory test for blood. Then for uh, species origin, we are doing some radial diffusion or electrophoresis are being <clears throat> carried forward to identify whether it is a human uh, sample or it is a uh, like some other animal origin sample. Coming to the grouping, groupings are being, um, that is blood grouping. So blood grouping is being um, performed through different uh, techniques. So whether it is absorption elution and uh, whether it is absorption inhibitions. So depending upon um, like what kind of uh, uh, clumpings or agglutinations we are getting, so that kind of uh, technique we can adopt, whether it is absorption elution or absorption inhibition. And then for the identification of semen samples, semen samples are like uh, screenly tested for uh, through acid phosphatase test uh, and for confirmatory, uh, we rely only on the microscopic examination or through the gram staining technique. <clears throat> Coming to the saliva, uh, saliva samples, the primary examinations, what we do is a starch iodine test and there, there is a kit or the buffer solution uh, which is supplied by the abacus diagnostic. Uh, for that, there is a color, uh, color change test. So uh, that is a Salige E. This technique we'll be seeing in the coming slides. Uh, for the urea, uh, for the urine analysis test, there is a crystal test, a urea nitrate test also is there, then the creatinine uh, test is also there, which is a color test technique. <coughs> These techniques will be coming, uh, seeing in the further uh, slides. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> then there is a test which resembles uh, just like the blood. So, uh, like uh, some of the evidences may appear brown in color or red in color, but uh, there is a chance that it is not necessary that it is only blood. So, uh, apart from like uh, other than blood, there are some other uh, stains which resemble just like the blood, but uh, they are not actual the blood stains. So, there can be on the crime scene there. It can be a pan stain, or there can be a fruit juice, or there can be a vegetable stain. So those things, uh, although they just resemble like uh, blood, but still they are not the actual biological sample, uh, blood samples. <clears throat> so for uh, for the analysis or to rule out whether the sample is actual blood or not, so for that we can go for the microscopic examination or we can go for some uh, color change test. <coughs> uh, next slide, please. So uh, apart from the um, blood test, in the blood test itself, uh, there can be uh, like uh, venous blood also and there can be a menstrual blood also. So to identify what kind of source it is, we need to uh, go for the further analysis accordingly, whether it is a venous blood or whether it is a menstrual blood. So uh, while you are examining the menstrual blood, uh, we can see that there are some cells uh, which will be like seen into the uh, seen under the microscope. So those uh, cells uh, are coming from the endometrial region or the epithelial region of the vagina. <clears throat> Then there are some microscopic uh, microorganisms. So microscopic examination of those uh, microorganisms uh, may be observed for uh, trichomonas vaginalis is there. Then uh, there are some other uh, enzymes which can be detected under the menstrual blood 
that is your fibrinolysins are there, then LDH4 and LDH5 is there. So we can, uh, if there is a question for what kind of blood it is, whether it is menstrual or whether it is a venous blood. So in that case, so <clears throat> we can go for these kind of tests for identification of uh, epithelial cells, uh, then microscopic examinations, and then enzymes uh, in, in, um, examination. That all we can do. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, then here we can see that there is a picture uh, which shows the result for the Kasselmeyer test and also the benzidine test. <coughs> Sorry. So uh, Kasselmeyer test, as we can see that there is, uh, uh, when there is a, a very important note that uh, in forensic science uh, or any other kind of uh, examinations or tests that you are performing for comparison or analysis, uh, two samples must be definitely taken into account. That is the um, blank sample and the control sample. That means blank sample is, uh, suppose if the sample is not present and you are performing the test, then what kind of result you will be getting in there? So that is the role of the, uh, uh, that is the reason why we are taking a blank control sample to rule out whether your uh, solutions or whether your chemicals are exactly working or not. And uh, the control samples also helps us to identify and to <clears throat> get the result of our desired uh, outcome. Like suppose uh, if it is <clears throat> Castle test and uh, for blood and we are expecting that uh, uh, the result should be pink in color. So uh, first, firstly, we should uh, do the control test with the blood to identify and to know whether the samples, uh, whether the solutions are working properly or not. So in this uh, Kasselmeyer, what we see is uh, <clears throat> the stains or the fibers which are suspected to have the blood. So in that case, what we do is uh, uh, the Kasselmeyer reagent is poured and after that, uh, a drop of uh, like uh, hydrogen peroxide is added. So um, at once we will see there is a color change taking place. So in Castlemere test, uh, there is a pink color observed. Whereas in comparison to the benzidine test, the method, uh, uh, the SOP is the same. That is, um, the solution will be changed. For benzidine test, uh, the benzidine uh, powder is added with the glacial acetic acid and then it is uh, heated and stored. So uh, once we are ready with the stock solution of the benzidine test and uh, while you are performing the test, so what you do is you add one drop of your uh, benzidine solution and uh, later on you can add just one drop of hydrogen peroxide and immediately we'll be seeing that there is a color change taking place and that the color will be like bluish green. <clears throat> so these are the tests, uh, some of the primary tests for blood. So this is not the confirmatory test because uh, apart from blood, there are some other evidences or some other articles which can give the uh, result for these things. So uh, although, any article which shows uh, a peroxidase activity is having the intention to give such uh, kind of results. So whether uh, in order to rule out uh, such kind of confusions, we are having the confirmatory test, which we will be seeing later. Uh, please go ahead. Next slide. Uh, so for <clears throat> identifying the blood as a confirmatory, Evidence, uh, we are taking into account a uh, Teachman test and Takayama test. So both the techniques are crystal techniques <clears throat> to, uh, uh, so in, with, in this technique, what we do is uh, we take a sample and on the glass slide, on the microscopic slide and cover it with the cover slip. And uh, just beside the cover slip, uh, one or two drops of the reagent is, uh, put on the slide so that the uh, drop will seep under the microscope 
uh, see under the microscopic slide, uh, the cover slip. And uh, once we heat that uh, microscopic slide, <clears throat> uh, that is uh, the heating should not be into a continuous mode. It should be like uh, in the interim mode, like uh, you heat it, uh, uh, warm it, then let it cool, then again warm it and let it cool. <clears throat> so uh, just after one or two uh, heating, transfer the slide to the microscopic uh, stage and uh, observe your, uh, observe, make your observation through the microscope. So suppose if you have chosen a Teachman reagent for that, for the microscopic examination, if you have chosen the Teachman um, uh, reagent, in that case, so what we'll see is there is a brown rhombic kind of crystals which are formed. Whereas uh, <clears throat> doing this uh, through the same SOP uh, and uh, taking the Takayama reagents, if we have uh, taken the Takayama reagent, in that case, uh, under the microscope, we'll be seeing a lot many uh, pink color crystals are there, which will be like a feather kind of uh, appearance will be there in the under the microscope. <clears throat> so these two tests are for the confirmatory test, uh, which we take into account uh, into the forensic labs. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And there is an alternate technique if the if the resources are not permitting you so there is also a technique uh, which is also a confirmatory test uh, that is your spectroscopic examination so in this what we do is uh, <clears throat> the suspected uh, stain or the unsuspected uh, article is kept into the test tube and in the test tube <clears throat> we add 5% uh, of sodium hydroxide solution and into that solution, we add one pinch of the dextrose solution. And in that same thing, we just uh, leave it for some time. And uh, after like half an hour, we come back and uh, take the help of this uh, spectroscope and make a observation of the sample into the tilted stage. Like if you are holding your test tube for 90 degrees, just tilt it for some like uh, 45 degrees and then observe the stain. If there is a, a two black band being observed under the region of your 527 or 589 region, then we can see that uh, the stain present is definitely for the blood. So this is one very classical technique <clears throat> and a very effective technique. Uh, next slide, please. Then there is, uh, like, suppose your sample has been tested for the uh, presence of uh, blood. Then in that case, what is your next step? Then the next step is to identify whether the sample has been, like, uh, uh, coming from animal origin or that is from the uh, human origin. In that case, what we do is we um, follow the gel electrophoresis or we go for um, double diffusion technique. So in this, what we do is uh, we take uh, agrocial solution and put it into the you know, this um, dish, uh, let it cool down, punch holes into that. In the center, you put your sample uh, to be tested. Around the samples in all other wells, you put the, uh, put the antiseras and uh, uh, leave this setup uh, on the saline bed for overnight. The next day when we come and see the results, so there will be a white band uh, in the margin, in the center for which the sample is suspected to have the origin. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. Then there is a, a blood grouping technique that is absorption elution. This technique helps us to identify what kind of uh, blood group that is uh, the sample, whether it is uh, A, B, A, B, or uh, it is a negative like uh, zero blood group, O blood group. 
So <clears throat> in order to identify whether the suspected stain is of what kind of group it is, so we go for absorption elution technique. So this absorption elution technique, uh, in this what we do is uh, there is a cellulose estate sheet. So on those cellulose estate sheet, what we do is we mark the um, different columns for uh, A, B, O. So in those columns, we take the uh, exhibits of one centimeter and uh, we fix them on those uh, estate sheets. And uh, while after fixing the estate sheets, what we do is uh, we add the antiseras. So uh, adding the antiseras and fixing it, uh, we leave it for overnight. Next day when we are coming, uh, we are expecting that all the antiseras might have been added into the fiber. And then what we do is we do a washing. Washing is with the ice cold water and uh, saline water. So in this, what we do is uh, put the estate sheets into the tubs and wash it properly. Uh, after some like two or three repeated washing, uh, we will expect that the unbound antiseras have been discarded, washed out. And after that, what we do is we keep the samples into the incubator uh, for 56 degrees centigrade for normally uh, 20 minutes. After that, uh, uh, you take it out and add uh, about 0.5% uh, of your indicator cells. Indicator cells are the known blood groups. Suppose uh, like in the column A, B, and O, uh, three columns you have made. So in those three columns, uh, respective indicator cells should be added. In column A, a blood group of known like a blood A group only, it should be added in the column B only a blood group from B should be added. So <clears throat> that is the rule of your indicator cells. <clears throat> so uh, once you have added the indicator cell into that, uh, keep the whole setup of your uh, estate sheet into the fridge into like four degree, uh, around four degrees centigrade for another say, um, one and a half, uh, one and a half hour. And uh, later on, uh, when, when we take it out and uh, observe the uh, this, uh, sheets under the microscope, we will see um, there will be a clumping. There will be an agglutination. So <clears throat> whether that, uh, you know, where the agglutination has taken place, the, that will be the corresponding your uh, uh, the split group. So if there is agglutination in A and uh, B, so the blood group will be A and B. Uh, next slide, please. So then there is a technique for uh, your uh, <clears throat> semen identification that is a primary test. Uh, this is your acid phosphatase test. Uh, in this, there, there are two stock solutions. Uh, in the first stock solution, the, uh, it is added directly onto the suspected uh, specimen. And uh, after adding the suspected uh, uh, after adding the stock solution on the suspected stain for like uh, 30 seconds, we will immediately add the second solution. <clears throat> so uh, when you are adding the second stock solution, uh, make sure that uh, the observation that you are getting, it should be at once. It should not be a delayed observation. So the color change should be at once. So because after uh, some time, uh, almost all those uh, stains may turn into the purple color. So if you are expecting a positive uh, positive uh, outcome or positive result, uh, the color change should be totally immediately. <clears throat> so uh, the principle is given in this slide. <clears throat> uh, next slide. So this test was actually a primary test. Uh, there will be a confirmatory test that is your microscopic examination. And this microscopic examination uh, may be into two uh, forms, whether it is a direct uh, observation of the spermatozoa under the microscope, or we can go for the gram staining. So gram staining 
uh, will help you to identify the spermatozoa into the broken stage or the um, uh, complete uh, one uh, complete even one my uh, spermatozoa if you are observed that uh, shows a totally uh, positive uh, result for that uh, next slide then there is a test for this uh, saliva. So in saliva identification, it is very um, difficult to identify because uh, it is not having any color. The only the suspected area we can go for analysis. <clears throat> so one test is like your uh, starch iodine solution. That is the color change that you have observed. Um, that is um, the blue color becomes colorless. So um, presence on the uh, like it starts uh, hydrolysis activity you can observe that the saliva is present in, the, in that particular specimen but uh, there is also a technique uh, available uh, which has been supplied by abacus diagnostic uh, this is a company from uh, us uh, which gives a ready-made uh, buffer solutions in this um, buffer solutions, what we do is uh, we directly put our suspected specimen into the <clears throat> um, buff in this container. And uh, if the color changes is taking place, that is if, the, if there is a saliva present into that particular um, specimen, then the color will change from uh, water that is colorless to uh, yellow in color. And if there is no specimen, uh, if there is no saliva stain, then the color, uh, the um, buffer solution remains unchanged. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. Then there are tests uh, for uh, urine examination. So uh, what we have been practicing is the microscopic examination and the color test. For the creatinine test, uh, uh, we can see that there is a color change. So in this, what we do is a uh, suspected stain is taken on the filter paper and one drop of picric acid is added followed by 5% of NOH. So immediately we will see that there is a color change taking place. So uh, the color change is like uh, orange in color. <clears throat> this is one thing. Then there is uh, also a, a microscopic test, uh, a crystal formation test. So in this, what we do is, uh, uh, the sample is taken on the microscopic slide and uh, covered with the cover slip and the uh, uh, solution is flowed under the cover slip and uh, <clears throat> under the microscope what we can observe is there is a crystal formation uh, crystals which are made like uh, in hexagon shape or a splinter shape uh, kind of uh, crystals will be observed for the urine test. Uh, next slide please. Then comes the important part of your uh, this, uh, all the tests that we have done, all the observations, what we have done is how the reports should be made into uh, the forensic science lab. So uh, as a uh, general understanding that uh, the report we are submitting from the forensic lab is for the uh, court. So uh, the court might not have the technical knowledge that uh, the scientific officer or the uh, official are possessing. So in order to uh, make them understand, to uh, keep the reports very concise and very clear, minimum uh, number of like uh, technical terms should be used. Avoid using very long and very technical terms and uh, make the reports very precise. It should be uh, very specific, like for uh, what uh, evidence number you are doing, what kind of test we have done, and what is the observ observation, or what is the result we have got. <clears throat> no need to describe like uh, what is the, <clears throat> please go back. Then once we have completed this uh, report writing, then we go for like a uh, return of the exhibits. So all the exhibits which are unconsumed, make sure that we are not going to process them or we are not going to retain them. Uh, we need to send the unconsumed articles or the tested articles back to the court. 
the court is the ultimate authority which has given the um, permission or direction for us to do the analysis on the evidences. So we are uh, sending them and uh, sending the course back whatever we have done the analysis and whatever we have uh, like in position which is not consumed. <clears throat> Next uh, slide please. And there are some of the uh, pictures uh, I would like to share with you like uh, while we were um, doing some uh, crime scene investigation in Pondicherry that time what happened is uh, the car you can see is uh, Toyota Innova. This Innova uh, was being like used by one of the local leaders there. And uh, the local leader, um, he called our police station and uh, he complained that some of the miscreant uh, used uh, some petrol or diesel uh, to set fire the vehicle. Uh, but during our like crime scene observation, uh, crime scene analysis, we observed that uh, uh, additional um, petrol or diesel might not have been used. Uh, why? Because um, as we can see inside the <clears throat> car, the inside cabin was totally black in color. And that too, uh, there is a compartment um, uh, differentiation, there is a compartment separation uh, just next to the driver sitting, uh, just uh, the dashboard. In the dashboard, we have some air vents, uh, the ACs are there, then there is a <clears throat> hole for the wiring to transfer from the engine to the comp uh, passenger compartment. So what we had observed is uh, there is a molted uh, plastic material there is a melted wire which is coming like uh, making a direction from this uh, engine compartment to the passenger compartment so later on uh, <clears throat> uh, during the investigation it was observed that uh, um, although the driver of that person local leader had complained that there is uh, there was uh, some uh, problem with the engine compartment uh, uh, wiring it was not properly starting, uh, the vehicle was not starting properly. So still uh, they had not done regular service of the vehicle. So um, before uh, making this vehicle uh, stand in the park, they had used it for 2000 kilometers. So uh, 2000 kilometers, uh, almost a kind of non-stop uh, driving they have done. So uh, the vehicle had already been very hot. So we observed that uh, there is a place which might have uh, like uh, because of short circuit, uh, the fire might have taken place into the engine compartment. The fire increased and resulted in like melting of the plastic wires and plastic materials. And uh, in order to gain the oxygen, it uh, entered the passenger compartment and later um, this whole setup got on fire. So uh, the complaint by the uh, local leader, it was like uh, rejected. <clears throat> uh, next slide. Then there is one more case. Uh, it was an exhumation case. The person went missing for uh, three to four days and uh, it was observed that uh, when we got the call, Mm, uh, so we had the uh, primary uh, investigation module as a lost case, um, but uh, later on it was it came to a knowledge that uh, uh, the actual case is of murder. So what we gave a big breakthrough that uh, the victim was a business person and uh, uh, he had come to his uh, pro uh, project site uh, last night and. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, while he came to his uh, projected site, uh, uh, in his uh, two-wheeler, uh, the industrial area uh, mud was like uh, stuck to that uh, vehicle. And later on, what happened is the murderer who killed this uh, person has parked his vehicle near to the sea. So uh, from that particular uh, soil, 
trace, we uh, tried to identify its last location. Later on, when we went to the site, we also observed that uh, there is uh, small blood specks which have been uh, around the suspected crime scene. Uh, so there are some other observations which led to the identification, like uh, uh, they had used, uh, the perpetrator had used uh, white washing, fresh white washing uh, he has done because while stabbing this uh, victim, all the blood spurt got uh, like uh, stuck on the uh, walls. So um, uh, identification of the blood specks from the nearby surrounding white washing, then burning of uh, plastic cover materials, all these things um, were used as an evidence later on uh, like uh, uh, taking the culprit into hand. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. And there was one more case, like a uh, uh, lady, uh, she was working into MNC and uh, she was earning very good money. Uh, so a person, uh, local goon, what he did is uh, he was doing a Reiki from last uh, few days and he observed that uh, this lady is not present uh, in the house during like uh, weekdays. So, uh, so what he did is he brought, um, broke open the main gate and entered into the house. But uh, coincidentally, what happened is that particular day, that lady um, was availing off and uh, she was present in her house. So uh, that person, what he did is he attacked the lady uh, when the lady resisted uh, the robbery and uh, he, uh, he stabbed uh, her uh, many times on the throat, uh, on the chest and into the stomach area, which resulted in heavy bleeding and ultimately the death. And so on the crime scene, what we observed is there was a lot many, like uh, the bloody uh, soul prints were also there. And this footwear impressions were also there. And there were fingerprint marks on the Elmira's where the robbery was committed. So all those uh, things uh, helped us to uh, identify or uh, narrow down the suspected person. And ultimately with the help of the fingerprint, we were um, able to apprehend the uh, accused person. Next slide, please. Uh, so these are the references which has helped me to make this PPT presentations. <clears throat> so these are all from my side. Uh, I can see some of the questions being raised. So I'll just take up those questions. The question is, how can we make out the age of a completely destroyed unidentified body? Uh, unidentified bodies, if it is completely destroyed. Um, so uh, you technical term, if you are coming to uh, completely destroyed, completely destroyed means what do you want to say? If there is even a 1% of your evidence, 1% uh, of your DNA present into like uh, uh, this uh, skeleton system, we can easily uh, like uh, identify the uh, whole setup. But if you if there is no uh, trace of even um, DNA also, then in that case, it will be a different, uh, it will be a difficult thing. Thank you, sir. And I think uh, we have taken all the questions. Uh, there is a one question again, uh, that uh, what category of evidence will we classify the fact like molten wire from your first case? I classify the facts like molten wire from your uh, first case. Uh, what does that question mean? I don't I understand. You know, like category, what kind of category? It is a physical evidence and uh, being classified into like electrical wiring, we can say. That is a physical evidence into physical uh, physics division. So basically what happens is on the crime scene, we are not segregating any evidence that uh, this particular evidence will uh, is of uh, this particular uh, division nature. But when we are visiting the crime scene, uh, it is our duty to handle all kind of evidences. 
So the observation is made into such manner. Thank you, sir. So I think we have taken all the question and thank you, sir, for delivering such a elaborate talk on the topic classical and component techniques in the forensic biology. On behalf of Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science, I would like to present this e mementos for your wonderful talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And also I will request to <clears throat> accept this e certificate for imparting your valuable insight and inspiration on the knowledge topic uh, classical and component uh, techniques in the forensic biology and thank you so much sir for sparing your time on this uh, apart from your teaching schedule my pleasure my pleasure we'll be exactly. yes we'll be happy and as to get associated with you for uh, future also thank sure so definitely they're looking forward sir sure. so thank you so much sir thank you sir and uh, with your permission moving forward we have our next speaker and our next speaker is dr prashant agrawal sir uh, um, sir is a professor in Sada University and sir is going to talk on the topic scenario of road accident and their forensic investigation in India and uh, with this I would like to give the brief introduction about this sir. Uh, I request my co-host Aarti to kindly give the introduction about uh, Professor Prashant Agrawal sir. Aarti over to you. Uh, thank you so much sir and uh, I take this privilege to introduce Dr. Prashant Agrawal sir to our audience. Uh, Dr. Prashant Agrawal, sir, is currently serving as a professor in the Department of Forensic Science, School of Allied uh, Health Sciences at Shada University. Prior to this, he had served as a professor in forensic science and head of academics at the College of Traffic Management Institute of Road Traffic Education, IRTE, Faridabad, which is affiliated with the Maharishi Dhyanand University, Rotak, and professor and head in the Division of Forensic Science, School of Basic and Applied Sciences, Galgotia's University, Greater Noida, Uttar Pradesh. In 2000, uh, okay. So uh, he has done PhD in Forensic Science uh, from Institute of Medical Sciences, Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi, uh, UP in 2009, and Master's in Forensic Science from Institute of Basic Sciences, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar University, Agra in 2002. He has published uh, uh, research and uh, and his teaching experience in the area of forensic science is of over 17 years and uh, he has more than 35 publications in national and international journals in the areas of forensic chemistry toxicology fingerprints etc he has supervised two phd students and more than 40 students have completed their msc dissertation under his guidance he is a member of editorial board of several peer-reviewed journal in the area of forensic science where well, uh, Thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation and uh, coming to over this to this platform. We hand over the session to you now. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ranjit, for inviting me for this wonderful session. And Thanks. I was seeing the previous lecture. It was a definitely a wonderful lecture, and it gives a very good uh, input to the students who are working in the area of forensics. So here, uh, without taking any much time, I. Uh, I want your permission to start the presentation. Yes, sir. Can, can I share from here? On? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can share, sir. So, is it visible to you? Ah, uh, yes, sir. You can just make this as a full mode. Uh, uh, from slides, so sir. Uh, from slide show here. Yes. yes, sir. From here, you can make. Yeah. Perfect. yeah, perfectly fine, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, now uh, the topic for the today's presentation is the forensic oh, investigation. Yeah, oh, yeah. Forensic investigation in the road accident cases. So as we know in India, as we are the underdeveloped countries, the road accident is a major issue in India. And uh, uh, I start from the basic beginning things. When we talk about the manner of death in the forensic science, we see there are the three types of uh, manner of death. One is the accidental, homicidal, and the suicidal. Definitely homicide is the murder, suicidal is the, the person kills some, uh, himself or herself. So and the someone is responsible for both the cases. But when we see the accident, so accident generally means when the person, there is no one is responsible and the person dies due to some incident and that happens accidentally. So uh, when we say the road, road accident, so every time we use the term the road accident. So this is the any crash that happens onto the road, that is a merely an accident or it is a, someone may be responsible for that. 
So as the term indicates, it is an accident. So it means that no one is responsible and the investigation is not required. And that generally happens in India. In all the road accident cases, we generally do not do the forensic investigation that is required in every accident case. So generally, rather than using the term accident, we should use the term road crash cases, road crash, so that we can uh, start the investigation. Because uh, for every accident, whether the, every road crash that happens on the road, someone is definitely res is held responsible. And it is very important to identify who is responsible for that. And there are a number of reasons for the road accidents. And we need to, during the investigation, we need to clarify and need to identify, we need to reach at one point, which is the major reason for the, of the road accident and what are the contributing factors. So there are the two things in the road crash case or road accident case. I will also use the road accident case during my presentation because it's the most familiar term. So there are the two reasons of a road accident when you find out the reason of accident, road accident. One is what is the main reason and second, what are the contributing factors? So we will discuss one by one. First, we look at the scenario of the road accident in India. So road accident is a, a road accident is a very uh, felonious problem in all developed and underdeveloped countries. If we talk uh, about the data, the approximately 1.25 million fatalities occur worldwide. Occur worldwide in the road accidents yearly and the known fatal injuries are higher in the number which service. This is given by the Wagner 2017. If we see the data given by the Save Life Foundation, Save Life Foundation is the NGO which is working uh, in India from a very long time in for the uh, saving the life of the people, the road crash accidents, road crash cases. So according to data by the Save Life Foundation, India's road crash severity in 2021 was 38.6 deaths per 100 crashes. So this is a huge amount. So as per the available data in 2016, India ranked first among the top 20 countries for road crashes with crash severity of 31.4 followed by the China. So this is a very alarming situation in 2016. And from after 2016, a lot of precautions have been taken by the Indian government to reduce the uh, road crash. So according to the statistics put by the crime uh, NCRB, Crime Record Bureau, there were close to half a million road accidents in India in 2019, the total number of deaths were 1.51 lakhs and the number of injured person was 4.5 lakhs. So this is the meaning that on an average, there are the 51 accidents every hour of every day on Indian roads, resulting in the death of the 17 people and the 51 serious injuries. And among these injuries, among these deaths and the injuries, 70% of the fatalities are the men and women in the age group of 18 to 18 to 45 years. So this is a very alarming situation because the, these are people who are dying in the road accident that from the young age group, young age group who are the earning part, who are earning for their families, so 18 to 45 years of age. So we need to definitely, we need to reduce this uh, road accident cases and also need to punish the person or the agencies who are responsible for the road accident cases. And that's why the proper forensic road investigation is required in every case, in every case. If you see, uh, I have taken the, some data from the famous Indians who died in the road accidents in the previous years. And these people who died in the road accident, they were of the very lot of the senior age and are also at their prime. In the recent case, the Cyrus Mystery who died to, at the age of 54, the ex strategist chairperson who is a uh, uh, aware or everyone is aware about him. The Rajesh Pilot, the politician, Sahib Singh Verma, the politician, Gopinath Munde, Deep Sindhu, at the age of only 37, the actor and activist. Sonika Chauhan, she was a model at the age of 27. Kalgatath Bhattacharya, the folk singer, Sana Iqbal, and the Sagar So this number is a few number only. So you can see the people who died in the road accident, that is definitely a tragic not only for their career, not only for their family, but for the, it's a loss for the India also. If we see uh, daily in the daily newspaper or in the news channels, we see the 
accidents on the highways. So if you see the, I have taken the, some of the pictures from the road accidents. Here the one truck is standing on the road and uh, uh, one vehicle car who is moving uh, at a high speed, maybe at a high speed, and it struck the, uh, this uh, truck from the behind and the casualty was there. So this is another picture of the scene, a truck who is standing on the road and the car who is driving at a high speed got stuck and he will get into the, this vehicle. So in the same case, so by the scenario of these, by the severity of the accidents, you can see that the, the chances of survival of the people after this accident is very nil. So this is another photograph showing the accident. So we need to identify to what are the major causes of the road accident so that uh, the further investigation can be done. So there may be the several reasons of the road accident. It can be on the part of the driver, they can be on the part of the vehicle, but they can be the, the road can also be responsible for that. If the road is responsible for the accident, then the authority or the department who is responsible for the making the road, they must be held responsible and they must be charged with the uh, uh, charged with the accident. So, uh, as we talk about the failure of the, on the part of the failure of the driver, so the driver may be sick, he may be the drunk, he may be the tired, that is one in 10% uh, cases, he may be drowsy, he may be distracted by some reason, reckless driving, over speeding. Reckless driving, over speeding is one of the main reasons of the road accident. And also in the investigation part, when the police do the investigation, the general findings is that the vehicle was over speeding. May be over speeding or may not be over speeding, but their findings is the vehicle was over speeding. So that is the main cause of the. Generally, when the police do the investigation, they only give the two main reasons of the accident. One is the over speeding, second is the bursting of the tires. So, but they may be the reason, one of the reasons, but in every case, they cannot be the reason. There may be the number of reasons. So, we, during the investigation, we need to identify need to reach a conclusion what is the major reason of the accident or the uh, driver is driving under the influence of the intoxicant or the tailgating tailgating is a very uh, common problem in uh, uh, some state and in, in india the people who are uh, moving the car driving the car they doesn't uh, take a gap between the two vehicles they drive the vehicle neck to neck with the vehicle. So that is the main reason if another vehicle applies the brake suddenly. So the vehicle which is coming from backside doesn't have the time or space to apply the brake and it can stop on the time. So that a tailgating is another reason of the accident. Failure on the part of the vehicle, the defective design, tire blowouts, brake failures, poor vehicle maintenance, defective light, worn out wires, that may be the from the part of the vehicle. Bursting of the tire is one of the reason of the road accident. But uh, when, if we, during the investigation, if we found the tire is present, the bursted tire is found at the scene of crime, doesn't mean that the reason is the, the reason of the accident is the bursting of the tire. The tire may have been burst after the accident because the when the uh, vehicle strikes the uh, very hard with the divider or anything, so tire may burst after the accident also. So we need to clarify, we need to differentiate whether the this tire burst is before the accident or this is after the accident. Third one is the important thing is the road failure. So whether the road which is made uh, for the public vehicles or the private vehicles, whether it is a safe to ride, whether it is a safe and what is the, what the speed that is limit for that, whether that is sufficient for that road or not. So the deadly curves or the potholes that may be on the road, lack of road or traffic signages are not there properly. Some blind spots were there that are not properly marked. Sudden landslides that happens on in the hilly areas, the bumpy road, all the boulders, they can sometimes cause the accident. Apart from this, uh, some other conditions may also be responsible for the accident, that is the night driving. The rain, because the rain or ice, they reduces the friction of the road. So sometimes they also make the reason of the accident. The fog, the fog is there, visibility is less. So that is the reason of the accident so in which we must follow the traffic rules and we must uh, uh, drive the car at a speed which is set during the fog time. So high wind, police chase, use of mobile while they're driving, not following the traffic signs. 
on the part of driving failure running stop signs so these are the related with the uh, not following the rules and regulation running stop signs running light lights improper turns unsafe lane changes that is most common in the delhi ncr region and the wrong way driving so these are the some of the reasons uh, which may lead to the num uh, road accident cases so you can see that there are the as we have discussed the number of reasons which are responsible for the road accident cases so while doing the investigation a police officer and the forensic team they must look each and every aspect what is the actual cause of the road accident what are the contributing factors on the road accident so uh, take an example of the one case uh, recently the cyrus mystery accident case the initial because it's a high profile case in high profile case there is a forensic investigation the road accident especially in the road accident cases but in the most of the road accident cases there is a no forensic investigation generally forensic team doesn't uh, uh, ask to come for the to investigate the road accident case so that is required because the police officer what they are doing the investigation that is they are doing their best but uh, because they are not aware with the aspects forensic aspects which are known to a forensic expert so they always need to take the help of the forensic expert so initial probe says in case of cyrus mystery in the accident case the initial probe says the over speeding and the error of judgment as a reason of road that for all the cases in which uh, we get the information from the police that is the main reason but when the investigation was done by the uh, international road federation international road federation is a very old organization it was set up in 1948 in the headquarters in the washington it basically it is an ngo so when they have done the investigation then they found a very surprising uh, surprising facts so some of the facts are they said there is a poor the main reason of the accident was a poor maintenance inadequate signage missing markings on the roads where the car was so there are some of the findings that they were given so the over speeding may be the contributing factor but the main reason was this the road the poor maintenance inadequate signage is the other major factor so over speeding may be the contributing factors so before uh, come to any conclusion we must know okay, what is the main reason so that the culprit who is responsible for that must be must be prosecuted but generally what happens when we uh, do the investigation when the police do the investigation in the general scenario uh, as we heard some news that the, there is a accident between a car and a two wheeler so what we generally think the who is responsible for that i need a one answer if there is an accident uh, in a car and the vehicle in a two wheeler who will be responsible so any answer from audience side yes sir if any accident happens between the car and the two wheeler so if i bluntly ask as a layman okay, who will be responsible for this accident either the two wheeler or the car so what will be the answer in generally the answer will be the for the normal person it is a two wheeler it is a four wheeler because it is a large vehicle so this is the same what the police do for any case for any investigation the large vehicle held responsible for the accident ki jo bada vehicle hai wahi accident ke liye responsible hai if the accident happens between the uh, car and the truck then the truck is responsible for the accident if the accident uh, happens between the two buses so if happens in the up and one bus is from the mp investigation is done by the up police then the bus from the mp police is mp mp state is responsible so that this should not be the scenario that should not be the investigation like this so we must irrespective of uh, whether it is a small vehicle whether it is a, a large vehicle we must come to the conclusion after the evidence ke, which vehicle is responsible and who is at fault so that is the main purpose of the accident investigation so identify and describe the true course of event as we do generally do in all types of investigation with respect to the road accident okay, what are the course of events sequence of events what where when this need to be clarified identify the direct and root cause or the contributing factors of the accident as i said in cyrus mystery case the faulty road is the main cause of the accident and the over speeding is the contributing factor for the accident so this need to be 
clarify. Identify the risk reducing measures to prevent the future or comparable accident. So for any accident, if any accident happens on the road, so this is uh, the purpose of the accident is not to investigate that claim, but also to give the suggestions so that the such type of incidents can be prevented. That is the part of the accident investigation. Fourth one is to investigate and evaluate the basis for the potential criminal prosecution so that the, who, the person who is responsible can be charged with the, that crime. Then finally, evaluate the questions of the guilt in order to assess the liability for the compensation. Because if the accident is happens intentionally to get the compensation or to get the claim, that also need to be investigated. So these are the, some of the main purpose of the uh, accident investigation. So to increase the road safety improvement is required to the preventive road accident cases. So what happens in the road accident when the police gets the information by any way, either by the phone or through the person, any way the police gets the information. So it is the duty of the police to reach the uh, scene of crime and or can close the FIR. So once the FIR is lost, which is the main source of the leading a criminal case, so that is the criminal case and that need to be further investigated. So police officer attending the RTA case are not only required to provide a subjective assessment of the factors contributed to the abuser, but also the forensic team should visit the crime scene to evaluate the reason for them. Because the assessment of the forensic experts are likely to be more accurate than the views of the police officer. So in every case of road accident cases, so along with the police, there should be the provision that the forensic experts are also going to the uh, accident case in every case, not only in high profile case, in every case, so that every investigation can reach to its conclusion. So the main objective we can uh, categorize into the four major areas. So definitely the investigate the traffic accident is the one of the objective. Along with that, if the accident happens, so we need to collect the statement from the witnesses and from the victim. If the witness is in the condition that he can give the statement, the statement can be taken at the particular time. But if it is not, uh, if it is in the critical condition, he must need to send to the hospital. Then after uh, this uh, statement can be taken in the hospital. Sorry, for the victim or the witness, uh, if the person who is a witness of that accident, the statement can be taken in one side. To determine the cause and fault of an accident, that is the main purpose, to clear the scene of an accident using the resources like fire and repair. So for the road accident cases, this is a major issue because the road is continuously moving, the traffic is continuously moving. So for the investigation point of view, we cannot keep the road block for a long time. So the police officer and the investigator also has a very less time to uh, to collect the evidences, to make the sketch or to make the all the formalities which is uh, required for the uh, for the investigation case because they need to remove the uh, vehicle from the scene of so to clear the vehicles. So for that, before moving any part or before moving the any vehicle from its initial position, they must make a marking by the chalk or by the paint, the road paint, and need to photograph immediately so that take photographs can be used and they can the position of the by the photographs the position of the vehicle, position of the victim or the other evidence can be fixed. So this is the one major issue that happens in the road accident cases. Can we not keep it up for a long time? So uh, while uh, as the police gets the information, so the initial steps while arriving at the scene, so the police officer who is arriving, the police team who is arriving at the scene after getting the information, they must be full aware about the, what is the actual location of the scene so that they can reach the scene uh, in a within time. Because the within time is, is important because uh, the time is, uh, one hour time is set by the medical professional that is a very crucial time when the life of the person can be saved. If the PCR van or uh, police officer team can reach to the person within one hour time period, so then the life of the person can be saved. So that is the prime importance in any case, the life of the person should be saved. 
because uh, not only to life the person because he is a person who can give the actual can give you the evidence what actually was happened at the scene of accident so the location time of notification must be noted who notified the officer weather and visibility condition so this is the important part to what is the weather or visibility condition whether it is a rainy season what is the strong wind is blowing so this can because they may be the contributing factor of the accident general information has to be seriousness of the accident injuries hit and whether the hit and run case or the vehicle who hit the some other vehicle is on the road both vehicles are on the road so amount of traffic congestion congestion etc so whether or not additional support is proceeding to the scene such as ambulance or the additional process. so police officer or the team must have all the information during the time during the time when they are reaching to the uh, incident site so care for the injured person to protect the scene so care for the injured if any uh, accident happens the first target is the to save the life of the person or the to determine the extent of injury if any to an accident victims render first aid and request of medical assistance and also in some cases uh, in the report areas where the police is uh, uh, not available and is not reaching on time the local people the local people uh, or the witnesses should uh, take this on priority and they should, uh, they should come forward so that the person can be so they can inform the police or if the, there is a delay in the uh, Uh, arrival of the police team, so they can uh, send the this uh, victim to the hospital. So in the one case, so here you can realize the sensitivity of the people for what which I am talking about. If the person must be sensible, or they must have the some uh, nature of that to help the person, so the life of the person can be saved. This was a case of two thousand nineteen in the Ranchi after a truck accident. so accident took place and the passer by looted the detergent route rather than saving the life of the person people were busy walking away with the sacks that no one informed the police station 15 minutes away which was a 15 minutes away from the site of incident by that time police got to know and is the spot more than half of the load and the half an hour had been lost so the driver and his helper who had crawled to a nearby field lying down with no one helping them so this sometimes this was a condition of the the public or the local people they must be sensitive quite sensitive to save the life of the person they must inform to the police as early as possible so the life of the person can be saved otherwise for the if we talk about the elements of investigation this is same for as we do in all types of investigation cases they are the six w uh, five w's and one h that need to be solved For to come and conclusion who what when where why and how this is the same procedure as we followed in the other crime scene processing securing the crime scene searching the crime scene recording the crime scene crime scene investigation so securing the crime scene as we know in every case the it is the duty of the first responding officer or the police team to secure the crime scene and the purpose is to uh, authorize to uh, provide the unauthorized entry of the unauthorized person at the crime scene but is this actually happens in the crime scene or for accident related cases it is not the crime scene in the or accident scene in the road accident cases is actually not properly covered not properly secured so there are the, definitely the chances of uh, losing the evidence so i will show you the some of the slides of showing that there is a one more issue with the investigation case with especially to the safety of the police officer and safety to the forensic experts who are on the scene they are also at the risk because uh, when you are doing the investigation on the road in road accident case you are you himself yourself are on the road and the people who are coming from the because the traffic is still on traffic is still on the people who are coming at the high speed Uh, by the time he reached to that uh, area, he came to the investigation going on, but he cannot control the speed and may hit you. So the proper safety of the investigation, they must take the take care of the their safety also. So for this, the one is the placing the traffic cones before the accident scene. A uh, buffer zone must be created while doing the investigation on, especially on the highways. While doing the investigation, the they must create the uh, buffer zone. 
buffer zone that is a 10 to 20 feet or 30 feet depending on the speed on that uh, highway so they by placing the appropriate uh, by placing the traffic cones or by placing and by placing the appropriate traffic signs or they can put the uh, another police officer at that point to divert the traffic and the wearing the high visibility vest so this is the uh, one uh, process by which we can place the traffic cone uh, at a distance of 20 or 30 meter from the actual site of incident so that the traffic who is coming at a high speed towards that incident site they can be direct, directed diverted on time so this is intended to increase the buffer zone uh, so the placing of traffic cones to inform the oncoming oncoming drivers of the danger instruct them to proceed consciously through the zone of the accident investigation so that is important for the safety of the investigating officers and the police officers this type of uh, signages can also be put accident ahead or the speed limit the speed limit at that time can be reduced or the police vehicle or the ambulance if available. So that can also be placed at a distance from the accident site. So that with the lights on, with that lights on, so that the vehicle who is approaching toward the site, they can see it much before and can divert. So now, as what we are, uh, I was talking, the protection of the scene. Protection of the scene at the accident case is very important. In every case, it is very important but it is not done properly in the road accident cases. So that's why the number of evidence is made at loss. Here, this is where you can see all the rain is there. Uh, understand the uh, not possible to protect the scene as well. But the protection here, if you see, the protection has, is very less. Uh, traffic, there is, you can see there is only one news of here, there is only one traffic cone is there. And the marking, so no markings are there. This is the picture of the same accident vehicle from the another side. Here the, you can see clearly. So the part of the broken part of the vehicle is used as a barrier to cover the flames. So that is not the appropriate. Uh, we are uh, ourselves are demos, uh, destroying the evidence. So this is not the proper way to investigate the case in any road accident cases. Similar to the so we should take the road accident case as seriously as we do the investigation in any criminal case, in any murder case, in any other case. So this is because here is also the life, the person has lost his life. So that is the, as same as the case of the murder. So we should do the investigation in the same way as we do the investigation in the other cases with the help of the forensic. Here you can see the vehicle is moving. Police officers are there, police van is there, but the markings are not there. Means the vehicles are, has been removed without the markings. So when we do the investigation, when we proceed the investigation, so we cannot uh, find the, the proper markings. So how we can correlate the speed of the vehicle, how we can correlate the transfer of the evidence from this vehicle to another vehicle. So this is a common problem that arises if you are not doing the markings, proper markings, and remove the vehicle and the other evidence from the scene of crime. Just to, uh, just with the reason that uh, we need to clear the traffic route. So this is just definitely this is the reason that we need to clear the traffic, ongoing traffic. But before that, we need to mark the position of the vehicle, position of the tires, position of the evidence, and the photographs. They need to be taken. This is the case, uh, the problem arises in case of uh, when the accident happens in the night, especially in the highways when the accident happens in the night. So due to the poor visibility, it is very difficult to collect the evidence. So in that case, uh, the police officers always advised to place the vehicle with their lights on so that the vehicle light uh, can give the proper illumination, proper lighting so that the evidence can be collected and it is also advised if any evidence happens in the night it is again visited in the early morning for the presence of the evidence is any evidence is left and was not visible in the night so because in forensic science uh, there is a, always a 
this all depends on the evidence if evidence are lost then the case cannot be solved even we have the some if you all all are from the forensic background you all know that the number of cases that remain unsolved due to the absence of the evidence the cases are very simple but the evidence was not there so there were not correlation was not there so evidence they prove that crime has been committed establish the key elements of a crime link a suspect with the crime scene establish the identity of a victim or a suspect corroborate the verbal witness testimony testimony so that is important if we are taking the statement from the witness so whether it correspond to the or it in uh, contradiction with the uh, it is the same or in contradiction with the uh, evidence then as is the exonerate the innocence so the purpose is of the evidence is not only to found someone guilty or make someone guilty it is also to remove the person who are innocent give detectives lead to work within the case in a one case uh, in a, it is a hit and run case so this is about the, how the evidence are important uh, also in the road accident cases in a hit and run case the culprit left a cyclist dead at the scene along with the damaged cycle the damage was prominently at the three places the hind mud guard the carrier and the seat it is a hit and run case it was expected that the corresponding indentation mark should be available on the runaway vehicle so definitely it is a common rule of the tool marks uh, when they come into contact uh, so the higher the harder object will leave the marks on the softer object so later one on apprehension of the culprit the indentation patterns was found on the vehicle with the damaged side of the bicycle so they are correlated so that's why uh, the evidence are important in the road accident cases by the indentation marks by the damage marks by the transfer of the uh, paints we can correlate the two vehicle which collide in uh, the road accident cases there is also importance of the fragile evidence fragile evidence road accidents are the puddles of gasoline oil blood or the pieces of the broken glasses they are fragile evidence present in a small quantity and can be uh, removed easily like the gasoline if there is a rainy season so the gasoline can be removed easily can be washed off so these are the fragile evidence so at any crime scene of road accident the fragile evidence must be collected as early as possible or they must be photographed so that can be damaged altered or destroyed or sometimes they can be removed from the scene by any willful or negligent act position of the turn signal lever if they have uh, if the in any case Uh, there is a sharp turn and the uh, it is claimed that the person has not given the indicator so it can be checked by the uh, inspection of the turn indicator whether it was on position or it was in the off position so that is also need to be so every aspect so every aspect that need to be claimed whether the light is on light is off because if the uh, if it is claimed that the vehicle is in the accident happens in the night so first check whether the indicator whether this uh, filament was on light filament was on or off position so that need to be checked so this gives the idea whether this is the true case of the accident in the night or it was the accident in the daytime so alcoholic beverages container inside the vehicle if any present so it may indicate that the person may be under the influence of the alcohol so evidence should be tagged marked and secured in accordance with the proper evidence gathering procedures prior to its removal and for this for every evidence uh, the procedure is same for the glass there is a separate procedure for the collection of the glass evidence for the paint there is a separate procedure for the collection of the paint evidence so these are the so this is the uh, same Uh, as we do the markings in all the cases, similarly in the road accident cases, we do the markings of the evidence, a statement of the witnesses, questioning and taking the statement from the witnesses, and uh, a statement from the victim. They should be one. 
done and they must be corroborated. They must be cross-checked with the evidence, whether they are in the same direction or not in the so in case of road accident cases, examination of vehicle, which is an important part the, in the examination of vehicles, so how we can say this is the site of accident. Site of accident means the evidence related to the uh, vehicle accident, they must be present at the scene of accident site. Like as I said, the gasoline or the other things which need to be present, the glass pieces. So debris of the broken parts, skid or scrape marks, paint chips, bits of metals and the content of the vehicle. So these uh, evidence, if they are present at the site, so this indicates this confirm that yes, this is the site of accident. Examination of the vehicle. So these are the foreclosed photographs should always be taken from the, for the examination of vehicle, the damage marks. So when we are doing the uh, photo, internal photography and the external photography of the vehicle, for the closer photography for the damages, closer photography of the damages is actually happening. So these are not the severe cases, but the small dance one which I am showing. So vehicle search and inspection for uh, uh, in all the cases. So I'm not doing the detail. The photography is an important aspect. So I'll tell you the photography in all the cases is required to photograph, but in the vehicles photography. We need to do the photography from the eight directions. So this is a rule so that uh, none of the evidence is left out. So the four pictures from the front and rear side and the four pictures diagonally from the front and the rear side. So in case of this uh, road accident, the eight pictures should be taken because as you know, the photographs are important piece which uh, used to uh, prove that the crime is happening and the photographs can be used to further reconstruction of the crime scene. Photographs in the east direction and the photograph, closer photograph of the damaged portion should be taken. Nighttime photography, as I said, it is a difficult uh, to get the photographs at the night time. If the vehicle is available, police vehicle is available, the light of that vehicle can be used to illuminate the area. So the photographs can be taken. Otherwise, it can be visited early in the morning for the photographs. So these are the common type of evidence that uh, are found at, in any case of road accident case or hit and run case. The blood, glass, paint, tire marks and the skid marks and the fingerprints. And the evidentiary clues, they can be found on any, they can be found at the vehicle, can be found uh, with the vehicle, with the victim, with the culprit. So any of the uh, places, the evidential clues can be found that all must be investigated and properly collected. At the scene, at the scene, what are the evidence which are important? That is the tire and skid marks. These are the important uh, marks which are present. So there are the two types of things. One is the tire marks and that is called the skid marks. So tire marks means the full impression of the tire. So these tire marks are generally not found on the hard surfaces because on the hard surfaces, they do not uh, take the impression of the tires. So, but uh, nearby the surface, nearby the hard surface, if there is a soft or pliable soil surface and the, by chance the tire uh, go at that place, so the tire marks can be imprinted on the soft soil surface so they can be collected as I uh, can be collected or tire marks sometimes can be found on the hard surface if the something is adhered to the tire some that if this tire is wet or it is uh, uh, blood is adhered to the tire some red paint is adhered to the tire or the road is uh, very recently made so then it can make the tire impressions so in generally tire impressions are not found on the hard surface only the skid marks Skid marks are formed when the suddenly the driver applies the brake. So when the driver applies the brake, the tire stops moving and it skids on the surface. So it will give the skid marks on the surface. So these skid marks are important to identify the tentative speed of the vehicle and also the direction of the vehicle. So the tire rubber residue definitely can be found on the road. 
the glass pieces, paint flakes and streaks, oil and lubricants, transient evidence, mud with the numerous microbiological entities, broken part of the vehicles, bloods and fingerprints. These are the some of the evidence. In also one case, along with the escape marks, we can also found the uh, some broken pieces of the uh, small stones, which are may have come from the come out from the the road. So that is also very confirmatory sign of the this is the place where the accident happens or applying the brakes. So tire marks, as I said, they are found on the pliable surface, smeared with the oil or the powders. So they leave the marks or the brake applies moderately and release without stopping of the vehicle. So where the, in any case, when the vehicle, when the tire stops moving, Tire stops moving, we will look at the tire marks. We will only found the skid marks. When the tire is moving or something is added on the tire, so we will look at the tire marks on the road. So you can see here in the first picture, there are the tire marks. Something was added on the tire. So the tire depression is there. In the close up tire marks on the sand, so this can be possible. Zip tire marks in the mud, it is possible. Or if the tire marks is added with some blood, it is possible. So these are the cases where the we can get the tire marks on the uh, hard surface. So tire tread and tire track evidence. The tire impression reflect the tread design and the dimensional features of the individual tires of a vehicle. So tire tracks are relational dimension between the two or more tires. So tracks can be used to determine the wheel base of the vehicle. So if there, uh, we get the from the other. Uh, relative distance between the two tires, so the make and model of the vehicle can also be added. So this is the close-up of the tire marks when on the pliable surface, means uh, on the soil. Skid marks, as I said, skid marks are created when the brakes are applied suddenly with the full force to a vehicle moving at the high speed. So the brake locks the wheels and they stop revolving. So vehicle doesn't stop at once. So it is skid a distance due to the momentum causing the abrasion. So the tire material thus get deposited on the road and create the skid marks. So the importance of the skid mark is they help to identify the, find out the speed of the vehicle. So these are the, some of the skid marks which can be found when the brakes are really applied by the driver. So in the one case, uh, case of homicide, a dead body was recovered from the railway track. So it is a case of railway accident, railway track, but actually not a case of railway accident. Uh, from railway track, so apparently uh, the police officer, uh, apparently he had been run over by the train. But while examining the body, the investigating officer discovered the tire marks on his thighs. This is important. This was an important piece of evidence and investigation. Investigating officer found on close examination of the body. The tire marks was found on the thighs, although the body was recovered from the railway track. And it was first, they say it was uh, supposed to be the rail accident, rail accident case. So he at once guessed that he had been killed by the vehicle and body was shifted to the railway track. The scene was searched by the officer and located on the road nearby. The presence of the skid and the tire marks gave a rough idea about the vehicle. Searching of the vehicle underway, and they apprehend the one suspected car. Blood stains, skin pieces, and fibers on the vehicle established the identity of the killer car. So this is this case uh, uh, gives uh, when if you do the proper investigation, if we look at all the evidence which has found on the body, on the vehicle, on the road, so definitely uh, we can solve the case. Speed of the skid marks, uh, skid, uh, speed of the vehicle from the skid marks can be calculated by a simple formula as is equal to root 30 df. 30 basically is the gravitational pull in feet per second. D is the distance of the car skidded in feet and the F is the friction, coefficient of friction of the road. It depends on the road. For a tar dry road, it is usually one. For the wet road, the friction reduces, goes to up to 5.5. For the concrete road, it is 0.8, and wet concrete road, it is 0.4. So, by this formula, we can get the approximate speed 
by which the vehicle was traveling. So this gives idea whether the vehicle was over speeding or was not. So these are the class evidences uh, we present. So I'm not going to detail of these evidences because I think they are already covered in some other sessions. So I focus on this, uh, on the road accident. So the class evidence, if they are found, so they need to be collected or they need to be uh, packaged and sent to the laboratory for further examination. Sometimes the head and tail lights, if they are found, or in 800 cases, if there are some broken pieces are found on the headlight or tail light at the scene of flying, they are collected and later on the vehicle is apprehended and they if they are the like the jigsaw puzzle if they fit together so they although a small evidence but it gives a conclusive proof that this was the same vehicle which was uh, present at the and which is responsible for the accident so in a case of uh, this another case in a case of murder the culprit ran away from the scene in a vehicle the vehicle was pelted with the stones a window pane was thus allegedly broken. So, so after a few days, when the police took the vehicle into possession, there was no broken window. But and previously, what was said? The vehicle was pelted with the stones, so the window pane was thus broken. So when the vehicle was apprehended, there was no broken window was there. But the police uh, get some doubt and they start the thorough investigation, mm -hmm. examine the vehicle from inside. So the investigation officer on thorough examination found a number of tiny, almost invisible glass fragments inside the vehicle. And these tiny fragments were produced as a corroborated evidence of the prosecution story of the stones pelting at the scene. So this is why uh, how the some minute, minute evidences can also be sometimes become important. So that's why uh, it is a general rule, the crime scene, collect as much as evidence as you can. Then the sketching, as you know, uh, in every case, we do the sketching. And the purpose of the sketching along the photographs is to fix the position of the uh, evidence. In this case, position of the vehicle, direction of the vehicle, and the direct position of the uh, evidences. So these are, the, as you know, what are the different sketches uh, advantage. I'm quickly moving to the one case. So this is all how the report is prepared. So this is a one case study in which we, uh, I want to discuss about the uh, importance of the uh, evidence and how this evidence can sometimes become very important. Even they can uh, uh, prove that the theory which is made by the police that is incorrect and the police investigation was not in the right direction. The location was the Mehroli Gurgaon Road. The time of occurrence, uh, 6.30 a.m. in the morning. Fatality was one, one person died on the spot. Vehicle was Maruti Alto, and the other vehicle was the uh, this uh, two wheeler. So, as a general rule, uh, when I started my car, if the accident between the two vehicles, so this large vehicle is always responsible. So, this is the FIR. In the FIR, the uh, police uh, wrote that. Uh, Zona Purisme Gadi Gama Padi Kevas Pancha to Samne Se Kalto Karka Chalak Apni Karku Badi Tej Raftari Lapar Vahia Gaflat Chalata Vaya. Ye Badi common line hai, jo police officers really use karte hai, ki one vehicle was moving with the over speeding to isko hum karte hai, Badi Tej Raftari Lapar Vahi or Gaflat Se Gaflat means Vahi uh, Jo Samaj Nei Vare Gaflat Se Chalata Vaya Aya or Samne Se Meri Motorcycle Me Takkar Vardi से मेरा संबंधी सड़क पर गिर गए और मोटरसाइकिल साइड में गिर गई मैं नोट कर देखा तो मेरा संबंधी के सर में चोट लगने से मौके पर मौत हो गई और मुझे भी शरीर पर चोट है तो ये एफआईआर और वी कम टू द क्लोजर यू दिस इज द मौका नक्शा जो बनाते हैं मौका नक्शा में उन्होंने दिखाया कि यहां पे कार खड़ी हुई है यहां पे व्हीकल सो व्हाट एक्चुअली दे हैव रिटन इन द एफआईआर सो एज पर द प्लीज एफआईआर दिस वाज अ हेड ऑन क्लीजन Adam Cleason is a directly uh, they strike each other. Rash and negligent driving by the driver of the car. So this is a common finding, common thing that the police bus bus by driver of the bus, by driver of the truck. PCR when was there on the spot, driver and car were caught on the spot. But as per the statement of the driver, 
the driver said. This was not a hidden pleaser. This was a side sweep, skidding of the bike. A rash of negligent driver by the rider of the bike, not by the driver. The rider of the bike admitted his mistake and asked the driver of the car to leave. No PCR van on the spot, as mentioned in the FIR. The driver was called by the policeman back on the spot. Means as per the statement of the driver, uh, he was called back by the police after the accident. So now to differentiate, to identify who is lying, which one is correct. So this is this is possible only with the when we clearly look at the evidence. So we here look at the evidence. So what are the evidence? So this is the right fender of the car being hit by the lag guard of the bike first. This is the lag guard on the right side, lag guard of the bike, and this is the right fender which was hit by the lag guard and then by the tail light of the bike, uh, two wheel. So this was it. So means it was not head and pleasing because there is a no damage on the head front side. Scratch marks on the left side footrest due to the skidding of the bike on the carrier ways. Scratch mark on the left side footrest due to the skidding of the bike on the carrier way. So this was the uh, model, this was made, uh, reconstruction was done by the software. So the bike was coming down, slope at a high speed, the loss control and it started skidding. After losing control, so this was actually happens, but that was opposite contradiction to the police theory. So after losing control, the bike came into the wrong lane. While skidding the rear side of the bike, hit the car on the right fender. Due to collision, the pillion and the rider were thrown onto the carrier way. Head of the pillion driver hit the carrier way with the high impacting force. Due to the impact, pillion driver died on the spot and the rider sustained minor injury. This is actually what happened. So there was no head-on collision, which was so justification which was given after the investigation. So this is a rash and negligent driving by the rider of the bike. The car cannot drive at a high speed, but it was a slope. So the car cannot uh, drive at a very high speed since the car was moving up the slope while maneuvering the sharp band. And if at all it was over speeding, then the due to geometry of the road, the car has a tendency to move towards the center of the curve. But actually it was not at the center of the curve, it was the shoulder of the road, which is not evident. Moreover, the broken pieces of the tail light of the bike were found scattered near the shoulder in the direction of the movement of the car. And if the car was over speeding the collision point, would have been the center of the carriageways, not the shoulder. So as per the F, uh, so as per the FIR, the collision between the car and the bike was a head-on collision. But the photograph of the bike indicates that no damage to the frontal portion of the bike. Rather, most of the damage has happened on the rear side and the left side of the bike. And the 3D reconstruction accident and uh, reconstruction of accident and the evidence is collected from the scene also justifies that the collision was a side sweep or a skidding of the bike was due to the loss of control. And moreover, the rider of the bike admitted the same. So here, two things come. It was the not the head-on collision and the driver of the car was not responsible for the accident and the uh, responsible person was the rider of the two wheeler so that's how uh, by the uh, this shows the how the how the importance of proper examination of the importance of evidence is important and this is done by the forensic experts so if the forensic experts go along with the police team they work together so definitely we can get the good results and we can do the proper investigation in the road accident cases. Thank you. So this is from my side, Dr. Anji. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So there is few questions in the chat box. Yeah. Nice. So uh, can you take from the chat box or should I? Please? Can I stop the slide sharing mode, sir? Yeah. Uh, 
uh, in a major road accident, my mother-in-law and me, brother-in-law passed away. Uh, after that, sir. After that. Will this uh, vary if there is water logging present? The question continues. During a rainy season or the road is red, the cascade more carry, how do we track that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, if it is a rainy season, so the, the, the vehicle behaves differently. And there are the most chances that the vehicle can escape into the uh, wet season. So that's why it is always advised when the when the road is wet, that we should uh, uh, drive the car at a low speed. And the skid marks definitely skid marks uh, may be there, but because the skid marks are not permanent, they are very easily lost. So in case of rainy season, it is very difficult to get the skid marks. Thank you, sir. Next. Uh, and, uh, there is uh, how we can investigate the railway crash. Uh, railway crash has a uh, different aspects because uh, in the railway crash, because the body is perfectly mutilated and uh, there are the not, not crashes. Suppose uh, there are the two things. If the person is on the railway track and it is run over by the uh, rail train, so then that is a different aspect, whether it is a suicide, whether it is a homicide. So here, the uh, definitely the train is not responsible. Driver of the train is not responsible. So we need to check what is the uh, legal aspects of that, whether it is a homicide or whether it is a suicide, and whether it is a collision of the two two car two uh, trains as happened very early in uh, Odisha. So for there are the number of reasons, but that is slightly that is entirely different with the road accident. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So. <clears throat> Thank you so much, sir, for explaining and discussing the scenario of road accident and their forensic investigation and Indian scenario and uh, answering all the questions from the participant. On Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science, uh, on behalf of Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science, I would like to present this e-mementos for your wonderful talks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. And also this e certificate for imparting your valuable insight and inspirational knowledge on scenario of road accident and their in forensic investigation in India. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rajiv. And thank you very much to you and the audience uh, to give a chance for this presentation. And uh, completely thank you. Long, sir. Thank, thank you. you so much. Sir. Thank you, sir. So moving further with your permission, we have our next speaker. And our next speaker is Dr. Amit Chauhan, sir. Sir is going to talk on the topic hidden truth in digital evidences. I request my co-host Arti to kindly introduce our esteemed speaker. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, I take this privilege to introduce Dr. Amit Chauhan, sir, to our participants. Uh, Dr. Amit Chauhan, sir, is acting as the coordinator of forensic sciences in Department of Life Sciences, School of Sciences, Christ, Christ University, Bangalore, Karnataka. He is a member of Indian Police Foundation. He received his MSc in Forensic Science from Amity University, India, MA in Criminology and Police Administration, Madurai Kamraj University, Madurai, uh, and post graduation diploma in Forensic Science from Delhi University, post graduation diploma in Advanced Forensic Science Research and Training from King's College, London, PhD in Forensic Science in collaboration of Ministry of Science, Malaysia. He is a certified doping control officer from World Anti Doping Agency, Montreal, Canada. Anti -doping, uh, National Anti-Doping Control Agency, Delhi, India, and was appointed as a doping control officer in Commonwealth Games in 2010, India as well. As a faculty, he joined Amity Institute of Forensic Sciences, uh, Amity University, Noida in 2018. And uh, uh, following it, he has delivered uh, lectures in several universities. He has organized three national conferences, several webinars, international symposiums as well, and has published 117 international publications and eight book chapters in reputed journals. Thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation and being over here on this platform. Thank you, sir. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ranjit, sir. And thank you so much for your organization for providing me this opportunity. I hope so. I'm clearly audible to all, one all of yes, Perfectly fine, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for confirming. Sir, I'm sharing my presentation with you. Kindly have a look whether it is visible to everyone. Yes, sir. Okay. So you can just make this as a slide, uh, full screen. Mode. Sure, sir. Please. Is it clearly visible, sir? Yeah, perfectly fine. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. 
and thank you so much for giving this opportunity once again and the topic is really very nice when i was going through the hidden truths in digital evidence really i got so many things that I, maybe i was not aware specifically about the facts and the hidden truths that we have a either we a, we have a myth about it or we have a misconception that okay is this a part of the digital evidence or digital form of evidence so whenever it comes to uh just one second sir yeah whenever it comes to the evidences and whenever we are we are talking up we are talking about the digital evidence so the people usually have an idea that okay it is a part of the investigation wherever simply you will you know wherever there is any crime and you will file a complaint or an investigation will be set up against of it so immediately the process will start and within few minutes the work will get over although it is a myth that any investigation doesn't uh, get over within few minutes it takes a lot of time even the law enforcement sometime if in case any one of you have been a victim and you have filed an fir and you know usually we get the trail of it whether the what is the progress in the investigation what is the uh, you know process up to what step we have proceed so usually we get this response from the law enforcement officers that uh, they are working on it is taking a lot of time so that time we consider no they are not working properly but it's true they are they work properly, but it takes a lot of time. So in this concern, so many times the people, they have internalizing the certain floods food play out in the reality that is nowhere related to this one. So usually the digital forensic investigation, it includes the investigation of all the digital evidence. It may be your uh, mail, it may be any PPT, it may be any PDF, it may be any fraud, it may be any encrypted data, it may be metadata, whatever is there, it comes under the investigation. And the investigation process, it involves the acquisition, analysis, preservation of the digital evidence. And it's a fact and true that if in case we, are, we will show any kind of you know, irresponsibility or we will not uh, make it with responsibility, then definitely the facts will not come true as for the expectation or investigation will be disguised. Why is it so? Because either the, it was not handled properly, it was not analyzed properly, or it was not preserved the way it should be. Now, whenever we get the evidences from any scene or whenever we get any kind of information, it depends on what is the condition of the data, what type of data is it, whether it require any kind of repair to the given evidence, whether it's required to prepare any secondary copy or to the original one or any kind of announcement for the presence. So in this concern, the investigation investigators usually they use various tools and the techniques to identify the data that may be either hidden, deleted by the perpetrator of the crime, or that may be hidden by the perpetrator, maybe in the protected, any file, or it may, he or she would have hide it somewhere in the files or maybe overlapped. So in this concern, digital forensic investigation, it's not only about to apprehend the criminals, but also use the prevent also use it to prevent the crime from occurring its first place. So as we were talking about the facts, as I said, that there are some facts, those are those exist in real, but some myths are also there. So here in the hidden facts of the digital evidence, I would like to discuss both. So the first fact is this, any and all data can be recovered, but it depends on the condition of the evidence. It depends on what type of severity or damage has been caused. Suppose I have given here an example, if you are getting this kind of damage mobile phone from the scene of crime or you are getting it from anywhere. So in this concern, the screen, it doesn't matter, but what is the condition of the metadata? How much the data can be recovered from it? That is most important. So first, if in case we used to say that any and all data can be recovered, so it depends on the severity, it depends on the damage caused to the evidences, whatever has been submitted to the forensic science laboratory or handed over to a forensic expert. Then, we have another thing that digital forensic experts gather the evidences and they conclude it in real time. No, it's not a magic wherever simply you will get the evidence and within a few minutes, you will submit your opinion. Digital forensic investigation requires a lot of time. 
it requires. If in case we are getting any other evidence from the scene of crime, like we are getting blood, we are getting any other biological fluids, simply we know that it will be contaminated and what type of treatment should be given. But digital forensic experts, they have to deal with so many things. It is not essential that we are recovering the data from one file and it will be done. No, there, there will be so many uh, things attached with that. Usually what do we do simply, if we have downloaded, we are working on something, we have deleted the browsing history, we consider that we have formatted the data and simply it's have nothing. Still, it consists a lot of data. And if in case we are considering, no, 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 Okay, let me give you an example. If in case sometime you log in on something like uh, online shopping, there are so many pop up, pops up will come and so many cookies you have to accept. Usually either you reject the cookies or you accept, but that's not the only thing that we are doing. Along with that, there are so many uh, files that will open or that will be active in a background form. So that should be examined thoroughly. That's why the digital forensic analysis, it requires a lot of time. Now, any password and encryption can be hacked. Now, it is it is mentioned that whether it is possible. Yeah, even so many times you have watched it in news, you might have heard about it that the FBI or CIA or any other websites were hacked by the people. And, you know, for the day of, you know, the server was down and they were unable to work properly, it is it can be done. The password and encryption can be hacked, but conditions apply. The condition is, what is the strength of your password? Usually, whenever you fix any password for your system, so there is always a written content. And some of the letters should be in uppercase, some higher case, some Roman words, some specific characteristics you should use so that you can increase the complication of your password. And that will not be easy for anyone if in case they are looking to access your data or your mail. Then poor quality of video can be enhanced at infinitum. It's true. But if in case, as it is impractical, I will talk only about the practical, what is happening and what, it, what exists. If in case there is any you know, terrorist or any criminal is there, you might have observed it or watch it in the news that their face is blood. But whether can these blur faces be removed or it is completely blurred, there is no other treatment or enhancement processor techniques, tools can be used for this one. No, it is there because all the tools and techniques have a specific limitation for the fragmentation, for the overlapping or for the bits of it. That are bits I will discuss in the further slides with you. So digital forensic is all about the computers. No. It's not true that it's only about the computers. It deals digital evidence or forensic. It deals with all the aspects, maybe the computers, your mail, maybe any your data, uh, internet banking, any other online tools, or it may be related to any other fact, maybe metadata or the files, whatever you transfer. So it's not only about the computers. It's about all the aspects, whatever we are dealing, we are surviving. The digital forensic investigator, investigators, the possesses the godlike abilities, it's not true. As we know one thing in forensic that expert, a person who has devoted his or her time to attain the knowledge, skills, and experience is known as an expert. So definitely the forensic digital investigators are the people, those who learn from the experience, and they implement it in the lives. So, in this concern, the digital forensic methodology is only used to crack high profile cases. No, whatever, what type of the cases are registered or, you know, uh, an FIR has been uh, filed or claimed that it is not like that, or there is a allegation against any existing case. So definitely the digital forensic investigation will be set up against that. Now, the digital forensic investigators from every country all seek to the same approach. That's absolutely wrong. It's not like that, that all the forensic experts or investigators to all the country. No, the tools are there, but the advancement it takes place along with the time. Nowadays, we are not using the same tools and techniques, whatever we had been using like five years earlier or seven years earlier, it had changed. Because the expert, whoever is investigating, they come through, they come through the latest trend of the crime, 
the problem, what is existing, and along with them, they conduct the research to come out or provide the solution of these problems. So in this concern, let's move on next, as we have already discussed. This is a picture that was blurred by an invest a person who has considered that he or she has completely blurred this picture, whether it will be possible for him or her to get the exact information or the real facts behind this. So as I mentioned, that nothing is impossible and it has a capacity. It has a capacity to hide the information up to what extent it can be fragmented or it can be overlapped or if the masking can take place that we will discuss in the upcoming slides. It is another thing that where we were talking about the digital investigation, but nowadays all of you are surrounded with our digital information, digital sources, even up to our watch also that help you to tell uh, your, you know, how many steps you have taken, how much distance you have traveled today. Okay, what is your BP and everything? So how it is? It is also a digital source of information that is connected maybe with your computer, that may be connected with your mobile through Bluetooth or GPS. So not only as we uh, had given here, the fourth one, fourth point, digital forensic is all, fifth one is all about computers. So it's not only about the computers, it's all about the existing resources that we are surrounded. Now here, because uh, I know the digital forensic is not a you know small topic that can be covered, but hidden truths or the facts about digital forensic. So today I would like to discuss about the facts. What are the real facts? And by this time, what myths we had about the digital forensic and the probable investigative technique. So when we talk, it is a myth. I have clearly, wherever I have uh, make it bold, so kindly consider that it is the myth and fact that I will discuss. So the first fact, myth, what we are talking, the flight uh, files that do not have a hash calculated when cal collected cannot be authenticated. So it's a myth. Hashing a file is alone a robust method for confirming file integrity. But digital files without an accompanying hash checksum can be authenticated in another ways. And what are those ways? Authentication of files for the purposes of digital forensic can be different from authentication required by rules governing to the admission of admission in the judicial proceeding. So we cannot say that when it can be cal uh, you know, calculated whenever in what condition it was collected. So this, this is the myth what we were aware, but the fact is totally different. Now the next myth is, Digital forensic examiners are able to have all the available forensic tools on the site to conduct all type of digital forensic analysis. So no, sometimes it is not possible that we are equipped with all the modern technology and techniques that help us to investigate any crime. So advanced password crack cracking tools run on high powered large desktop computers or even require a network of large high powered computers that may not be available. But another foreign tools such as a chief of equipment are not created to be moved on from the permanent location. So that will be available in the laboratory itself. Along with this, the good skills are the minimize available negative impact. If in forensic, we should always keep one thing in our mind that if in case we cannot find out effect, we shouldn't play with the authenticity of the evidence. We have to make sure that there will be no damage or harm to the authenticity or originality of the given evidence. So in this concern, we have to look for the minimal or minimum impact that may cause the damage. The users cannot add it to the exifil or metadata from digital camera and or images. Usually we have this thing that, okay, whatever the picture we have uploaded, whatever the concern is there that cannot be edited by any one of them, but no, that's a myth. The fact is it can be deleted or it can be edited. There are so many, uh, you know, nowadays day-to-day -day life, there are so many things we can get to know that, okay, my Facebook account has been hacked. My Instagram account has been hacked where the people usually take out or they will steal or they will, you know, copy your images that will be edited or that will be, you know, uh, background will be changed. The things that will be modified. And 
a new account will be added. It. So it is that. It deals with that, that exhibit or the metadata can also be edited or it can be deleted. Now, coming on the next point, whether all the data for a company or individual is located at the same physical location as the company or individual. Usually we consider so that, okay, wherever is the company or individual, suppose right now I'm sitting here and all of you are there. So will I get a physical location of this place or wherever am I? So in this concern, the fact is this, that the local digital device may be physically located at any other physical location where it can be accessed by the internet. But the local IT department can map the network location for the local drive letter that can help to determine the exact location of the individual. Usually, the hackers, they never use the exact location or nearby the location of their house or their residence. They usually travel up to a place where they can find the free Wi-Fi or the password. They can use the free data from there so that, that they will be unable, means their forensic investigator will be unable to locate the location or locate them. Second, such things, wherever like uh, those who are the professional hackers, they never use the, the same software that are provided by the company, manufacturing company. It is always installed or, you know, it is always prepared with the different, different type of the parts imported or maybe exported from different, different places. Now, nowadays, all of we are surrounded with iPhone. iPhone has become the first, you know, the choice of the people. And we usually say that whether can it be accessible, whether iPhone, the information can be accessible or not. So next myth or fact is about that, that all data viewable on the digital devices stored locally on the device. Yes, the cloud, it helps to store the information and that may be not located with the physical device. But whenever we are taking the example of iPhone, the Dropbox of iPhone app is accessible when the device is connected to any internet. I'm, once again, I'm repeating it. Whenever your iPhone is accessible to the device connected to any internet, in that case, the drop, Dropbox of the app can be accessible. So it's another fact. All the hard drive drivers can be imaged with the same speed or not. The fact is there are so many variables that impact to the speed at which it was imagined or at which it was prepared. So in this concern, some like uh, sometimes we can say the some common variable that may be include the speed of the hard drive, presence or absence of the bad sectors, and the type of the drive connection that is also there, such as SSD with one software that tool took or 36, you know, the minutes can help in this concern. Specifically, if in case we are talking and taking an example of imaging the same, like we are making the copy of 64 GB setup. So in this concern, the usually to make the image of it, it may take half an hour or 45 minutes with the same speed, if we know the fact. Now, the duplicate original is a bit. Usually, what do we do? Whenever we get any evidence, whenever we prepare the secondary copy of it, we call it the original duplicate. Later on, how many copies are you preparing with that? Those are the uh, copies or those are the secondary copies of that. But we, I, as I mentioned earlier, that we always avoid any kind of damage to the original one or original device. That's why, what do we do? The copy is always considered and we prepare it. In this concern, a hash value of the mathematical algorithm is always calculated that then rate a hexadecimal output value. It may be alpha, numeric, text value, or any change that may be resulting in the hash value can cause or can give you the information. Usually, the two common hash algorithm are used currently, one MD5 and one is SHA. So these are the two uh, common hash algorithm that are used to prepare the copy. Now, next one is, uh, all data on a computer can be viewed by using my computer screen. So yes, sometimes we, you know, if in case, suppose I'm using two devices, one device is in my office, one device is here at my location. So can I use that? So yes, the fact is my computer and Fi Explorer are the graphical interface 
that are programmed to show the normal file on a device. The another one, it will be, but additionally, the account can be set up to conceal any portion to the data or the location that are designed for the operating to our system or information that may be programmatically ignored by the type of the interface. So in this concern, the standard non-technical users can help to access the data. Next one is the digital forensic examiner conduct a proper and thorough forensic exam only using keyword search. Yeah, usually what is our common understanding whenever we are looking or we are trying to search any file. So you normally what do we do? We always put the keywords and we get the file or simply we will get a bunch of the files we will finalize. But when it comes to the digital forensic examiner, so it is not possible for them to create or prior an examination because the list of relevant, relevant keywords will identify all relevant digital information. So in this one, you have to shortlist which one you have to find what you were looking for. Now, the most important fact for all the forensic scientists, whatever is the myth is qualifying a witness as an expert in digital forensic means the witness as a, is an expert in computer now. The witness may have a little control over the adjectives used in the conjunction with expert and the specific term that may be used by the code that may be non-technical, that may be witness or willing to present in a code. But along with this, the computer forensic may imply to the non-technical person that may have an expertise in anything. In anything means maybe in the connection, maybe in the subdiscipline of digital, it may be multimedia forensic, it may be scientific examination, or maybe sometime they can call to a person who will be aware about the legal consequences, but not about these. So in this concern, expert, according to me, who is an expert? Expert is a person who has devoted his or her time on a specific field to gain more and more knowledge. Maybe uh, like uh, you may be an expert in one particular field, but you will be good, but not an expert in another simul uh, simultaneous or another aspect of it. So next, when we are talking about forensic, then another myth, what is known to us, I mean, yeah, a few of the facts that uh, I'm also getting from the strengths also that I have included here too, that forensic analysis, it involves a digital investigative analysis looking for every file on the digital. So there is no such thing that is called full and complete forensic analysis. As I mentioned in the first slide itself, that if in case we are looking that it, within few minutes, we have supposed file an FIR and we are looking that within few minutes, the investigation will get over now. The full and complete forensic analysis is a part of digital forensic. Where we have to look for all the information, whatever is available over there, especially the softwares that can help to assist the then criteria, then the characteristics that have may be specified by the person, and then what the software cannot display, what type of data cannot be displayed over the screen. That is another fact we have to look. There should never be a second analysis conducted because of the potential for conflict forensic reports. This is the conflict. But whenever we comes to the fact, the fact is if the first forensic analysis is properly conducted and reported, any subsequent analysis should not, not ever result in the report that truly contradicts the first report. Why is it so? The first person, whoever has done, he has gone through the full and complete whatever, whatever, whatever the software he might have or she might have used, maybe not the availability. Second, it depends on the preservation, how much time has been given. It depends on the secondary copy. It depends on the, you know, uh, the enhancement or the repair of the uh, duplicate copy also. So these are the facts that may give a contradict. Maybe the second uh, expert will not perform, or maybe if in case he has done, the another facts will come that maybe the variation of the preparations or preparing machine that may be the special skills of the expert. So these things may give a conflict of forensic reports. When we are talking about next myth, because of the digital images can be manipulated, there shouldn't be admissible. 
So as a few minutes earlier, I told, I showed you a picture wherever that was masked or that was fragmented. And I told you that it is not because those have a specific capacity. So in this concern, when we are talking about the digital image can be manipulated. So the integrity of image can be assured. So there are methods that can help to uh, assure or demonstrate the digital files such as integrity, including hashing function, visual verification, digital signature. Digital signature means it's not like that you are putting your own digital or scan signature. No, digital signature of the specific software, a specific technique or device or machine. It may be your computer system also, because someone is using the window of 2010, someone is using 7, someone is using advanced version of that. For everyone, criteria will be different. It may be available in the same resource. It may be available updated, but not the same one. So the, must, the files that will be accompanied along with that should be completely checked for the confirmation. And whenever the evidence is produced, suggesting any kind of alteration, the expert should ensure, confirm, or refute the ascertain whether it has something or not. Now, next one is digitally enhanced images should not be uh, admissible. But as I it is mentioned that digitally enhanced images that reveal the features that exist in the image, but not only immediately apparent through the visual examination, sometimes it may have the hidden information inside of that. Sometimes a secret message it may compromise or it may have. So those things should be examined. There are so many cases wherever the images that has been recently uh, captured or is recently re reported by NIA wherever simply, you know, uh, the terrorists, they are communicating through some images. In the first appearance, that will look like it is a clear image, but whenever you will enlarge the screen, whenever you increase the capacity or you will enhance the image, you will find that there are some minor information that can be observed. Now you focus or simply you highlight the portion, then you enlarge that, enhance the capacity of it, and then you will see that it is not any track, it is not a image, it is actually a hidden message that was given by one group to another group. Usually, earlier, it's not possible, nah, you know, the terrorist group and all, they are not using like uh, invisible ink to transport or to convey a message from one group to another group. Nowadays, they are also using the digital source of information to communicate from one group to another group. So those things that are suspectable should be examined thoroughly because the enhancement can produce or can help to get some information about the hidden masses in this one. So whenever we are talking about there are so many myths, but simply here, because it is related to digital enhancement of fingerprints, and there are so many myths about this too also. That's why I mention about it. So when we are talking about digital enhancement of a fingerprint image can be accidentally morph or fingerprint of one person into that another. First of all, it's true that the fingerprint until unless there will be no deep cut or there will be no pointed object harm to the basal regenerating layer of your fingerprint means the lower layer cannot be changed. But if in case it has been damaged to the vessel generating layer of your fingerprint, then definitely that will occur in form of a permanent mark in your fingerprint, but that will be individual to you. Minor things can help to, you know, morph the fingerprint of course, one person into another, but not completely. So in this concern, when we are talking about the digital enhancement, so it is according to the guidelines, of one person and it should be conducted in a way wherever it will not cause any kind of damage to the original one, but visibility of the characteristics will be increased. So researchers from so many universities, Indiana University, Paraguay University, and of police and police, and there's so many uh, mathematicians uh, who have formulated some algorithm, they also found that the possibility of such occurrence can be in 10 to the 80th power means can you consider that when we will put one and followed by 80 zero that is the possibility they have shown it it has not been proved but they have estimated based on the existing data collected from national institute of justice it is u.s department and based on these possibilities they mentioned that the possibility to 
morph the fingerprint of one person into another, it's quite impossible. So with this one, I would like to, uh, yeah, there is one case, but before that, I would like to discuss one more important point that I didn't mention. So all the digital images must be electronically authenticated to be admissible. This is the final thing because uh, the images, why am I, am I talking about the images? Because images or the pictures are the most important aspect in crimes, in investigation, in digital forensic, and other aspects too, that help in the reconstruction of the crime scene, that help to get to know, or that help us to determine the authenticity of the evidences. That's why here I didn't mention about this fact, but I would like to mention, uh, you know, I would like to discuss this one. So the myth is all digital images must be electronically authenticated to be admissible, admissible in the court for the legal proceeding. So in this concern, whenever we take any film or any photograph that can be authenticated through the testimony, that's good. But along with this, the image integrity must be examined. The courtroom authentication can help you to submit or to accept it, but how will you verify the authenticity? So in this concern, it should be examined uh, digitally. And if in case there is any modification, like uh, Photoshop have been used, like uh, they would have used the paint to enhance the filters or they, uh, enhance the quality or any other filter that had been used can help in this concern. So now, I will, before I will move on this image, I would like to discuss one more uh, myth that we were talking about, because that image is directly related to this one, means this image, where is that? Uh, just one second, please. Yeah, if you will focus on the second myth, all data for a company or individual is located at the same physical location of the company or individual. So this image is supporting to that. It is a story or a case study that I would like to discuss with you. It is from Haryana Kurukshetra, and this incident happened in January, 10th of January, this year itself. This person, he was also a criminal. He has a criminal background, but anyway, he was out of the jail, a prison for some time on the bail. So during this one, every one of you are, even me too, are using the social media. So he was also using Instagram. So at Instagram, he made to a girl where they started to communicate with, with each other. And finally, after a chatting of four, five days, they decided to meet to each other in Krukshetra at one hotel. It was decided. So when this person, he went there. So there was a girl, obviously the girl with whom he was chatting. So he was sitting there. They started to come, you know, chat. Suddenly, four or five people, they attacked on him. They didn't do anything except they cut off or chopped both of his hands. So immediately, because the restaurant was full of the crowd, and the people, they started to scream. The, they flee from there, even along with the girl. So the police approached. They took him in the hospital. Then the whole story they came to know. Immediately when the police, they came to know that, okay, uh, it has happened. They asked him to provide the data. The account was completely deleted from there. All the information were deleted uh from the instagram ch only chat was left and they were unable to access that account then the case was reported to the cyber crime and they got to know that it was now recently the, the starting of last month itself the complete report was submitted by the police officers that they have apprehend to the people those who were involved in that they were using the device of some another individual that they had taken they stole they had stolen from a person who was passing nearby or during you know the theft so when they missed the imia number of that with the fir filed by the particular person from whom it was stolen it was missed and by this way the case was solved so this case why i mention about it because whenever we are talking about the hidden truth about the digital evidence or digital crime or digital cyber forensics so it is it was the case that came in my mind so i thought to discuss it with you so moving on next although the digital forensic technique is a part of the investigation so here as i mentioned in my slides i would like to discuss a few one only few one that will help the digital digital forensic techniques 
So reverse stenography is one of the process in which the hide data inside of the digital file, it may be message or digital stream can be located or can be specified. As I gave you an example a few minutes earlier, that the terrorist group, they have started to communicate in form of the pictures, in form of the data that will may not be you know, inappropriate in the first appearance, but whenever you will go for the announcement, you will examine that thoroughly. So that is the reverse technography. So in this one, what will you do? It involves the data has been found in a specific file. It may be file or image or any hidden information that may not look suspicious is a part of the technique and that anybody can. Then next one is stochastic forensics. So it helps to analyze the reconstruction of the digital activity that may not be generated with the digital artifacts. So digital artifacts, it is also another kind of alteration, but unintended that may occur due to, due to the digital process. Okay, let me give you an example before, but let me complete the first last line. Text files, for example, are digital artifacts that can contain the clue related to any digital crime like data theft that changes the file attributes and all. But I will give you the simplest example. Like nowadays, it, it is you know a habit. We have become so lazy that if in case we have to pass a message to our friends or our family members, we usually drop a voice message on WhatsApp or any other like Instagram or any other social media. So do you ever, did ever you realize that whether it is the same information, I'm gonna say this, is there any modulation in your voice? Is there any kind of change? Is there any kind of, you know, the integrity, whatever is of your actual or individual has been carried out in that or not? So you will find the differences also. Even sometime when you are sitting alone, there is no background noise and all, even you will realize whenever you will go for the careful examination of it, that there is some voice, uh, if in case, like uh, in forensic uh, physics, audio video examination, if in case there is a case of audio or video examination, wherever you will find there is no message, even, even after of it, there will be some messages that may be in form of environmental noise, or it may be in form of any minute form, or it may be the person whoever is standing over a long distance from you may have captured. So those things are also examined. So, uh, the cross-drive analysis. The cross-drive analysis is also known as anomaly detection similarities that are provided to the context of investigation. So these similarities serve as a baseline to detect a suspicious event, typically maybe correlating to any cross-referring information across multiple, multiple computer drives to find and analyze. Let me give you an example of this one. Suppose, uh, okay, if you have to submit any assignment, or you have to complete a CIA that you have to submit next day, but you don't have any time. Usually, what do we do? We change the format. We have copied the content. If in case the faculty has instructed that, okay, yeah, the plagiarism, I will go through the plagiarism. Plagiarism should be zero. So usually what the students, they do simply either they will change a few words, like O will be replaced by uh, zero, L will be replaced by one or any other. I will be replaced by L in a small letters. Similar like some of the students, what do they do? They will copy the content, they will paste it in form of the picture by cropping it, and that will be pasted in the practical, uh, you know, the CI or assignment. So whenever you will go through the analysis of plagiarism, the plagiarism, it will show zero. Why? Because plagiarism can be examined for the words, not for the images, and there is no word existing on the file. So if in case we are getting a zero plagiarism, it means that is also manipulated, it's not possible. Next one is live analysis. So live analysis occurs in the operating system while the device or computer is running. If in case you have switched it off, if in case you have disconnected it from the net and uh, you know completely discharged or elements you have separated, it cannot be. Once it will be active, only then it can be examined. So it involves the using system tools that find anal analyze it, extract the volatile data, recorded in this one and typically stored in the RAM or cache of your system. So that is the live analysis of it. Now the most important factor that is the deleted file recovery. So deleted file recovery is also known as the data carving or data file carving. Carving is the technique that helps to recover the deleted data of the files. 
deleted data if in case you have deleted from your computer or a cycle bin has been completely you know, vacant. So in those cases, whether it will be possible for you or not. So in this concern, the memory of the fragmented file where the partially deleted information will be present at the at one location while leaving to the traces means the file traces can be recovered from there and that will help on the that can be recovered with the help of the tool or the techniques used for the investigation so thank you so much with this i would like to uh, conclude this topic thank you sir um, thank you, sir. I think so. I was not too fast because at, as you had given me the time. So yes, we, you are perfectly on time. Even you uh, taken a, a very accurate, maintain the time. So thank you so much, sir. And thank you, uh, thank you for, uh, you know, discussing all the pros and cons and myths and facts about the digital forensic, which usually being a general public or being a student, they have in their mind. So <clears throat> those who are going to become the digital professional, it will be a very enlightening session for them. So thank you for delivering a session on the hidden truth and the digital evidences. And on behalf of Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science, I would like to present this e-mementors for your wonderful talk, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be a part of your organization and providing me this fantastic opportunity for interaction with everyone. Thank you so much, sir. And also I would like to present this e-certificate for imparting your valuable insight and inspirational knowledge about the topic hidden truth in the digital evidences thank you thank you thank you so much sir thank, thank you so much for this so moving further we have our uh, speaker dr komal yado from kr Bangalore university and madam is going to talk on the topic determination of range of firing by gun sort residue i request my host arti to kindly introduce uh, dr komal yado thank you so much sir and uh, introducing dr komal yado uh, she is an assistant professor in the Department of Forensic Science at K.R. Mangalam University, Gurugram. She successfully completed her PhD on the topic, a comparative study, dispersion pattern of gunshot residue of country-made firearms on different substrates from different close ranges. Her doctoral research was conducted at the Central Forensic Science Laboratory, Central Bureau of Investigation, located in New Delhi, India. This experience provided her with valuable insights into the practical aspects of forensic analysis and enhanced her knowledge of crime scene investigation. Throughout her academic journey, she has published numerous research papers in reputable journals, showcasing her dedication to advancing the field of forensic science. She has presented her research findings at various national and international conferences where she has received recognition and acclaim for her contributions. Thank you so much, ma'am, for accepting our invitation. The, we hand this now. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so uh, very much. Thank you, Ranjit, sir, for inviting me. Uh, so let, let me share my screen. Yes, ma'am. What do you do? Now, is it visible? Yes, ma'am. You can just yes. make this as a full mode. Uh, so, very good evening to one and all. Uh, myself, Komal Yadav, and I'm the coordinator and assistant professor of KR Mangalam University. So, today I'm going to deliver my lecture on the topic Determination of Range of Fire by GSR. Uh, uh, am I audible? Uh, yes, ma'am. You're audible. Uh, you just make this as a full screen mode slide. Yeah, so. Sure. So uh, before starting my lecture, I, I just want to explain some view of a few of the terms which are intentionally used in the entire presentation. So uh, actually, the range of firearm is covered under the forensic oh, ballistics. Sorry, sorry to disturb you. It is not coming. We are not able to see the slide. The, either it's moving or... Sorry, sir, you're not... I'm saying that uh, we are not able to see the slide as her moving and also not in the full mode so i'm just uh, you just share again i'm just stopping and you can just share again is it visible from my side uh you just, just close stop. and again uh, please share just Now, 
now is it visible sir ah uh, yes ma'am perfectly fine yeah thank you so much sir so uh, forensic uh, this is gsr comes under the forensic ballistics so i just explains a uh, few about the forensic ballistics basically forensic ballistics is a division of forensic science in which we deal with the examination of firearms bullets cartridge cartridge cases and the determination of range of firearm which is very much important aspect in forensic ballistics so here are few terms in forensic ballistics that is firearm and gunshot residue so first firearm basically firearm is a device by which projectile or projectiles can be hurled out with a great force and this force is uh, burned by the this force is expanded by the burning of propellants and basically projectile can be anything it can be a stone it can be a bullet it can be a pellets and in uh, forensic ballistics we have different kind of firearms that are country made firearm standard firearms so here i am going to discuss few of the modern firearm and how they are classify on the basis of their characteristics so first we can classify modern firearms on the basis of bore characteristics so this is a very important characteristic in which we can classify the firearms into two one is smooth bore firearm and another one is rifle bore firearm so basically in smooth bore firearm the barrel of the firearm is completely smooth no rifling marks are present in the uh, smooth bore firearms and the example of smooth bore firearms are shotgun and in case of rifle bore firearm the rifling marks are present inside the barrel in which we which provide the gyratory motion to the projectiles and the examples of rifle bore firearms are revolver pistol ak47 and the machine gun second on the basis of loading characteristic we can classify the modern firearms on the basis of muzzle loader breech loader and the magazine loader basically in the barrel of the firearm there are two ends one end is muzzle end and another end is known as breech end the end where we insert the projectile any projectile like pellets bullets that muzzle end that is known as the breech end and the another end from where the bullets exit from the barrel that is known as muzzle loader so in few of the modern firearm some are muzzle loader where we can put the bullets projectiles from the muzzle end so these type of firearm where we put the projectiles from the muzzle end they are known as muzzle loading firearms and in case of breech loading firearm the breech loading firearms are those firearm in which we put the projectiles from the breech end that is known as breech loader firearm and on the basis of loading characteristic third one is the magazine action in which we load the cartridges inside the magazine basically all the firearms which are made in today's generation they are magazine loader and next on the basis of action we can classify the firearm into two that is automatic and the semi automatic automatic firearms are those firearms in which once we press the trigger it will be continue until the complete magazine get exhausted and second was in semi automatic firearm in semi semi automatic firearm we press the trigger manually once we press the trigger it extract out the cartridge from the barrel another time we press the uh, trigger then another cartridge will be extract out of the barrel so the uh, for on the basis of these characteristic we can classify they are automatic and they are semi automatic firearms next on the basis of handling characteristic we can classify the firearms on the basis of handguns and the shoulder arms gun so few firearms are handgun like revolver pistol which can be handled by the hands only and in the another one is the shoulder arm firearm in which we use the uh, shoulders to handle that firearm like they are rifles ak47 which are bigger in the size they so they are shoulder arms firearm another characteristic on which we can classify the modern uh, firearms on the basis of use one is sporting firearms and another one is the service rifles service rifles which are we use in the army police officials they are using and second one is the sporting rifles which sport persons are use so on the basis of firearm or you on the basis of their uses we can the we can classify the firearms as service rifle and the sporting firearms next next we can classify firearms on the basis of their manufacturing like country made firearms standard firearms and the improvised firearms so basically country made firearms are homemade firearms which are made by the local blacksmiths 
in which there is no particular specification nor any standard raw material is used and these weapon have a very short span of lifetime and they are very dangerous in use also as they don't have their any standard specification as compared to the caliber of the firearm and they these weapons in india more than 75% of the crime in india is committed using country made firearms as there is no need of the license the cost is very cheap so most of the um, uh, weapons which are used in india is country made firearms and two type of caliber which are commonly used in india they are 7.65 mm caliber and 0.365 mm caliber of country made firearms as they are their demand is very high in india they are very famous in up bihar and some border states as well and the criminal normal criminal which cannot afford it the trade goes flourishing day by day day by day as they are very cheap in cost so most of the people they want to purchase only country made firearms apart from standard firearms as in standard firearms their cost is very high and they need license to get the standard firearms as well and same in case of improvised firearm improvised firearms are those firearms which are similar to country made firearms but few of the part of improvised firearms are from the standard firearms suppose one get the standard revolver from somewhere and uh, the barrel of that revolver is fixed into the another country made firearm so that kind of firearm is known as improvised firearm in which some parts are original that are standard firearms so they are improvised firearms next is gsr gsr is very important in determination of range of firearm and it's a very important constituent in uh, forensic ballistics as well as most of the cases in forensic ballistics is totally depend upon the gsr on the basis of gsr only we can determine the range of firearm so basically G, what is gsr gsr is burnt unburnt and semi burnt particle produced from the ammunition propellant and the primer and uh, gsr basically we it uh, it is found on the hands of the firearm and uh, it's found near the entry hole and nearby area where the crime has been committed like nearby furniture or the near the wall of the room so some of the residue from the bullet bullet jacket cartridge cases gun barrel and the other other contaminants for example rusted barrel lubricants cleaning agent are expelled from both the muzzle breech and the ejection port as well as any gap in the reconstruction construction of the gun as it is fired suppose uh, let us take one example suppose at the scene of crime uh, if the firing was taken place so and they uh, you will find the entry hole from the victim so gsr will be deposited only and only near the entry hole and on the hands of the firer and on the, uh, gsr can be also present in the fire fire uh, firearm also so from where we can uh, uh, collect the gsr by with the help of potum swab and there are different methods of the collections of gsr so once we get, collect the gsr with the help of potum swab we, we have number of tests we can do in the forensic lab as well uh, to present whether it is the gsr or not so uh, one is uh, nitrate test we can do for the gsr so what happen in nitrate test suppose we collect the potum swab from the scene of crime so we have to do the nitrate test to check whether it is gsr or not so what in nitrate test first we can do the uh, naphthylamine and sulfuronic acid in 50 uh, 50 ratio one is to one is ratio if the night if gsr is present then the pink color will appear so it proves that the gsr is present over there and with the help of gsr we can also find out the different range of firing from which range the firer fired the uh, weapon so how can we find out the range from the gsr it is the important aspects in forensic ballistics so i will discuss with you so with the help of gsr we can find out whether it is close range intermediate range or far range we first in case of close contact range suppose 
uh, and uh, in case of close contact range if the gsr is present over there first we have to check few sign and symptoms over there suppose someone is doing suicide from the close contact range then the muzzle end of the firearm come in contact with the head so we have to check the uh, muzzle impression is present over there or not if some muzzle impression is present over there then we can say that it is a close contact range over there some blackening is present blackening is present uh, blackening is not present in close contact range it is present in the close range only so in close contact range um, first one is muzzle impression that is the important uh, parameter if muzzle impression is present over there then we can say that is is a it is a case of close contact range and if in case of close range blackening is there and uh, burning is there because uh, when we fire from the close contact range a uh, few fi firing goes there and the, it can burn the skin from the uh, entry hole so burning blackening is present in close contact range and if suppose in bullet there is grease present or dirt is also present there then in nearby entry hole that that grease you will see the grease and the dirt over there so we can say that it is also a case of close contact range and in case of smooth bore firearms bed is present there pellets is present there because in smooth uh, bore firearm only we can use pellets and in case of rifle firearm we use bullets so in close contact range we can see that if grease is present is dirt polar is present muzzle impression is present over there more burning is there so the, then this is the case of close contact range next is close range in close range we can see the blackening is over there burning is the, over there powder deposition of powder is over there so if blackening is there so we can say that is it is a case of close range and we can also say that what type of ammunition is present over there because in uh, gsr primer particles are there propellant particles are there so in primer composition lead dye lead azide mercury fulminate is there and in propellant we have different kinds of propellant powder present in the market first one is black powder semi smokeless powder and the smokeless powder and the composition of black powder is potassium nitrate sulfur and charcoal potassium nitrate is present in 75% charcoal is present in 10% and sulfur is present in 15% and in semi smokeless powder nitroglycerin and nitrocellulose is there smokeless powder there some only nitrocellulose is there so they contain different composition of primer and propellant is there so when we collect the gsr from the end hole we have to check the composition of different primer and propellant from there we can find out what type of propellant and primer is used in that type of ammunition and in close range firing i already said that the black we have to check the blackening is present in close range firing and suppose if tattooing is present then we can say that it is a case of intermediate range when a firer is fired from the intermediate range some burnt semi burnt particles are present near the entry hole so we can say that it is a case of intermediate range because uh, the gaseous particle are very light in weight so they cannot cover the more distance so in case of intermediate ranges tattooing present over there and tattooing is also known as peppering and stippling so few uh, particles that are semi burnt burnt particles are present near the entry hole so in that case we can say that it is a case of um, uh, intermediate range and in case of uh, far away uh, away range there is no tattooing no blackening no burning no marks are present over there only entry hole is present in case of far range if the firer has fired the firearm from the uh, far away range so only entry hole is present over there no blackening no tattooing and the size of the entry hole is small as compared to the close range when firing was done in case of close range the entry hole is very big in size and the firing was done from the far away range the size of the entry hole is very small in size so these from these parameters we can find out that what is the range of the gsr and which is very much important in case of forensic ballistic apart from that 
from the gsr we can examine and evaluate numbers of problem that first we have to find out whether the given firearm has been fired or fired or not in forensic lab we uh, number of cases have been received from the firearm so first they have to ask whether the firearm has been fired or not so first we have to check the gsr if gsr is present in the barrel then we can say that yes the firearm has been fired if there is no gsr is present in the barrel then we can say that the firearm has not been fired second they are asking has the given ammunition been fired or not the about the ammunition so same in case of ammunition we can find out the different uh, their compositions by the gsr we have number of tests for gsr for nitrate for nitrite for mercury fulminate for potassium so by doing test in the forensic lab we can find out the what type of ammunition are they, uh, are, they are they are using or from which country they belongs to as well we can also find out the country from the uh, ammunition also because we have numbers of company they are making the cartridges cases like ordinance factory in india so they have their uh, different compositions and few of the countries in china they have their own compositions from uh, for, so if we recover any live cartridge from the scene of crime so by doing the test of their composition of primer and propellant we can also find out uh, the manufacturing of that uh, ammunition as well and what type of ammunition is used in firing second has the given bullet pellet cartridge been fired or not how can we say that the bullet pellet cartridge has fired or not in case of bullets if the bullet is fired then the firing pin marks is present on the base of the cartridge there are two uh, three type of evidences major three type of evidences in forensic ballistics that is cartridge cartridge case and the bullet so cartridge is basically that is the live ammunition which contain bullet and the cartridge case that is known as cartridge and if bullet is not there only cartridge case is there so this is the cartridge case and another one is bullet so uh, most of the cases police was asking from us ki whether the cartridge is fired or not if the firing pin marks is present on the base of the percussion cap then we can say that the cartridge is fired second is the bullet Uh, they are asking whether the bullet is fired or not so if only their rifling marks are present on the bullet then we can say that the bullet is fired if there is no rifling marks present on the bullet then we can say that maybe it is a case of misfiring as well or it is not a genuine case because if rifling marks are present on the bullet then only we can say that bullet is fired next is cartridge on the cartridge case on cartridge case we have extractor marks ejector marks percussion marks are, marks are present on the cartridge case so then only we can say that the cartridge case is fired next who fired the gun next question uh, we can say by the examination of gsr we can conclude that who fired the gun if uh, if the firer is fired at the gun then gsr deposited on the hands of the firer so from the hands of the firer we can take the sample from their hands but with the help of cotton swab and we can do the examination of gsr whether it is gsr or not next is did the suspect shoot or suicide this is the main main questions we can uh, 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 evaluate from the with the help of gsr whether it is a case of suicide or murder or homicide so if it is a case of suicide then the gsr is present on the heads of the firer and uh, it is uh, obviously it is uh, close contact range is there and if the uh, it is not a close contact range and on the case of the firer there is no gsr is present then we can say that it is a case of homicide it is not a case of suicide so with the help of gsr we can say that whether it is a case of suicide or whether it is a case of homicide next is the present wound a firearm injury or not uh, so if it is a firearm injury then gsr is present on the entry hole if no gsr is present on the entry hole maybe it is a it is fired from the far range so from that case uh, just a minute i need uh, i need one minute please uh, just a minute are yaar is usko manta to lena aaj ko
yeah so thank you so much so from the gsr we uh, we have to find out whether it is a firearm injury or uh, it is not a firearm injury so if gsr is present over there on the entry hole then we can say that it is a firearm injury but in some case if the firing was done from the uh, far away range then there is no gsr is present over there as gsr particles are very light in weight they cannot travel in the air so no gsr is present if the firing was done from the uh, far away range so in that case there is burning is present over there because the bullet which is expelled out from the barrel it is very hot so it burns the skin so from that we have to conclude whether it is a firearm injury or not next what was the range of firing so from the gsr we can conclude whether it is a close contact range close range intermediate range and far away range if the blackening is present then it is close range if muzzle impressions are present on the entry hole then it is the close contact range if tattooing present over there then it is a intermediate range if uh, only entry hole is present and that is very small in size and no gsr particles are present near the entry hole then we you can say that it is a case of far away range so no gsr particle is present over there and in some case in some clo uh, close range there is a pink coloration of entry hole because when we fire uh, fire when we start the firing the uh, from the very close contact range and in contact with the skin so from when the primer and propellant start combustion so some carbon monoxide is released from there and due to the deposition of the carbon monoxide on the skin and the flash it appears as pink color so we can say that if pink color is present on the entry hole then we can say that it is a case of close contact range in close contact range the coloration of the entry hole is pink coloration and sometimes in close range the uh, shape of the entry hole is star shaped if it is a close contact range then the shape of the entry hole is star shaped because jaise hi hum log fire karte hain to in close contact range se to kuch gases kya hoti hain andar jaati hain aur usi ke sath sath wo itna high pressure hota hai ki jaise hi hum close contact se fire karte hain तो उसके अंदर सपोज ये शॉर्ट गन के केसेस है तो उसमें से कुछ वैड्स हैं कुछ पैलेट्स हैं उसके जैसे ही वो अंदर जाएंगे जिस फोर्स के साथ अंदर जाएंगे इतने क्लोज कांटेक्ट में हमारा हेड जो होता है बहुत हार्ड सरफेस होता है तो उसी के साथ क्या होता है नंबर जितनी स्पीड से गैसेज अंदर गई है उसी स्पीड से गैस बाहर भी आती है क्योंकि हमारे हेड के अंदर उनको स्पेस नहीं मिलता गैसेज को कि वो अंदर जा सके तो जैसे ही हम क्लोज कॉन्टेक्ट से फायर करते हैं जितनी गैसेस अंदर जाएंगी और कुछ गैसेस को स्पेस नहीं मिलेगा अंदर से तो वो कुछ गैसेस बाहर आएंगी जिसकी वजह से क्या होता है स्टार शेप होल बन जाता है तो ये जो स्टार शेप होल जो प्रेजेंट होता है इट इज ओनली प्रेजेंट इन द क्लोज कॉन्टेक्ट रेंज सो सपोज हमें कभी क्राइम सीन पे हमें स्टार शेप होल मिल रहा है तो हम लोग कह सकते हैं कि इट इज अ केस ऑफ क्लोज कॉन्टेक्ट रेंज अगर हमें पिंक कलरेशन मिल रही है ड्यू टू द डिपोजिशन ऑफ कार्बन मोनोक्साइड गैसेज क्योंकि अगर हम क्लोज कॉन्टेक्ट से मार रहे हैं तो यहाँ पे क्लोज कॉन्टेक्ट से ही हमारे पास कार्बन मोनोक्साइड गैसेज यहाँ पे डिपोजिट होंगे विच इज पिंक इन कलर तो अगर पिंक कलरेशन वहां पे प्रेजेंट है तो हम लोग कह सकते हैं कि ये क्लोज कॉन्टेक्ट रेंज ही है सो so, सपोज अगर कभी भी आप लोग क्राइम सीन पे आपको जाने का मौका मिलता है या कभी भी आप लोग देखते हो क्लोज कॉन्टेक्ट रेंज में या तो स्टार शेप होल बन रहा है या पिंक कलरेशन है या बहुत ज्यादा बर्निंग वहां पे है तो ये ही तीन चीजें हैं और एंट्री होल सबसे बड़ा था साइज ऑफ एंट्री होल इज वेरी लार्ज इन केस ऑफ क्लोज कॉन्टेक्ट रेंज सो दे आर फोर थिंग्स वन इज द साइज Size of the entry hole is very large in case of close contact range. Second, the uh, star, sh the shape of the entry hole is star shaped, and the pink coloration of the um, entry hole is present over there, and blackening is more over there, right? So by looking these four parameters, we can say that the uh, range of firing was close contact range. and if it is a case of suicide then uh, only you have to check the hands of the firer from where if gsr is present over there then it is a case of suicide and in case of close range 
ओनली ब्लैकनिंग इज प्रेजेंट अगर हमारा इंटरमीडिएट रेंज है तो क्या होता है फ्यू पार्टिकल्स क्यू फ्यू बर्न पार्टिकल्स फ्यू सेमी बर्न पार्टिकल्स फ्यू अनबर्न पार्टिकल्स इंटरमीडिएट रेंज से जैसे ही हम लोग फायर करते हैं तो कुछ पार्टिकल्स क्या होते हैं जीएसआर के विच आर वेरी लाइट इन वेट जो हवा में ट्रेवल कर जाते हैं जो प्रॉपर डिपोजिट नहीं होते कुछ ही पार्टिकल्स ऐसे होते हैं जो सेमी बर्न होते हैं बर्न होते हैं जो जाते हैं और हमारे हेड के पास एंट्री होल के पास डिपोजिट हो जाते हैं तो कुछ आपको पैपरिंग स्टेपलिंग करल का स्ट्रक्चर आपको दिखेगा अगर वो प्रेजेंट है तो हम कह सकते हैं कि यस दिस इज केस ऑफ इंटरमीडिएट रेंज एंड इन फार रेंज हमें कुछ भी पैटर्न नहीं मिलेगा ओनली एंट्री होल इज प्रेजेंट एंड वेरी विच इज वेरी स्मॉल इन साइज सो From these parameter, we can determine the range of the firing, which is very important. So ये तो सब था कि standard firearms के case में हम लोग कैसे determine करेंगे But अब बारी आती है country made firearms की क्योंकि India में क्या है more than 75% of the cases are committed using country made firearms only. केसेज आर कमिटेड यूजिंग कंट्री मेड फायर आर्म्स ओनली और कंट्री मेड फायर आर्म्स में क्या होता है कोई स्टैंडर्ड नहीं होता देर इज नो स्टैंडर्ड बैरल उनका स्टैंडर्ड चैम्बर नहीं होता है उनके अंदर प्रॉपर मैगजीन नहीं होती है उनका प्रॉपर कैलिबर नहीं होता है उनके अंदर प्रॉपर राइफलिंग मार्क्स नहीं होते हैं उनके अंदर प्रॉपर लेंस एंड ग्रूव मार्क्स नहीं होते हैं तो स्टैंडर्ड फायर आर्म्स में रेंज डिटरमाइन करना इज वेरी डिफिकल्ट सो इस केसेस में हम लोग क्या करेंगे कंट्री मेड फायर आर्म्स के केसेस में किस तरीके से रेंज डिटरमाइन करेंगे कुछ हमने कुछ पैरामीटर्स लिए हैं कि अगर 7.65 पॉइंट mm, कुछ कैलिबर्स होते हैं फायर आर्म्स के जिनसे हम डिफरेंशिएट करते हैं 7.65 पॉइंट सिक्स फाइव थ्री पॉइंट वन की ये डिफरेंट कैलिबर्स होते हैं फायर आर्म्स के तो कंट्री मेड फायर आर्म्स के केसेस में क्या होता है हम लोग कैसे डिटरमाइन करेंगे कुछ क्या कुछ हमने पैरामीटर्स लिए हुए हैं जैसे हमारा सपोज सेवन पॉइंट सिक्स फाइव एम एम के अंदर जो बैरल का जो डायमीटर होता है वो मोस्टली सेवन मिलीमीटर से ट्वेल्व मिलीमीटर के बीच में आता है तो उन केसेस में क्या होता है जो डिस्पर्जन पैटर्न होता है विच इज जो कि बहुत ज्यादा होता है एज कंपेयर टू स्टैंडर्ड फायर तो जब भी कभी आपको चांस मिलेगा कि एक स्टैंडर्ड फायर आर्म का आप एंट्री होल देखोगे कंट्री मेड फायर आर्म का होल देखोगे तो जो स्टैंडर्ड फायर आर्म के केस में जो डिस्पर्जन पैटर्न होता है वो बहुत कम होता है क्यों बिकॉज उसके अंदर प्रॉपर राइफलिंग मार्क्स होते हैं वो प्रॉपर गाइडेटरी मोशन प्रोवाइड करता है और प्रॉपर उसकी जो जहां तक एंट्री होल तक जा सकता है उसको प्रॉपर बर्निंग जो भी हमारा जीएसआर पार्टिकल होता है बैरल की लेंथ के अंदर वो प्रॉपर बर्न हो पाता है लेकिन कंट्री मेड फायर आर्म्स के केसेज में क्या होता है प्रॉपर राइफलिंग मार्क्स नहीं होते प्रॉपर लेंथ एंड ग्रूज मार्क्स नहीं होते गायरेटरी मोशन प्रोवाइड नहीं होता तो हम आज हमारा जो जीएसआर है जो हमारा प्रोपलेंट है जो हमारा प्राइमर है वो प्रॉपरली बर्न नहीं हो पाता है बर्न नहीं हो पाता है तो मोर डिपोजिशन मिलेगा कंट्री मेड के केस में एज कंपेयर टू स्टैंडर्ड फायर के केस में ज्यादा जो डिपोजिशन है आप लोगों को वहां पे मिलेगा कंट्री मेड के केस में तो हम लोग जैसे ही हम लोग एंट्री होल को देखते हैं हम ये भी बता सकते हैं कि ये स्टैंडर्ड फायर से फायर हुआ है कंट्री मेड फायर से फायर हुआ है तो अगर आपको ज्यादा डिपोजिशन दिखे अन इवन डिपोजिशन दिखता है तो हम लोग कह सकते हैं कि ये जो फायरिंग है कंट्री मेड केस की कंट्री मेड से फायर हुआ है अगर वहां पे कम डिपोजिशन है और प्रॉपर इवन यूनिफॉर्म डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन है तो हम लोग कह सकते हैं कि ये स्टैंडर्ड फायर से फायर हुआ है तो इस तरीके से बहुत सारे केसेस है मैं आप लोगों के साथ एक केस डिस्कस करना चाहूंगी स्टैंडर्ड uh, फायर का जो कि रेंज ऑफ फायर से ही रिलेटेड uh, है दूसरा हम लोगों के पास जो केसेस आते हैं इसमें हमसे कई बार पूछते हैं कि जो कार्टरेज है वो हमें सपोज क्राइम सीन से एक फायर आर्म रिकवर हुआ एक कार्टरेज केस रिकवर हुआ और एक कार्टरेज रिकवर हुआ और एक बुलेट रिकवर माइक्रोस्कोप इफ द राइफलिंग मार्क्स ऑन द बुलेट एंड ऑन द टेस्ट फायर बुलेट इज सेम देन वी कैन से दैट इट इज फायर फ्रॉम द सेम फायर आर्म बट समाइम एक केस में क्या होता है हमारे पास एक बुलेट आई एंड फायर आर्म आया और उससे और एक कार्टरेज केस आया उससे पूछा गया कि ये सेम फायर आर्म से फायर है या नहीं 
तो समटाइम्स क्या होता है लोग टैम्परिंग करना शुरू कर देते हैं क्योंकि पता होता है सबको कि हम लोग राइफलिंग मार्क्स चेक कर रहे हैं हम लोग एक्सट्रेक्टर और इजेक्टर मार्क्स चेक कर रहे हैं तो जो हमें जो टेस्ट फायर फायर आम वो एक फॉरेंसिक लैब में अभी मैं नाम नहीं लेना चाहूंगी वहां पे उसको चेक किया उसके बाद उसके ऊपर टैम्परिंग कर दी लाइक जो लोहे की कुछ रोड लेके अंदर से जो बैरल के अंदर जो राइफलिंग मार्क्स थे उसको डिस्ट्रॉय कर दिया गया अब दोबारा से जैसे ही वो दूसरी लैब में गई एग्जामिनेशन के लिए तो जो हमने फायर करके देखा क्योंकि अंदर से जो राइफलिंग मार्क्स थे वो बिल्कुल डिस्ट्रॉयड मार्क्स थे वो बिल्कुल मैच नहीं हो पाए तो ऑब्वियसली कंक्लूजन यही निकलेगा कि जो बुलेट है वो पर्टिकुलर जो फायर हमें रिकवर हुआ उससे फायर नहीं है it will help sure. us understand because you go in hindi some people may not understand okay sure ma'am sure thank you ma'am thank you so yeah. much Uh, so what happens? So they destroy the rifling marks inside the barrel with the help of iron rod. So that iron rod, or when we fired the another cartridge from that particular firearm weapon, so the uh, rifling marks are different because when uh, we fired first, those uh, the complete rifling marks uh, impression comes over there, and we destroy the rifling marks from the another rod. Then the they the marks completely disturb. So when we fired from the test fire. the marks are different so when uh, after that when we compared in the comparison microscope the marks are totally different they do not match with each other and then uh, there is no option to match these two bullets because uh, they have different rifling impressions on the bullet so again we check the extractor and ejector marks on the cartridge case which is very rarely we match in the forensic science laboratory but on the behalf of extractor and ejector marks on the cartridges case then they are sa uh, same after comparing from the comparison microscope then it was concluded that the cartridge or the, that particular bullet was fired from that particular same firearms so uh, so uh, my topic was a determination of range of firearm i thought ki i explained you ki how can we determine the range of firing from the gsr whether it is a close contact range close range mid range or far away range so uh, sir thank you so much now it's done for my side thank you ma'am thank you so much for explaining the topic and i think we have one or two question in the chat box yes sir so in number 1 okay i think uh, there is no question that was a old question no question uh, there is one uh, question uh, the firearm which doesn't have the mechanism of rifling in such cases how to identify whether the bullet was fired or not sorry 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 uh, can you repeat it yeah uh, the firearm which doesn't have mechanism of rifling mm -hmm. in such cases how to identify whether the bullet was fired or not mechanism of rifling actually rifling is present only in rifled marks if rifling is not present then they come under the smooth bore firearms only rifling is only present in rifled marks if rifling is not present there are smooth bore firearms and they pellets are present over there there is no bullet is over there if they are they comes under different category and the cartridge case that is used uh, in case of smooth bore firearm that is plastic and paper cartridge firearm so from different parameters we can check whether it is a fired from uh, shotgun or not yes so thank you so much ma'am okay thank you so much for delivering the talk on topic determination of range of firing by the gun shot residue in this uh, forensic summer finishing school and uh, here on behalf of sherlock institute of forensic science i would like to present this aim mentors for your wonderful yeah. talk thank you so much sir thank you sir and uh, also this e certificate for imparting your valuable knowledge and inspirational talk on the topic determination of range of firing by guns or residue yeah thank you so much sir thank, thank you. you thank you so much so with this i would like to thank all the speakers for the day dr anita yadav ma'am dr tilak sir dr om dubey dr prashant sir dr amit chauhan and dr gopal yadav thank you all for accepting our invitation and sparing your time on this uh, sundays and sharing your valuable knowledge with all the participant again on the next sunday on 9 july we have the 
uh, session that is our last session and after that you all can download the certificate from the website on forensic summer finishing school by Gaurav Gil, Dr. Manu, Karan, Dr. Tanju, Dr. Nasir and Dr. Priyanka Varma. So with this, we still have the opening for the conference that is going to be in the August. Those who want to present your paper, research, you can enroll by going on the forensicevent.com and uh, that is from the 24th to 27th August. You can present your paper, research work in that particular international conference. In the month of July, we are starting our new course that is a graphology. So those who are interested in learning your characteristic personality through the handwriting, you can enroll in this course. You can ping me or you can just uh, follow our LinkedIn profile. I request Arthur to kindly put the LinkedIn profile of uh, uh, our uh, institute page where you will find the detail about this course. So thank you. Thank you so much uh, everyone for joining this uh, uh, summer finishing school. Now I'm open for any kind of feedback if you want to unmute and share with us. I just allow you can unmute now. Anyone wants to share any feedback? So you just follow our uh, page on LinkedIn and you just have, you can just turn on the camera so that we can have the uh, group photo. Uh, Komal, there is one question, uh, right? The question is, in case of firing in rainy condition, is the use of GSR possible? Yes, sir. I answered on that. It's very difficult in case of rainy condition. It is difficult to collect the GSR in case of rainy condition. Yeah. Correct. So anyone, anyone wants to share any feedback? No? Can we have the selfie? Please turn on your camera so that we can click a photo. So only two people are. I think uh, camera is allowed or not, Arti? Please check. Now it is allowed. They can turn on their cameras. Please try to turn on. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sudhaman. Thank you, Gilbert. Let's have a photo. So everyone, please turn on your camera so that we can have a quick group photo. I wonder, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you, wonderful. Thank you, Ayushi. Thank you everyone for turning on your camera. Thank you for attending this session, right? Let's connect again on the Sunday. Thank you all for joining. Signing off for today. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Bye bye. Bye, bye Phil Bird. So I'm ending the session for the day.